Section One of Volume Two of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume Two, Section One. Nur ad-Din Ali and the damsel Anis al-Jalis. Quoth Shahrazad, It hath reached me, O auspicious king of intelligence penetrating, that there was, amongst the kings of Basora, a king who loved the poor and needy, and cherished his lieges, and gave of his wealth to all who believed in Muhammad, whom Allah bless and assain and he was even as one of the poets described him, a king who, when hosts of the foe invade, receives them with lance-lunge and sabre-sway, writes his name on bosoms in thin red lines, and scatters the horsemen in wild dismay. His name was King Mohammed bin Sulaiman Azaini, and he had two wazirs, one called Al-Mu'in, son of Sawi and the other Al-Fazl, son of Khakan. Now Al-Fazl was the most generous of the people of his age, upright of life, so that all hearts united in loving him, and the wise flocked to him for counsel, whilst the subjects used to pray for his long life, because he was a compendium of the best qualities, encouraging the good and leaf, and preventing evil and mischief. But the wazir Mu'in bin Sawi, on the contrary, hated folk, and loved not the good, and was a mere compound of ill, even as was said of him. Hold to nobles, sons of nobles, tis ever nature's test, that nobles born of nobles shall excel in noble deed, and shun the mean of soul, meanly bred, for tis the law, mean deeds come of men who are mean of blood and breed. And as much as the people loved and fondly loved al Faz bin Khakan, so they hated and thoroughly hated the mean and miserly Mu'in bin Sawi. It befell one day by the decree of the decreer that King Mohammed bin Sulaiman al Zaini, being seated on his throne with his officers of state about him, summoned his wazir al Fazl and said to him, I wish to have a slave-girl of passing beauty, perfect in loveliness, exquisite in symmetry, and endowed with all praiseworthy gifts. Said the courtiers, Such a girl is not to be bought for less than ten thousand gold pieces. Whereupon the sultan called out to his treasurer, and said, Carry ten thousand dinars to the house of al Faz bin Khakan. The treasurer did the king's bidding, and the minister went away, after receiving the royal charge to repair to the slave bazaar every day, and entrust to brokers the matter aforesaid. Moreover, the king issued orders that girls worth above a thousand gold pieces should not be bought or sold without being first displayed to the wazir. Accordingly, no broker purchased a slave girl ere she had been paraded before the minister but none pleased him, till one day a dealer came to the house and found him taking horse and intending for the palace. So he caught hold of his stirrup, saying, O thou who givest to royal state sweet savour, that a wazir shall never fail of favour. Dead bounty thou hast raised to life for men, ne'er fail of Allah's grace such high endeavour. Then quoth he, O oh my lord, that surpassing object for whom the gracious mandate was issued is at last found. And quoth the wazir, Here with her to me. So he went away, and returned after a little, bringing a damsel in richest raiment robed, a maid spear straight of stature, and five feet tall, budding of bosom, with eyes large and black as by coal traced and dewy lips sweeter than syrup or the sherbet one sips, a virginette smooth-cheeked and shapely-faced, whose slender waist with massive hips was engraced, 
a form more pleasing than branchlet waving upon the topmost trees, and a voice softer and gentler than the morning breeze, even as saith one of those who have described her. Strange is the charm which dights her brows, like Luna's disc that shine, O oh, sweeter taste than sweetest rob, or raisins of the vine. A throne the Empyrean keeps for her in high and glorious state, For wit and wisdom, wand-like form, and graceful bending line. She in the heaven of her face the sevenfold stars displays, That guard her cheeks as satellites against the spy's design. If man should cast a furtive glance, or steal far look at her, his heart is burnt by devil bolts, shot by those piercing eyn. When the wazir saw her, she made him marvel with excess of admiration, so he turned, perfectly pleased, to the broker, and asked, What is the price of this girl? Whereto he answered, Her market value stands at ten thousand dinars, but her owner swears that this sum will not cover the cost of the chickens she hath eaten, the wine she hath drunken, and the dresses of honour bestowed upon her instructor, for she hath learnt calligraphy and syntax and etymology, the commentaries of the Koran, the principles of law and religion, the canons of medicine, and the calendar and the art of playing on musical instruments said the wazir, bring me her master. So the broker brought him at once, and behold, he was a Persian of whom there was left only what the days had left, for he was as a vulture, bald and scald, and a wall trembling to its fall. Time had buffeted him with sore smart, yet was he not willing this world to depart, even as said the poet, Time hath shattered all my frame, Oh, how time hath shattered me! Time with lordly might can tame, Manly strength and vigour free. Time was in my youth that none Sped their way more fleet and fast. Time is, and my strength is gone. Youth is sped, and speed is past. The wazir asked him, Art thou content to sell this slave-girl To the sultan for ten thousand dinars? And the Persian answered, by Allah, if I offer her to the king for naught, it were but my devoir. So the minister bade bring the monies, and saw them weighed out to the Persian, who stood up before him, and said, By the leave of our lord the wazir, I have somewhat to say. And the wazir replied, Out with all thou hast. It is my opinion, continued the slave-dealer, that thou shouldst not carry the maid to the king this day, for she is newly off a journey. The change of air hath affected her, and the toils of trouble have fretted her. But keep her quiet in thy palace some ten days, that she may recover her looks, and become again as she was. Then send her to the hammam, and clothe her in the richest of clothes, and go up with her to the sultan. This will be more to thy profit. The wazir pondered the Persian's words, and approved of their wisdom, so he carried her to his palace where he appointed her private rooms, and allowed her every day whatever she wanted of meat and drink, and so forth. And on this wise she abode a while. Now the wazir al-Fazl had a son like the full moon when she nearest dight, with face radiant in light, cheeks ruddy bright, and a mole like a dot of ambergris on a downy sight. As said of him the poet, and said full right, a moon which blights you, if you dare behold, A branch which folds you in its waving fold, Locks of the zange and golden glint of hair, Sweet gait and form a spear to have and hold, Ah, hard of heart, with softest, slenderest waist, That evil to this wheel why not remould? Were thy form's softness placed in thy heart, Ne'er would thy lover find thee harsh and cold. O oh, thou accuser, be my love's excuser, Nor chide if love-pangs deal me woes untold. I bear no blame, tis all my hear and eyne, So leave thy blaming, let me yearn and pine. Now the handsome youth knew not the affair of the damsel, And his father had enjoined her closely, saying, No, O oh my daughter, that I have bought thee as a bedfellow for our king, Mohammed bin Sulaiman Azaini, 
and I have a son who is a Satan for girls, and leaves no maid in the neighbourhood without taking her maidenhead. So be on thy guard against him, and beware of letting him see thy face, or hear thy voice. Hearkening and obedience, said the girl, and he left her, and fared forth. Some days after this it happened, by decree of destiny, that the damsel repaired to the baths in the house, where some of the slave-women bathed her after which she arrayed herself in sumptuous raiment, and her beauty and loveliness were thereby redoubled. Then she went in to the wazir's wife, and kissed her hand, and the dame said to her, Naiman, may it benefit thee, O Anis al-Jalis! Are not our baths handsome? O my mistress, she replied, I lack naught there, save thy gracious presence. Thereupon the lady said to her slave-women, Come with us to the hammam, for it is some days since we went there. They answered, To hear is to obey, and rose and all accompanied her. Now she had set two little slave-girls to keep the door of the private chamber, wherein was Anis al-Jalis, and had said to them, Suffer none to go into the damsel. Presently, as the beautiful maiden sat resting in her rooms, suddenly came in the wazir's son, whose name was Nur ad-Din Ali, and asked after his mother and her women, to which the two little slave-girls replied, They are in the hammam. But the damsel, Anis al-Jalis, had heard from within Nur ad-Din Ali's voice, and had said to herself, Oh, would heaven I saw what like is this youth against whom the wazir warned me, saying that he hath not left a virgin in the neighbourhood without taking her virginity. By Allah, I do long to have sight of him. So she sprang to her feet, with the freshness of the bath on her, and stepping to the door, looked at Nur ad-Din Ali, and saw a youth like the moon in its full, and the sight bequeathed her a thousand sighs. The young man also glanced at her, and the look made him heir to a thousand thoughts of care, and each fell into love's ready snare. Then he stepped up to the two little slave-girls, and cried aloud at them, whereupon both fled before him, and stood afar off to see what he would do. And behold, he walked to the door of the damsel's chamber, and, opening it, went in, and asked her, Art thou she my father bought for me? And she answered, Yes. Thereupon the youth, who was warm with wine, came up to her, and embraced her. Then he took her legs, and passed them round his waist, and she wound her arms about his neck, and met him with kisses and murmurs of pleasure and amorous toyings. Next he sucked her tongue, and she sucked his, and lastly he loosed the strings of her petticoat trousers, and abated her maidenhead. When the two little slave-girls saw their young master get in unto the damsel, Anis al-Jalis, they cried out and shrieked, so as soon as the youth had had his wicked will of her, he rose and fled forth, fearing the consequences of his ill-doing. When the wazir's wife heard the slave-girl's cries, she sprang up and came out of the baths, with the perspiration pouring from her face, saying, What is this unseemly clamour in the house? Then she came up to the two little slave-girls, and asked them, saying, Fie upon you, what is the matter? And both answered, Verily our lord Nur ad-Din came in and beat us, so we fled. Then he went up to Anis al-Jalis, and threw his arms round her, and we know not what he did after that, but when we cried out to thee, he ran away. Upon this the lady went to Anis al-Jalis, and said to her, What tidings? O oh, my lady, she answered, as I was sitting here, lo, a handsome young man came in, and said to me, Art thou she my father bought for me? And I answered, Yes. For, by Allah, O mistress mine, I believed that his words were true, and he instantly came in and embraced me. Did he naught else with thee but this? quoth the lady, and quoth she, Indeed he did, but he did it only three times. He did not leave thee without dishonouring thee, cried the wazir's wife, and fell to weeping and buffeting her face. She and the girl and all the handmaidens, fearing lest Nur ad-Din's father should kill him. Whilst they were thus, in came the wazir, and asked what was the matter, and his wife said to him, Swear that whatso I tell thee thou wilt attend to it. I will, 
answered he. So she related to him what his son had done, whereat he was much concerned, and rent his raiment, and smote his face till his nose bled, and plucked out his beard by the handful. "'Do not kill thyself,' said his wife. "'I will give thee ten thousand dinars, her price of my own money.' But he raised his head and cried, "'Out upon thee! I have no need of her purchase money. My fear is lest life as well as money go.' O oh, my lord, and how is that? Wottest thou not that yonder standeth our enemy, Al-Mu'in bin Sawi, who, as soon as he shall hear of this matter, will go up to the Sultan? And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 1 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, volume 2. Section 2, Volume 2 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Volume 2, Section 2 when it was the thirty-fifth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wazir said to his wife, Wottest thou not that yonder standeth our enemy, Al-Mu'in bin Sawi, who, as soon as he hears of this matter, will go up to the sultan, and say to him, Thy wazir, who thou wilt have it, loveth thee, took from thee ten thousand ducats, and bought therewith a slave-girl, whose like none ever beheld, but when he saw her, she pleased him, and he said to his son, Take her, thou art worthier of her than the sultan. So he took her, and did away with her virginity, and she is now in his house. The king will say, Thou liest! To which he will reply, With thy leave I will fall upon him unawares, and bring her to thee. The king will give him warranty for this, and he will come down upon the house, and will take the girl, and present her to the sultan, who will question her, and she will not be able to deny the past. Then mine enemy will say, O oh my lord, thou wottest that I give thee the best of counsel, but I have not found favour in thine eyes. Thereupon the sultan will make an example of me, and I shall be a gazing-stock to all the people, and my life will be lost." quoth his wife, let none know of this thing which hath happened privily, and commit thy case to Allah, and trust in him to save thee from such strait, for he who knoweth the future shall provide for the future. With this she brought the wazir a cup of wine, and his heart was quieted, and he ceased to feel wrath and fear. Thus far concerning him, but as regards his son, Nur ad-Din Ali, fearing the consequence of his misdeed, he abode his day long in the flower-garden, and came back only at night to his mother's apartment, where he slept, and rising before dawn, returned to the gardens. He ceased not to do thus for two whole months, without showing his face to his parent, till at last his mother said to his father, O oh my lord, shall we lose our boy as well as the girl? If matters continue long in this way, he will flee from us. And what to do? asked he and she answered, Do thou watch this night, and when he cometh, seize on him, and frighten him. I will rescue him from thee, and do thou make peace with him, and give him the damsel to wife, for she loveth him as he loveth her, and I will pay thee her price. So the minister stayed up that night, and when his son came, he seized him, and throwing him down, knelt on his breast, and showed as though he would cut his throat, but his mother ran to the youth's succour, and asked her husband, What wouldst thou do with him? He answered her, I will split his weasand, said the son to the father. Is my death then so light a matter to thee? And his father's eyes welled with tears, for natural affection moved him, and he rejoined, O oh, my son, how light was to thee the loss of my good and my life! Quoth Nur ad-Din, Hear, O my father, what the poet hath said. 
forgive me, thee would sin die, but the wise, ne'er to the sinner shall deny his grace. Thy foe may pardon sure, when lieth he in lowest, and thou holdest highest place. Thereupon the wazir rose from off his son's breast, saying, I forgive thee, for his heart yearned to him, and the youth kissed the hand of his sire, who said, O oh, my son, were I sure that thou wouldest deal justly by Anis al Jalis, I would give her to thee. O oh, my father, what justice am I to do to her? I enjoin thee, O oh, my son, not to take another wife or concubine to share with her, nor sell her. O oh, my father, I swear to thee that verily I will not do her injustice in either way. Having sworn to that effect, Nur ad Din went in to the damsel, and abode with her a whole year, whilst Allah Almighty caused the king to forget the matter of the maiden, and al Mu'in, though the affair came to his ears, dared not divulge it by reason of the high favour in which his rival stood with the sultan. At the end of the year al Fazl went one day to the public baths, and as he came out, whilst he was still sweating, the air struck him, and he caught a cold which turned to a fever. Then he took to his bed. His malady gained ground, and restlessness was longsome upon him, and weakness bound him like a chain. So he called out, Hither with my son! And when Nur ad-Din Ali came, he said to him, O oh my son, know that man's lot and means are distributed and decreed, and the end of days by all must be dreed, and that every soul drain the cup of death is nature's need. Then he repeated these lines, I die my death, but he alone is great who dieth not, and well I wot, soon shall I die, for death was made my lot, a king there's not that dies and holds his kingdom in his hand, for sovereignty the kingdom is of him who dieth not. Then he continued, O oh my son, I have no charge to leave thee, save that thou fear Allah, and look to the issues of thine acts, and bear in mind my injunctions anent Anis al-Jalis. O oh my father, said Nur ad-Din, who is like unto thee? Indeed thou art famed for well-doing, and preachers offer prayers for thee in their pulpits. Quoth al Fazl, O oh my son, I hope that Allah Almighty may grant me acceptance. Then he pronounced the two testimonies, or professions of the faith, and was recorded amongst the blessed. The palace was filled with crying and lamentation, and the news of his death reached the king, and the city people wept, even those at their prayers, and women at household cares, and the school children shed tears for bin Khakan. Then his son Nur ad-Din Ali arose and made ready his funeral, and the emirs and wazirs and high officers of state and city notables were present, amongst them the wazir al-Mu'in bin Sawi. And as the bier went forth from the house, some one in the crowd of mourners began to chant these lines. On the fifth day I quitted all my friends for evermore, and they laid me out and washed me on a slab without my door. They stripped me of the clothes I was ever wont to wear, and they clothed me in the clothes which till then I never wore. On four men's necks they bore me and carried me from home to chapel, and some prayed for him on neck they bore. They prayed for me a prayer that no prostration knows. They prayed for me who praised me, and were my friends of yore. And they laid me in a house with a ceiling vaulted o'er, and time shall be no more, ere it ope to me its door. When they had shovelled in the dust over him, and the crowd had dispersed, Nur ad-Din returned home, and he lamented with sobs and tears, and the tongue of the case repeated these couplets. On the fifth day at eventide they went away from me, farewelled them as faring they made farewell my lot. But my spirit as they went, with them went, and so I cried, Ah, return ye! But replied they, Alas, return is not, to a framework lear and lawn that lacketh blood and life, a frame whereof remaineth naught but bones that rattle and rot. Mine eyes are blind and cannot see, quenched by the flowing tear. Mine eyes are dull and lost to sense, they have no power to hear. 
he abode a long time sorrowing for his father, till one day, as he was sitting at home, there came a knocking at the door, so he rose in haste, and opening let in a man, one of his father's intimates, and who had been the wazir's boon companion. The visitor kissed Nur ad-Din's hand, and said to him, O oh my lord, he who hath left the like of thee is not dead, and this way went also the chief of the ancients and the moderns. O oh my lord Ali, be comforted and leave sorrowing. Thereupon Nur ad-Din rose, and going to the guest's saloon, transported thither all he needed. Then he assembled his companions, and took his handmaid again, and collecting round him ten of the sons of the merchants, began to eat and drink wine, giving entertainment after entertainment, and lavishing his presents and his favours. One day his steward came to him and said, O my lord Nur ad-Din, hast thou not heard the saying, Whoso spendeth and reckoneth not, to poverty wendeth and recketh not? And he repeated what the poet wrote. I look to my money and keep it with care, for right well I wot, tis my buckler and brand. Did I lavish my dirhams on hostilest foes, I should track my good luck by mine ill luck trepanned. So I'll eat it, and drink it, and joy in my wealth, and no spending my pennies on others I'll stand. I will keep my purse close gainst whoever he be, and a niggard in grain, a true friend, ne'er I fand. Far better deny him than come to say lend, and fivefold the loan shall return to thy hand. And he turns face aside, and he sidles away, while I stand like a dog, disappointed, unmanned. Oh, the sorry lot his, who hath yellow boys none, though his genius and virtues shine bright as the sun. O oh, my master, continued the steward, this lavish outlay and these magnificent gifts waste away wealth. When Nur ad-Din Ali heard these words, he looked at his servant and cried, of all thou hast spoken, I will not heed one single word, for I have heard the saying of the poet who saith, And my palm be full of wealth, and my wealth I ne'er bestow, a palsy take my hand, and my foot ne'er rise again. Show me niggard, who by niggard eyes e'er rose to high degree, or the generous gifts generally hath slain. And he pursued, no, O steward, it is my desire that so long as thou hast money enough for my breakfast, thou trouble me not with taking thought about my supper. Thereupon the steward asked, Must it be so? And he answered, It must. So the honest man went his way, and Nur ad-Din Ali devoted himself to extravagance. And if any of his cup companions chanced to say, This is a pretty thing, he would reply, Tis a gift to thee. Or if another said, O oh my lord, such a house is handsome, he would answer, Take it, it is thine. After this reckless fashion he continued to live for a whole year, giving his friends a banquet in the morning, and a banquet in the evening, and a banquet at midnight, till one day, as the company was sitting together, the damsel Anis al repeated these lines. Thou deemedst well of time when days went well, and fearest not what ills might deal thee fate. Thy nights so fair and restful cousin thee, for peaceful nights bring woes of heavy weight. When she had ended her verse, behold, somebody knocked at the door, so Nur ad-Din rose to open it, and one of his boon companions followed him, without being perceived. At the door he found his steward, and asked him, What is the matter? And he answered, O oh my lord, what I dreaded for thee hath come to pass. How so? Know that there remains not a dirham's worth, less or more, in my hands. Here are my daftars and account books, showing both income and outlay, and the registers of thine original property. When Nur ad-Din heard these words, he bowed his head and said, There is no majesty and there is no might, save in Allah. When the man who had followed him privily to spy on him heard the steward's words, he returned to his friends and warned them, saying, Look ye well to what ye do. Nur ad-Din is penniless. And as the young host came back to his guests, vexation showed itself in his face. Thereupon one of the intimates rose, and looking at the entertainer, said to him, O oh my lord, may be thou wilt give me leave to retire. And why so early retirement this day? asked he. And the other answered him, 
My wife is in childbirth, and I may not be absent from her. Indeed, I must return and see how she does. So he gave him leave, whereupon another rose and said, O my lord, Nur ad Din, I wish now to go to my brother's, for he circumciseth his son to-day. In short, each and every asked permission to retire on some pretence or other, till all the ten were gone, leaving Nur ad Din alone. Then he called his slave-girl, and said to her, O Anis al-Jalis, hast thou seen what case is mine? And he related to her what the steward had told him. Then quoth she, O oh my lord, for many nights I had it in my mind to speak with thee of this matter, but I heard thee repeating, When the world heaps favours on thee, pass on thy favours to friends, ere her hand she stay. Largesse never let her, when fain she comes, nor niggard eyes kept her from turning away. When I heard these verses, I held my peace, and cared not to exchange a word with thee. O oh, Anis al-Jalis, said Nur ad-Din, thou knowest that I have not wasted my wealth save on my friends, especially these ten who have now left me a pauper, and I think they will not abandon and desert me without relief. By Allah, replied she, they will not profit thee with aught of aid, said he, I will rise at once and go to them and knock at their doors, and it may be I shall get from them somewhat wherewith I may trade and leave pastime and pleasuring. So he rose without stay or delay, and repaired to a street wherein all his ten friends lived. He went up to the nearest door and knocked, whereupon a handmaid came out and asked him, Who art thou? And he answered, Tell thy master that Nur ad-Din Ali standeth at the door, and saith to him, Thy slave kisseth thy hand, and awaiteth thy bounty. The girl went in and told her master, who cried at her, Go back and say, My master is not at home. So she returned to Nur ad-Din, and said to him, O oh, my lord, my master is out. Thereupon he turned away, and said to himself, If this one be a whoreson knave, and deny himself, another may not prove himself such knave and whoreson. Then he went up to the next door, and sent in a like message to the housemaster, who denied himself as the first had done, whereupon he began repeating, He is gone who, when to his gate thou ghost, fed thy famished moor with his boiled and roast. When he had ended his verse, he said, By Allah, there is no help but that I make trial of them all. Perchance there be one amongst them who will stand me in the stead of all the rest. So he went the round of the ten, but not one of them would open his door to him, or show himself, or even break a bit of bread before him. Whereupon he recited, Like a tree is he who in wealth doth wone, and while fruits he the folk to his fruit shall run, but when bared the tree of what fruit it bear, they leave it to suffer from dust and sun. Perdition to all of this age, I find! Ten rogues for every righteous one. Then he returned to his slave-girl, and his grief had grown more grievous, and she said to him, O oh, my lord, did I not tell thee? None would profit thee with aught of aid. And he replied, By Allah, not one of them would show me his face, or know me. O oh, my lord, quoth she, sell some of the movables and household stuff, such as pots and pans, little by little, and expend the proceeds until Allah Almighty shall provide. So he sold all of that was in the house, till nothing remained, when he turned to Anis al-Jalis, and asked her, What shall we do now? And she answered, O oh, my lord, it is my advice that thou rise forthwith, and take me down to the bazaar, and sell me. Thou knowest that thy father bought me for ten thousand dinars. Haply Allah may open thee a way to get the same price, and if it be his will to bring us once more together, we shall meet again. O oh, Anis al-Jalis, cried he, by Allah, it is no light matter for me to be parted from thee for a single hour. By Allah, O oh my lord, she replied, nor is it easy to me either, but need hath its own law, as the poet said. Need drives a man into devious roads, and pathways doubtful of trend and scope. No man to a rope will entrust his weight, save for cause that calleth for case of rope. Thereupon he rose to his feet, and took her, 
whilst the tears rolled down his cheek like rain, and he recited with the tongue of the case these lines. Stay, grant one parting look before we part, nerving my heart this severance to sustain. But, an this parting deal thee pain and bane, leave me to die of love and spare thee pain. Then he went down with her to the bazaar, and delivered her to the broker, and said to him, O Hajj Hassan, I pray thee, note the value of her thou hast to cry for sale. O my lord Nur ad-Din, quoth the broker, the fundamentals are remembered, adding, Is not this the Anis al-Jalis whom thy father bought of me for ten thousand dinars? Yes, said Nur ad-Din. Thereupon the broker went round to the merchants, but found that all had not yet assembled. So he waited till the rest had arrived, and the market was crowded with slave-girls of all nations, Turks, Franks, and Circassians, Abyssinians, Nubians, and Takruris, Tartars, Georgians, and others. When he came forward, and standing, cried aloud, O merchants, O men of money! Every round thing is not a walnut, and every long thing a banana is not. All reds are not meat, nor all whites fat, nor is every brown thing a date. O oh, merchants, I have here this union pearl that hath no price. At what sum shall I cry her? Cry her at four thousand five hundred dinars, quoth one of the traders. The broker opened the door of sale at the sum named, and as he was yet calling, lo, the wazir al-Mu'in bin Sawi passed through the bazaar, and seeing Nur ad-Din Ali waiting at one side, said to himself, why is Hakan's son standing about here? Hath this gallows bird aught remaining wherewith to buy slave girls? Then he looked round, and seeing the broker calling out in the market with all the merchants around him, said to himself, I am sure that he is penniless, and hath brought hither the damsel Anisa Jalis for sale. Oh, how cooling and grateful is this to my heart! Then he called the crier, who came up and kissed the ground before him, and he said to him, I want this slave-girl whom thou art calling for sale. The broker dared not cross him, so he answered, O oh my lord, bismillah, in Allah's name so be it, and led forward the damsel, and showed her to him. She pleased him much, whereat he asked, O oh Hassan, what is bidden for this girl? And he answered, Four thousand five hundred dinars to open the door of sale. Quoth al Mu'in, four thousand five hundred is my bid. When the merchants heard this, they held back and dared not bid another dirham, wotting what they did of the wazir's tyranny, violence, and treachery. So al Mu'in looked at the broker and said to him, Why stand still? Go and offer four thousand dinars for me, and the five hundred shall be for thyself. Thereupon the broker went to Nur ad Din and said, O oh my lord, thy slave is going for nothing. And how so? asked he. The broker answered, We had opened the biddings for her at four thousand five hundred dinars, when that tyrant, Al-Mu'in bin Sawi, passed through the bazaar, and as he saw the damsel, she pleased him. So he cried to me, Call me the buyer at four thousand dinars, and thou shalt have five hundred for thyself. I doubt not, but that he knoweth that the damsel is thine, and if he would pay thee down her price at once, it were well, but I know his injustice and violence. He will give thee a written order upon some of his agents, and will send after thee to say to them, Pay him nothing. So as often as thou shalt go in quest of the coin, they will say, We'll pay thee presently, and they will put thee off day after day, and thou art proud of spirit, till at last, when they are wearied with thine importunity, they will say, Show us the cheque. Then, as soon as they have got hold of it, they will tear it up, and thou wilt lose the girl's price. When Nur ad-Din heard this, he looked at the broker, and asked him, How shall this matter be managed? And he answered, I will give thee a counsel, which, if thou follow, it shall bring thee complete satisfaction. And what is that? quoth Nur ad-Din. 
quoth the broker, come thou to me anon, when I am standing in the middle of the market, and, taking the girl from my hand, give her a sound cuffing, and say to her, Thou baggage, I have kept my vow, and brought thee down to the slave market, because I swore an oath that I would carry thee from home to the bazaar, and make brokers cry thee for sale. If thou do this, perhaps the device will impose upon the wazir and the people, and they will believe that thou broughtest her not to the bazaar, but for the quittance of thine oath. He replied, Such were the best way. Then the broker left him, and returning into the midst of the market, took the damsel by the hand, and signed to the wazir, and said, O oh my lord, here is her owner. With this up came Nur ad-Din Ali, and snatching the girl from the broker's hand, cuffed her soundly, and said to her, Shame on thee, thou baggage! I have brought thee to the bazaar for quittance of mine oath. Now get thee home, and thwart me no more, as is thy want. Woe to thee! Do I need thy price, that I should sell thee? The furniture of my house would fetch thy value many times over. When Al-Mu'in saw this, he said to Nur ad-Din, Out on thee! Hast thou anything left for selling or buying? and he would have laid violent hands upon him, but the merchants interposed, for they all loved Nur ad-Din. And the young man said to them, Here am I in your hands, and ye all know his tyranny. By Allah, cried the wazir, but for you I had slain him. Then all signed with significant eyes to Nur ad-Din, as much as to say, Take thy reek of him, not one of us will come between thee and him. Thereupon Nur ad-Din, who was stout of heart, as he was stalwart of limb, went up to the wazir, and dragging him over the pommel of his saddle, threw him to the ground. Now there was in that place a puddling pit for brick clay, into the midst of which he fell. And Nur ad-Din kept pummeling and fisticuffing him, and one of the blows fell full on his teeth, and his beard was dyed with his blood. Also there were with the minister ten armed slaves, who, seeing their master entreated after this fashion, laid hand on sword-hilt, and would have bared blades, and fallen on Nur ad-Din to cut him down. But the merchants and bystanders said to them, This is a wazir, and that is the son of a wazir. Haply they will make friends some time or other, in which case you will forfeit the favour of both, or perchance a blow may befall your lord, and you will all die the vilest of deaths, so it were better for you not to interfere. Accordingly they held aloof, and when Nur ad-Din had made an end of thrashing the wazir, he took his handmaid and fared homewards. Al-Mu'in also went his ways at once, with his raiment dyed of three colours, black with mud, red with blood, and ash-coloured with brick-clay. When he saw himself in this state, he bound a bit of matting round his neck, and taking in hand two bundles of coarse halfa grass, went up to the palace, and standing under the sultan's windows, cried aloud, O king of the age, I am a wronged man, I am foully wronged. So they brought him before the king, who looked at him, and behold, it was the chief minister, whereupon he said, O wazir, who did this deed by thee? And Mu'in wept and sobbed, and repeated these lines, Shall the world oppress me when thou art int? In the lion's presence shall wolves devour? Shall the dry all drink of thy tanks, and I, under rain-cloud, thirst for the cooling shower? O oh, my lord, cried he, the like will befall every one who loveth and serveth thee well. Be quick with thee, quoth the sultan, and tell me how this came to pass, and who did this deed by one whose honour is part of my honour? Quoth the wazir, Know, O my lord, that I went out this day to the slave-market to buy me a cook-maid, when I saw there a damsel. Never in my life long saw I a fairer, and I designed to buy her for our lord the sultan. So I asked the broker of her, and of her owner, and he answered, She belongeth to Ali, son of Al-Fazl bin Khakan. Some time ago our lord the sultan gave his father ten thousand dinars, wherewith to buy him a handsome slave-girl, and he bought this maiden who pleased him. So he grudged her to our lord the sultan, and gave her to his own son. When the father died, the son sold all he had of houses and gardens and household gear, and squandered the price till he was penniless. Then he brought the girl to the market, that he might sell her, and he handed her over to the broker to cry, 
and the merchants bid higher and higher on her, until the price reached four thousand dinars. Whereupon quoth I to myself, I will buy this damsel for our lord the Sultan, whose money was paid for her. So I said to Nur ad-Din, O oh my son, sell her to me for four thousand dinars. When he heard my words, he looked at me and cried, O oh, ill-omened oldster, I will sell her to a Jew or to a Nazarene, but I will not sell her to thee. I do not buy her for myself, said I, I buy her for our lord and benefactor the Sultan. Hearing my words, he was filled with rage, and dragging me off my horse, and I am a very old man, beat me unmercifully with his fists, and buffeted me with his palms, till he left me as thou seest. And all this hath befallen me, only because I thought to buy this damsel for thee. Then the wazir threw himself on the ground, and lay there weeping and shivering. When the sultan saw his condition, and heard his story, the vein of rage started out between his eyes, and he turned to his bodyguard, who stood before him, forty white slaves, smiters with the sword, and said to them, Go down forthright to the house built by the son of Khakan, and sack it, and raise it, and bring to me his son Nur ad-Din with the damsel, and drag them both on their faces, with their arms pinioned behind them. They replied, To hear is to obey, and arming themselves, they set out for the house of Nur ad-Din Ali. Now about the Sultan was a chamberlain, Alam ad-Din Sanjar height, who had aforetime been Mameluk to Al-Fazl, but he had risen in the world, and the Sultan had advanced him to be one of his chamberlains. When he heard the king's command, and saw the enemies make them ready to slay his old master's son, it was grievous to him. So he went out from before the Sultan, and mounting his beast, rode to Nur ad-Din's house, and knocked at the door. Nur ad-Din came out, and knowing him, would have saluted him, but he said, O oh, my master, this is no time for greeting or treating. Listen to what the poet said. Fly, fly with thy life, if by ill overtaken. Let thy house speak thy death by its builder forsaken. For a land else than this land thou mayst reach, my brother. But thy life thou'lt ne'er find in this world another. O oh, Alam ad-Din, what cheer? asked Nur ad-Din, and he answered, Rise quickly and fly for thy life, thou and the damsel, for Al-Mu'in hath set a snare for you both, and if you fall into his hands, he will slay you. The Sultan hath dispatched forty sworders against you, and I counsel you to flee ere harm can hurt you. Then Sanjar put his hand to his purse, and finding there forty gold pieces, took them out, and gave them to Nur ad-Din, saying, O my lord, receive these, and journey with them. Had I more, I would give them to thee, but this is not the time to take exception. Thereupon Nur ad-Din went in to the damsel, and told her what had happened, at which she wrung her hands. Then they fared forth at once from the city, and Allah spread over them his veil of protection, so that they reached the river-bank, where they found a vessel ready for sea. Her skipper was standing amidships, and crying, Whoso hath aught to do, whether in the way of provisioning, or taking leave of his people, or whoso hath forgotten any needful thing, let him do it at once and return, for we are about to sail. And all of them saying, There is naught left to be done by us, Captain. He cried to his crew, Hello there, cast off the cable and pull up the mooring pole. Quoth Nur ad-Din, With a bound, O Captain. And quoth he, To the house of peace, Baghdad. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section two of the book of a thousand nights and a night, volume two. Section three, volume two of the book of a thousand nights and a night. Translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2, Section 3. When it was the thirty-sixth night, she said, 
It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the skipper answered, To the house of peace, Baghdad, Nur ad-Din Ali and the damsel went on board, and they launched the craft and shook out the sails, and the ship sped forth as though she were a bird on wing, even as said one of them, and said right well, Watch some tall ship, she'll joy the sight of thee, the breeze outstripping in her haste to flee, as when a bird with widely spreading wings leaveth the sky to settle on the sea. So the vessel sailed on her fastest, and the wind to her was fairest, thus far concerning them. But as regards the Mamelukes, they went to Nur ad-Din's mansion, and breaking open the doors, entered and searched the whole place, but could find no trace of him and the damsel. So they demolished the house, and returning to the Sultan, reported their proceedings, whereupon, quoth he, Make search for them both, wherever they may be. And they answered, Hearing is obeying. The wazir al-Mu'in had also gone home after the Sultan had bestowed upon him a robe of honour, and had set his heart at rest by saying, None shall take blood reek for thee save I. And he had blessed the king, and prayed for his long life and prosperity. Then the Sultan bade proclaim about the city, O yea, O ye lieges, one and all, it is the will of our lord the Sultan, that whoso happeneth on Nur ad-Din Ali, son of Al-Faz bin Khakan, and bringeth him to the Sultan, shall receive a robe of honour and one thousand gold pieces. And he who hideth him, or knoweth his abiding place, and informeth not, deserveth whatsoever pains and penalties shall befall him. So all began to search for Nur ad-Din Ali, but they could find neither trace nor tidings of him. Meanwhile he and his handmaid sailed on with the wind right aft, till they arrived in safety at Baghdad, and the captain said to them, This is Baghdad, and tis the city where security is to be had. Winter with his frosts hath turned away, and prime hath come his roses to display, and the flowers are a-glowing, and the trees are blowing, and the streams are flowing. So Nur ad-Din landed, he and his handmaid, and giving the captain five dinars, walked on a little way, till the decrees of destiny brought them among the gardens, and they came to a place swept and sprinkled, with benches along the walls, and hanging jars filled with water. Overhead was a trellis of reed-work, and canes shading the whole length of the avenue and at the upper end was a garden gate, but this was locked. By Allah, quoth Nur ad-Din to the damsel, right pleasant is this place. And she replied, O my lord, sit with me a while on this bench, and let us take our ease. So they mounted and sat them on the bench, after which they washed their faces and hands, and the breeze blew cool on them, and they fell asleep, and glory be to him who never sleepeth. Now this garden was named the Garden of Gladness, and therein stood a belvedere, height the palace of pleasure, and the pavilion of pictures, the whole belonging to the caliph Harun al-Rashid, who was wont, when his breast was straightened with care, to frequent garden and palace, and there to sit. The palace had eighty latticed windows, and fourscore lamps hanging round a great candelabrum of gold, furnished with wax candles. And when the caliph used to enter, he would order the handmaids to throw open the lattices, and light up the rooms, and he would bid Ishak bin Ibrahim, the cup companion, and the slave girls, to sing till his breast was broadened, and his ailments were allayed. Now the keeper of the garden, Shaykh Ibrahim, was a very old man, and he had found from time to time, when he went out on any business, people pleasuring about the garden gate with their bona robas, at which he was angered with exceeding anger. But he took patience till one day when the caliph came to his garden, and he complained of this to Harun al-Rashid, who said, Whomsoever thou surprisest about the door of the garden, Deal with him as thou wilt. Now on this day the gardener chanced to be abroad on some occasion, and returning found these two sleeping at the gate covered with a single mantilla, whereupon said he, By Allah, good! 
these twain know not that the caliph hath given me leave to slay any one I may catch at the door, but I will give this couple a shrewd whipping that none may come near the gate in future. So he cut a green palm frond and went up to them, and raising his arm till the white of his armpit appeared, was about to strike them, when he bethought himself and said, O oh, Ibrahim, wilt thou beat them unknowing their case? Haply they are strangers or of the sons of the road, and the decrees of destiny have thrown them here. I will uncover their faces and look at them. So he lifted up the mantilla from their heads and said, They are a handsome couple. It were not fitting that I should beat them. Then he covered their faces again, and going to Nur ad-Din's feet, began to rub and shampoo them. Whereupon the youth opened his eyes, and seeing an old man of grave and reverent aspect rubbing his feet, he was ashamed, and drawing them in, sat up. Then he took Shaykh Ibrahim's hand and kissed it. Quoth the old man, O oh my son, whence art thou? And quoth he, O oh my lord, we two are strangers. And the tears started from his eyes. O oh my son, said Shaykh Ibrahim, Know that the Prophet, whom Allah bless and preserve, hath enjoyed honour to the stranger, and added, Wilt thou not arise, O my son, and pass into the garden, and solace thyself by looking at it, and gladden thy heart? O my lord, said Nur ad -Din, to whom doth this garden belong? And the other replied, O my son, I have inherited it from my folk. Now his object in saying this was to set them at their ease and induce them to enter the garden. So Nur ad-Din thanked him and rose, he and the damsel, and followed him into the garden. And lo, it was a garden, and what a garden! The gate was arched like a great hall, and over walls and roof ramped vines with grapes of many colours, the red like rubies and the black like ebonies and beyond it lay a bower of trellised boughs growing fruit single and composite, and small birds on branches sang with melodious recite, and the thousand-noted nightingale shrilled with her varied shrite, the turtle with her cooing filled the sight, the blackbird whistled like human white, and the ring-dove moaned like a drinker in grievous plight. The trees grew in perfection all edible growths, and fruited all manner fruits, which in pears were bipartite, with the camphor apricot, the almond apricot, and the apricot chorasani height. The plum, like the face of beauty, smooth and bright, the cherry that makes teeth shine clear by her slight, and the fig of three colours, green, purple, and white. There also blossomed the violet, as it were sulphur on fire by night, the orange with buds like pink coral and margarite, the rose whose redness makes the loveliest cheeks blush with despite, and myrtle and gillyflower, and lavender with the blood-red anemone from Nu'uman height. The leaves were all gemmed with tears the clouds had dight, the chamomile smiled, showing teeth that bite, and Narcissus with his negro eyes fixed on rose his sight. The citrons shone with fruits in bold, and the lemons like balls of gold. Earth was carpeted with flowers tinctured infinite, for spring was come, brightening the place with joy and delight, and the streams ran ringing to the birds gay singing, while the rustling breeze upspringing attempered the air to temperance exquisite. Shaykh Ibrahim carried them into the pavilion, and they gazed on its beauty, and on the lamps aforementioned in the latticed windows, and Nur ad -Din, remembering his entertainment of time past, cried, By Allah, this is a pleasant place. It hath quenched in me anguish which burnt as a fire of Gaza wood. Then they sat down, and Shaykh Ibrahim set food before them, and they ate till they were satisfied, and washed their hands. After which Nur ad-Din went up to one of the latticed windows, and calling to his handmaid, fell to gazing on the trees, laden with all manner fruits. Presently he turned to the gardener, and said to him, O oh, Shaykh Ibrahim, hast thou no drink here? For folk are wont to drink after eating." The shaykh brought him sweet water, cool and pleasant, but he said, 
This is not the kind of drink I wanted. Perchance thou wishest for wine? Indeed I do, O Shaykh. I seek refuge from it with Allah. It is thirteen years since I did this thing, for the Prophet cursed its drinker, presser, seller, and carrier. Hear two words of me. Say on. If yon cursed ass which standeth there be cursed, will aught of his curse alight upon thee? By no means. Then take this dinar and these two dirhams, and mount yonder ass, and halting afar from the wine-shop, call the first man thou seest by in liquor, and say to him, Take these two dirhams for thyself, and with this dinar buy me some wine, and set it on the ass. So shalt thou be neither the presser, nor the buyer, nor the carrier, and no part of the curse will fall upon thee. At this Shaykh Ibrahim laughed, and said, By Allah, my son, I never saw one wilier of wit than thou art, nor heard aught sweeter than thy speech. So he did as he was bidden by Nur ad-Din, who thanked him and said, We too are now dependent on thee, and it is only meet that thou comply with our wishes, so bring us here what we require. O my son, replied he, this is my battery before thee and it was the storeroom provided for the commander of the faithful. So go in, and take whatso thou wilt, for there is over and above what thou wantest. Nur ad Din then entered the pantry, and found therein vessels of gold and silver and crystal, set with all kinds of gems, and was amazed and delighted with what he saw. Then he took out what he needed, and set it on, and poured the wine into flagons and glass ewers whilst Shaykh Ibrahim brought them fruit and flowers and aromatic herbs. Then the old man withdrew, and sat down at a distance from them, whilst they drank and made merry, till the wine got the better of them, so that their cheeks reddened, and their eyes wantoned like the gazelles, and their locks became dishevelled, and their brightness became yet more beautiful. Then said Shaykh Ibrahim to himself, What aileth me to sit apart from them? Why should I not sit with them? When shall I ever find myself in company with the like of these two that favour two moons? So he stepped forward and sat down on the edge of the dais, and Nur ad Din said to him, O my lord, my life on thee, come nearer to us. He came and sat by them, when Nur ad Din filled a cup and looked towards the shaykh, and said to him, Drink that thou mayest try the taste of it. I take refuge from it with Allah, replied he. For thirteen years I have not done a thing of the kind. Nur ad Din feigned to forget he was there, and drinking off the cup, threw himself on the ground as if the drink had overcome him. Whereupon Anis Sajalis glanced at him and said, O oh, Shaykh Ibrahim, see how this husband of mine treateth me. And he answered, O oh, my lady, what aileth him? This is how he always serveth me, cried she. He drinketh a while, then falleth asleep, and leaveth me alone with none to bear me company over my cup, nor any to whom I may sing when the bowl goeth round. Quoth the shaykh, and his mien unstiffened, for that his soul inclined towards her. By Allah, this is not well. Then she crowned a cup, and looking towards him said, by my life thou must take and drink it, and not refuse to heal my sick heart. So he put forth his hand, and took it, and drank it off. And she filled a second, and set it on the chandelier, and said, O oh, master mine, there is still this one left for thee. By Allah, I cannot drink it, cried he. What I have already drunk is enough for me. But she rejoined, By Allah, there is no help for it. So he took the cup and drank and she filled him a third, which he took, and was about to drink, when, behold, Nur ad-Din rolled round, and sat upright. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 3 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2《Section Section Four, Volume Two of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
Org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2, Section 4. When it was the thirty-seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Nur ad-Din sat upright and said, Ho, Shaykh Ibrahim, what is this? Did I not abjure thee a while ago, and thou refusedst, saying, What I? Tis thirteen years ago since I have done such a thing. By Allah, quoth the Shaykh, and indeed he was abashed, no sin of mine this, she forced me to do it. Nur ad Din laughed, and they sat down again to wine and wassail, but the damsel turned to her master, and said in a whisper, O oh my lord, drink, and do not press him, that I may show thee some sport with him. Then she began to fill her master's cup, and he hers, and so they did time after time, till at last Shaykh Ibrahim looked at them, and said, What fashion of good fellowship is this? Allah curse the glutton who keepeth the cup to himself. Why dost thou not give me to drink, O my brother? What manners are these, O blessed one? At this the two laughed until they fell on their backs. Then they drank and gave him to drink, and ceased not their carousal till a third part of the night was past. Then said the damsel, O Shaykh Ibrahim, with thy leave I will get up and light one of these candles. Do so, he replied, but light no more than one. So she sprang to her feet, and beginning with one candle, lighted all the eighty, and sat down again. Presently Nur ad-Din said, O oh, Shaykh Ibrahim, in what favour am I with thee? May I not light one of these lamps? Light one, replied he, and bother me no more in thy turn. So he rose, and lighted one lamp after another, till he had lighted the whole eight, and the palace seemed to dance with brilliancy quoth the shaykh, and indeed intoxication had overcome him. Ye two are bolder than I am. Then he rose to his feet, and opened all the lattices, and sat down again, and they fell to carousing and reciting verses, till the place rang with their noisy mirth. Now Allah, the decreer, who decreeth all things, and who for every effect appointeth a cause, had so disposed that the caliph was at that moment sitting in the light of the moon at one of the windows of his palace overlooking the Tigris. He saw the blaze of the lamps and wax candles reflected in the river, and lifting his eyes perceived that it came from the garden palace, which was all ablaze with brilliancy. So he cried, here to me with Ja'afar the Barmaki, and the last word was hardly spoken, ere the wazir was present before the commander of the faithful, who cried at him, O dog of a minister, hast thou taken from me this city of Baghdad without saying aught to me? What words are these words? asked Ja'afar, and the caliph answered, If Baghdad city were not taken from me, the palace of pictures would not be illuminated with lamps and candles, nor would its windows be thrown open. Woe to thee! Who durst do a deed like this, except the caliphate had been taken from me? Quoth Ja'afar, and indeed his side muscles trembled as he spoke. Who told thee that the palace of pictures was illuminated, and the windows thrown open? Come hither and see, replied the caliph. Then Ja'afar came close to the caliph, and, looking towards the garden, saw the palace blazing with illumination that rayed through the gloom of the night, and thinking that this might have been permitted by the keeper for some reason of his own, he wished to make an excuse for him. So quoth he, O commander of the faithful, Shaykh Ibrahim said to me last week, O my lord Ja'afar, I much wish to circumcise my sons during the life of the commander of the faithful and thy life. I asked, What dost thou want? And he answered, Get me leave from the caliph to hold the festival in the garden palace. So said I to him, Go, circumcise them, and I will see the caliph and tell him. Thereupon he went away, and I forgot to let thee know. O oh, Ja'afar, said the caliph, thou hast committed two offences against me. First, in that thou didst no report to me. Secondly, thou didst not give him what he sought, for he came and told thee this only as excuse to ask for some small matter of money, to help him with the outlay, and thou gavest him nothing, nor toldest me. O commander of the faithful, said Ja'afar, I forgot. 
Now, by the rights of my forefathers and the tombs of my forebears, quoth the Caliph, I will not pass the rest of this night save in company with him, for truly he is a pious man who frequenteth the elders of the faith and the fakirs and other religious mendicants and entertaineth them. Doubtless they are not assembled together, and it may be that the prayer of one of them will work us weal, both in this world and in the next. Besides, my presence may profit, and at any rate be pleasing to Shaykh Ibrahim. O commander of the faithful, quoth Ja'afar, the greater part of the night is past, and at this time they will be breaking up. Quoth the caliph, it matters not, I needs must go to them. So Ja'afar held his peace, being bewildered, and knowing not what to do. Then the caliph rose to his feet, and taking with him Ja'afar and Masrur, the eunuch sorder, the three disguised themselves in merchant's gear, and leaving the city palace, kept threading the streets till they reached the garden. The caliph went up to the gate, and finding it wide open, was surprised, and said, See, O Ja'afar, how Shaykh Ibrahim hath left the gate open at this hour, contrary to his custom. They went in, and walked on, till they came under the pavilion, when the caliph said, O Ja'afar, I wish to look in upon them unawares, before I show myself, that I may see what they are about, and get sight of the elders. For hitherto I have heard no sound from them, nor even a fakir calling upon the name of Allah. Then he looked about, and seeing a tall walnut tree, said to Ja'afar, I will climb this tree, for its branches are near the lattices, and so look in upon them. Thereupon he mounted the tree, and ceased not climbing from branch to branch, till he reached a bough, which was right opposite one of the windows. And here he took a seat, and looked inside the palace. He saw a damsel and a youth, as they were two moons. Glory be to him who created and fashioned them, and by them Shaykh Ibrahim, seated, cup in hand, and saying, O princess of fair ones, drinking without music is nothing worth. Indeed, I have heard a poet say, Round with bit and little the bowl and cup, Take either that moon in his sheen hath crowned, Nor drink without music, for oft I've seen The horse drink best to the whistle's sound. When the caliph saw this, the vein of wrath started up between his eyes, and he came down and said to the wazir, O Ja'afar, never beheld I yet men of piety in such case, so do thou mount this tree and look upon them, lest the blessings of the blessed be lost to thee. Ja'afar, hearing the words of the commander of the faithful, and being confounded by them, climbed to the tree-top, and looking in, saw Nur ad-Din and the damsel, and Shaykh Ibrahim, holding in his hand a brimming bowl. At this sight he made sure of death, and descending stood before the commander of the faithful, who said to him, O oh, Ja'far, praise be to Allah, who hath made of us those that observe external ordinances of holy law, and hath averted from us the sin of disguising ourselves after the manner of hypocrites. But Ja'far could not speak a word for excess of confusion, so the caliph looked at him and said, I wonder how they came hither, and who admitted them into my pavilion. But aught like the beauty of this youth and this damsel my eyes never yet saw. Thou sayest sooth, O our lord the sultan, replied Ja'afar, and he hoped to propitiate the caliph Harun al-Rashid. Then quoth the caliph, O Ja'afar, let us both mount the branch opposite the window, that we may amuse ourselves with looking at them. So the two climbed the tree, and peering in, heard Shaykh Ibrahim say, O my lady, I have cast away all gravity mine by the drinking of wine, but tis not sweet, save with the soft sounds of the lute-strings it combine. By Allah, replied Anis al-Jalis, O Shaykh Ibrahim, and we had but some instrument of music, our joints were complete. Hearing this, he rose to his feet, and the caliph said to Ja'afar, I wonder what he is about to do. And Ja'afar answered, I know not. The shaykh disappeared, and presently reappeared, bringing a lute. And the caliph took note of it, and knew it for that of Abu Ishak, the cup companion. By Allah, said the caliph, if this damsel sing ill, I will crucify all of you. But if she sing well, I will forgive them, and only gibbet thee.
O oh Allah, cause her to sing vilely, quoth Ja'afar. Asked the Caliph, Why so? And he answered, If thou crucify us all together, we shall keep one another company. The Caliph laughed at his speech. Presently the damsel took the lute, and after looking at it and tuning it, she played a measure which made all hearts yearn to her. Then she sang these lines. O oh, ye that can aid me, a wretched lover, whom longing burns, nor can rest restore me, though all you have done I have well deserved, I take refuge with you, so exult not o'er me. True, I am weak and low and vile, but I'll bear your will and whatso you bore me. My death at your hands, what brings it of glory? I fear but your sin, which of life forlore me. Quoth the Caliph, By Allah, good! O Ja'afar, never in my life have I heard a voice so enchanting as this. Then haply the Caliph's wrath hath passed away, said Ja'afar, and he replied, Yes, tis gone. Thereupon they descended from the tree, and the Caliph said to Ja'afar, I wish to go in and sit with them, and hear the damsel sing before me. O commander of the faithful, replied Ja'afar, if thou go in to them, they will be terribly troubled, and Shaykh Ibrahim will assuredly die of fright. But the Caliph answered, O oh, Ja'afar, thou must teach me some device wherewith to delude them, and whereby I can foregather with them without their knowing me. So they walked towards the Tigris, pondering the matter, and presently came upon a fisherman who stood fishing under the pavilion windows. Now, some time before this, the Caliph, being in the pavilion, had called to Shaykh Ibrahim, and asked him, What noise is this I hear under the windows? And he had answered, It is voices of fisher-folk catching fish. So, quoth the Caliph, Go down and forbid them this place. And he forbade them accordingly. However, that night a fisherman named Karim, happening to pass by, and seeing the garden gate open, said to himself, This is a time of negligence, and I will take advantage of it to do a bit of fishing. So he took his net and cast it, but he had hardly done so, when, behold, the caliph came up single-handed, and standing hard by, knew him, and called aloud to him, O oh, Karim! The fisherman, hearing himself named, turned round, and seeing the caliph, trembled and his side muscles quivered, as he cried, By Allah, O commander of the faithful, I did it not in mockery of the mandate, but poverty and a large family drove me to what thou seest. Quoth the caliph, Make a cast in my name. At this the fisherman was glad, and going to the bank through his net, then, waiting till it had spread out at full stretch and settled down, hauled it up and found in it various kinds of fish. The caliph was pleased, and said, O Karim, doff thy habit. So he put off a gabardine of coarse woollen stuff, patched in an hundred places, whereon the lice were rampant, and a turban which had never been untwisted for three years, but to which he had sewn every rag he came upon. The caliph also pulled off his person two vests of Alexandrian and Baalbek silk, a loose inner robe, and a long-sleeved outer coat, and said to the fisherman, Take them, and put them on while he assumed the foul gabardine and filthy turban, and drew a corner of the headcloth as a mouth-veil before his face. Then said he to the fisherman, Get thee about thy business. And the man kissed the caliph's feet, and thanked him, and improvised the following couplets. Thou hast granted more favours than ever I craved. Thou hast satisfied needs which my heart enslaved. I will thank thee and thank while as life shall last, and my bones will praise thee in grave engraved. Hardly had the fisherman ended his verse when the lice began to crawl over the caliph's skin, and he fell to catching them on his neck with his right and left and throwing them from him, while he cried, O oh, fisherman, woe to thee! What be this abundance of lice on thy gabardine? O oh, my lord, replied he, they may annoy thee just at first, but before a week is past, thou wilt not feel them, nor think of them. The caliph laughed, and said to him, Out on thee! Shall I leave this gabardine of thine so long on my body? Quoth the fisherman, I would say a word to thee, but I am ashamed in the presence of the caliph. 
and quoth he, Say what thou hast to say. It passed through my thought, O commander of the faithful, said the fisherman, that since thou wishest to learn fishing, so thou mayest have in hand an honest trade, whereby to gain thy livelihood, this my gabardine besitteth thee right well. The commander of the faithful laughed at this speech, and the fisherman went his way. Then the caliph took up the basket of fish, and strewing a little green grass over it, carried it to Ja'afar, and stood before him. Ja'afar, thinking him to be Karim the fisherman, feared for him, and said, O Karim, what brought thee hither? Flee for thy life, for the caliph is in the garden to-night, and if he see thee, thy neck is gone. At this the caliph laughed, and Ja'afar recognised him, and asked, Can it be thou, our lord, the sultan? And he answered, Yes, O Ja'afar, and thou art my wazir, and I and thou came hither together. Yet thou knowest me not. So how should Shaykh Ibrahim know me, and he drunk? Stay here till I come back to thee. To hear is to obey, said Ja'afar. Then the caliph went up to the door of the pavilion, and knocked a gentle knock. Whereupon said Nur ad-Din, O oh, Shaykh Ibrahim, someone taps at the door. Who goes there? cried the Shaykh, and the caliph replied, It is I, O Shaykh Ibrahim. Who art thou? quoth he, and quoth the other, I am Karim the fisherman, I hear thou hast a feast, so I have brought thee some fish, and of a truth tis good fish. When Nur ad Din heard the mention of fish, he was glad, he and the damsel, and they both said to the Shaykh, O oh, our Lord, open the door, and let him bring us his fish. So Shaykh Ibrahim opened, and the Caliph came in, and he in fisherman guise and began by saluting them. Said Shaykh Ibrahim, Welcome to the blackguard, the robber, the dicer. Let us see thy fish. So the caliph showed them his catch, and behold, the fishes were still alive and jumping, whereupon the damsel exclaimed, By Allah, O oh my lord, these are indeed fine fish. Would they were fried? And Shaykh Ibrahim rejoined, By Allah, O oh my lady, thou art right. Then said he to the caliph, O fisherman, why didst thou not bring us the fish ready fried? Up now and cook them, and bring them back to us. On my head be thy commands, said the caliph. I will fry thee a dish and bring it. Said they, Look sharp. Thereupon he went and ran till he came up to Ja'afar, when he called to him, Hello, Ja'afar. And he replied, Here I am, O commander of the faithful. Is all well? They want the fish fried, said the caliph. And Ja'afar answered, O commander of the faithful, give it to me, and I'll fry it for them. By the tombs of my forebears, quoth the caliph, none shall fry it but I, with mine own hand. So he went to the gardener's hut, where he searched, and found all that he required, even to salt and saffron and wild marjoram, and else besides. Then he turned to the brazier, and setting on the frying pan, fried a right good fry. When it was done, he laid it on a banana leaf, and gathering from the garden wind-fallen fruits, limes and lemons, carried the fish to the pavilion, and set the dish before them. So the youth and the damsel, and Shaykh Ibrahim, came forward and ate, after which they washed their hands, and Nur ad Din said to the caliph, By Allah, O fisherman, thou hast done us a right good deed this night. Then he put hand in pouch, and taking out three of the dinars which Sanjar had given him, said, O fisherman, excuse me, by Allah, had I known thee before that which hath lately befallen me, I had done away with the bitterness of poverty from thy heart, but take thou this as the best I can do for thee. Then he threw the gold pieces to the caliph, who took them and kissed them, and put them in pouch. Now his sole object in doing all this was to hear the damsel sing. So he said to Nur ad-Din, Thou hast rewarded me most liberally, but I beg of thy boundless bounty that thou let this damsel sing an air, that I may hear her. So Nur ad-Din said, O oh, Anis al-Jalis, and she answered, Yes, and he continued, By my life, sing us something for the sake of this fisherman, who wisheth so much to hear thee. Thereupon she took the lute, and struck the strings, after she had screwed them tight and tuned them, and sang these improvised verses. 
the fawn of a maid hent her lute in hand, and her music made us right mettlesome, for her song gave hearing to ears stone deaf, while brava, brava, exclaimed the dumb. Then she played again, and played so ravishingly that she charmed their wits, and burst out improvising and singing these couplets. You have honoured us visiting this our land, and your splendour illumined the glooms that blent. So tis due that for you I perfume my place with rose-water, musk, and the camphor scent. Hereupon the caliph was agitated, and emotion so overpowered him that he could not command himself for excess of pleasure, and he exclaimed, By Allah, good! By Allah, good! By Allah, good! Asked Nur ad-Din, O fisherman, doth this damsel please thee? And the caliph answered, Ay, by Allah! Whereupon said Nur ad-Din, she is a gift to thee, a gift of the generous who repenteth him not of his givings, and who will never revoke his gift. Then he sprang to his feet, and taking a loose robe, threw it over the fisherman, and bade him receive the damsel, and be gone. But she looked at him, and said, O oh my lord, art thou faring forth without farewell? If it must be so, at least stay till I bid thee good-bye, and make known my case." And she began versifying in these verses. When love and longing and regret are mine, Must not this body show of ills a sign? My love, say not, thou soon shalt be consoled. When state speaks state, none shall allay my pine. If living man could swim upon his tears, I first should float on waters of these eyne. O thou, who in my heart infusedst thy love, as water mingles in the cup with wine, this was the fear I feared, this parting blow, O thou whose love my heart core ne'er shall tine. O bin Chakan, my thought, my hope, my will, O thou whose love this breast make wholly thine, against thy lord the king thou sinnedst for me, and winst exile in lands peregrine. Allah ne'er make my lord repent my loss, to cream a man thou gavest me, one right dine. When she had ended her verses, Nur ad-Din answered her with these lines. She bade me farewell on our parting day, and she wept in the fire of our bane and pains. What wilt thou do when for thee I'm gone? Quoth I, say this to whom life remains. When the caliph heard her saying in her verse, To Karim the cream of men thou gavest me, his inclination for her redoubled, and it seemed a hard matter and a grievous to part them. So quoth he to the youth, O my lord, truly the damsel said in her verses that thou didst transgress against her master and him who owned her. So tell me, against whom didst thou transgress, and who is it hath a claim on thee? By Allah, O fisherman, replied Nur ad -Din, there befell me and this damsel a wondrous tale and a marvellous matter, and to a graven with needle-gravers on the eye-corners it would be a warner to whoso would be warned. Cried the caliph, Wilt thou not tell me thy story, and acquaint me with thy case? Haply it may bring thee relief, for Allah's aid is ever near hand. O fisherman, said Nur ad-Din, wilt thou hear our history in verse or in prose? Prose is a wordy thing, but verses, rejoined the caliph, are pearls on a string. Then Nur ad -Din bowed his head, and made these couplets. O oh, my friend, reft of rest, no repose I command, and my grief is redoubled in this far land. Erst I had a father, a kinder ne'er was, but he died, and to death paid the day odand. When he went from me, every matter went wrong, till my heart was nigh broken, my nature unmanned. He bought me a handmaid, a sweeting who shamed, a wand of the willow by Zephyr befanned. I lavished upon her mine heritage, and spent like a nobleman, puissant and grand. Then to sell her compelled, my sorrow increased. The parting was sore, but I mote not gain stand. Now as soon as the crier had called her their bid, A wicked old fellow, a fiery brand, So I raged with a rage that I could not restrain, And snatched her from out of his hireling's hand. 
When the angry curmudgeon made ready for blows, and the fire of a fight kindled he and his band, I smote him in fury with right and with left, and his hide, till well satisfied, curried and tanned. Then in fear I fled forth, and lay hid in my house, to escape from the snares which my foemen had spanned. So the king of the country proclaimed my arrest, when access to me a good chamberlain fanned, and warned me to flee from the city afar, disappear, disappoint what my enemies planned. Then we fled from our home neath the wing of the night, and sought us a refuge by Baghdad's strand. Of my riches I've nothing on thee to bestow, O fisher, except the fair gift thou hast scanned. The loved of my soul, and when I from her part, know for sure that I give thee the blood of my heart. When he had ended his verse, the caliph said to him, O my lord Nur ad-Din, explain to me thy case more fully. So he told him the whole story from beginning to end, and the caliph said to him, Whither dost thou now intend? Allah's world is wide, replied he. Quoth the caliph, I will write thee a letter to carry to the Sultan Mohammed bin Sulaiman as Zaini, which, when he readeth, he will not hurt nor harm thee in aught. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section four of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume Two. Section 5, Volume 2 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. Volume 2, Section 5. When it was the thirty-eighth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the caliph said to Nur ad-Din Ali, I will write thee a letter to carry to the Sultan Mohammed bin Sulaiman as Zaini, which, when he readeth, he will not hurt nor harm thee in aught, Nur ad-Din asked, What? Is there in the world a fisherman who writeth to kings? Such a thing can never be. And the caliph answered, Thou sayest sooth, but I will tell thee the reason. Know that I and he learnt in the same school under one schoolmaster, and that I was his monitor. Since that time fortune befriended him, and he is become a sultan, while Allah hath abased me, and made me a fisherman. Yet I never send to him to ask aught, but he doeth my desire. Nay, though I should ask of him a thousand favours every day, he would comply." When Nur ad-Din heard this, he said, Good, write that I may see. So the caliph took ink-case and reed-pen, and wrote as follows, In the name of Allah, the compassionating, the compassionate. But after, this letter is written by Harun al-Rashid, son of al-Mahdi, to his highness Mohammed bin Sulaiman al-Zaini, whom I have encompassed about with my favour, and made my viceroy in certain of my dominions. The bearer of these presents is Nur ad-Din Ali, son of Fazl bin Khakan the wazir. As soon as they come to thy hand, divest thyself forthright of the kingly dignity, and invest him therewith. So oppose not my commandment, and peace be with thee. He gave the letter to Nur ad-Din, who took it and kissed it, then put it in his turban, and set out at once on his journey. So far concerning him. But as regards the caliph, Shaykh Ibrahim stared to him, and he still in fisher garb, and said, O vilest of fishermen, thou hast brought us a couple of fish worth a score of half dirhams, and hast gotten three dinars for them, and thinkest thou to take the damsel to boot? When the caliph heard this, he cried out at him, and signed to Masrur, who discovered himself, and rushed in upon him. 
Now Ja'afar had sent one of the gardener lads to the doorkeeper of the palace to fetch a suit of royal raiment for the prince of the faithful. So the man went, and returning with the suit, kissed the ground before the caliph, and gave it him. Then he threw off the clothes he had on, and donned kingly apparel. Shaykh Ibrahim was still sitting upon his chair, and the caliph tarried to behold what would come next. But seeing the fisherman become the caliph, Shaykh Ibrahim was utterly confounded, and he could do nothing but bite his finger-ends, and say, Would I knew whether am I asleep or am I awake? At last the caliph looked at him, and cried, O oh, Shaykh Ibrahim, what state is this in which I see thee? Thereupon he recovered from his drunkenness, and throwing himself upon the ground, repeated these verses. Pardon the sinful ways I did pursue, Ruth from his lord to every slave is due, Confession pays the fine that sin demands, Where then is that which grace and mercy sue? The caliph forgave him, and bade carry the damsel to the city palace where he set apart for her an apartment, and appointed slaves to serve her, saying to her, Know that we have sent thy lord to be sultan in Basura, and, almighty Allah willing, we will dispatch him the dress of investiture, and thee with it. Meanwhile Nur ad-Din Ali ceased not travelling till he reached Basura, where he repaired to the sultan's palace, and he shouted a long shout. The sultan heard him, and sent for him, and when he came into his presence, he kissed the ground between his hands, and producing the letter, presented it to him. Seeing the superscription in the writing of the commander of the faithful, the sultan rose to his feet, and kissed it three times, and after reading it said, I hear and I obey Allah Almighty, and the commander of the faithful. Then he summoned the four Qazis and the emirs, and was about to divest himself of the rule royal, when, behold, in came Al-Mu'in bin Sawi. The Sultan gave him the Caliph's letter, and he read it, then tore it to pieces, and putting it into his mouth, chewed it, and spat it out. Woe to thee, quoth the Sultan, and indeed he was sore angered, what induced thee to do this deed? Now by thy life, O our Lord the Sultan, replied Mu'in, this man hath never foregathered with the caliph, nor with his wazir, but he is a gallows-bird, a limb of Satan, a knave who, having come upon a written paper in the caliph's hand, some idle scroll, hath made it serve his own end. The caliph would surely not send him to take the sultanate from thee without the imperial autograph and the diploma of investiture, and he certainly would have dispatched with him a chamberlain or a minister." but he hath come alone, and he never came from the caliph. No, never, never, never. What is to be done? asked the sultan, and the minister answered, Leave him to me, and I will take him and keep him away from thee, and send him in charge of a chamberlain to Baghdad city. Then, if what he says be sooth, they will bring us back autograph and investiture, and if not, I will take my due out of this debtor. When the sultan heard the minister's words, he said, Hence with thee, and him too. Al-Mu'in took trust of him from the king, and carrying him to his own house, cried out to his pages, who laid him flat, and beat him till he fainted. Then he let put upon his feet heavy shackles, and carried him to the jail, where he called the jailer, one Kutait, who came and kissed the ground before him. Quoth the wazir, O Kutait, I wish thee to take this fellow, and throw him into one of the underground cells in the prison, and torture him night and day. To hear is to obey, replied the jailer, and taking Nur ad-Din into the prison, locked the door upon him. Then he gave orders to sweep a bench behind the door, and spreading on it a sitting-rug and a leather cloth, seated Nur ad-Din thereon, and loosed his shackles, and entreated him kindly. The wazir sent every day, enjoining the jailer to beat him, but he abstained from this, and so continued to do for forty days. On the forty-first day there came a present from the caliph, which, when the sultan saw, it pleased him, and he consulted his ministers on the matter, when one of them said, Perchance this present was for the new sultan. Cried al-Mu'in, 
we should have done well had we put him to death at his first coming. And the Sultan cried, By Allah, thou hast reminded me of him. Go down to the prison and fetch him, and I will strike off his head. To hear is to obey, replied al Mu'in. Then he stood up and said, I will make proclamation in the city. Whoso would solace himself with seeing the beheading of Nur ad Din bin al Fazl bin Khakan, let him repair to the palace. So follower and followed, great and small, will flock to the spectacle, and I shall heal my heart and harm my foe. Do as thou wilt, said the Sultan. The Wazir went off, and he was glad and gay, and ordered the chief of police to make the aforementioned proclamation. When the people heard the crier, they all sorrowed and wept, even the little ones at school and the traders in their shops, and some strove to get places for seeing the sight, whilst others went to the prison with the object of escorting him thence. Presently the wazir came with the ten mamelukes to the jail, and Kutait the jailer asked him, Whom seekest thou, O our lord the wazir? Whereto he answered, Bring me out that gallows bird. But the jailer said, He is in the sorriest of plights for the much beating I have given him. Then he went into the prison, and found Nur ad-Din repeating these verses. Who shall support me in calamities when fail all cures and greater cares arise? Exile hath worn my heart, my vitals torn, the world to foes hath turned my firm allies. O oh, folk, will not one friend amidst you all wail o'er my woes and cry to hear my cries? Death and its agonies seem light to me, since life has lost all joys and jollities. O Lord of Mustafa, that science see, sole intercessor, guide all where, all wise, I pray thee free me and my fault forego, and from me drive mine evil and my woe. The jailer stripped off his clean clothes, and dressing him in two filthy vests, carried him to the wazir. Nur ad-Din looked at him, and saw it was his foe that sought to compass his death. So he wept, and said, Art thou then so secure against the world? Hast thou not heard the saying of the poet? Kisras and Caesars in a bygone day, Stored wealth, where is it? And ah, where are they? O oh, Wazir, he continued, Know that Allah, be he extolled and exalted, Will do whatso he will. O oh, Ali, replied he, thinkest thou to frighten me with such talk? I mean this very day to smite thy neck despite the noses of the Basura folk, and I care not. Let the days do as they please, nor will I turn me to thy counsel, but rather to what the poet saith. Leave thou the days to breed their ban and bait, and make thee strong to bear the weight of fate. And also how excellently saith another, Whoso shall see the death-day of his foe, One day surviving, wins his bestest wish. Then he ordered his attendants to mount Nur ad-Din upon the bare back of a mule, and they said to the youth, For well, truly it was irksome to them, Let us stone him and cut him down, though our lives go for it. But Nur ad-Din said to them, Do not so. Have ye not heard the saying of the poet? Needs must I bear the term by fate decreed, and when that day be dead, needs must I die. If lions drag me to their forest lair, safe should I live till draw my death day nigh. Then they proceeded to proclaim before Nur ad-Din. This is the least of the retribution for him who imposeth upon kings with forgeries and they ceased not parading him around about Basura, till they made him stand beneath the palace windows, and set him upon the leather of blood. And the sworder came up to him, and said, O oh my lord, I am but a slave commanded in this matter. An thou have any desire, tell it me, that I may fulfil it, for now there remaineth of thy life only so much as may be, till the sultan shall put his face out of the lattice. Thereupon Nur ad-Din looked to the right and to the left, and before him and behind him, and began improvising. The sword, the sworder, and the blood-skin waiting me I sight. 
and cry alack mine evil fate ah my calamity how is't i see no loving friend with eye of sense or soul what no one here i cry to all will none reply to me the time is past that formed my life my death term draweth nigh will no man win the grace of god showing me clemency and look with pity on my state and clear my dark despair e'en with a draught of water dealt to cool death's agony the people fell to weeping over him and the headsman rose and brought him a draught of water but the wazir sprang up from his place and smote the guglet with his hand and broke it then he cried out at the executioner and bade him strike off nur ad din's head so he bound the eyes of the doomed man and folk clamoured at the wazir and loud wailings were heard and much questioning of man and man at this moment behold rose a dense dust cloud filling sky and wold and when the sultan who was sitting in the palace descried this he said to his suite go and see what yon cloud bringeth replied al muin not till we have smitten this fellow's neck but the sultan said wait ye till we see what this meaneth now the dust cloud was the dust of jafar the barmecide wazir to the caliph and his host and the cause of his coming was as follows the caliph passed thirty days without calling to mind the matter of nur ad din ali and none reminded him of it till one night as he passed by the chamber of anis al jalis he heard her weeping and singing with a soft sweet voice these lines of the poet in thought i see thy form when farthest far or nearest near and on my tongue there dwells a name which man shall ne'er unhear then her weeping redoubled when lo the caliph opened the door and entering the chamber found anis al jalis in tears when she saw him she fell to the ground and kissing his feet three times repeated these lines o fertile root and noble growth of trunk ripe fruitful branch of never sullied race i mind thee of what pact thy bounty made far beat from thee thou shouldst forget my case quoth the caliph who art thou and she replied i am she whom ali bin khakan gave thee in gift and i wish the fulfilment of thy promise to send me to him with a robe of honour for i have now been thirty days without tasting the food of sleep thereupon the caliph sent for jaafar and said to him o jaafar tis thirty days since we have had news of nur ad din bin khakan and i cannot suppose that the sultan hath slain him but by the life of my head and by the sepulchres of my forefathers if aught of foul play hath befallen him i will surely make an end of him who was the cause of it though he be the dearest of all men to myself so i desire that thou set out for bassorah within this hour and bring me tidings of my cousin king mohammed bin sulaiman az zaini and how he had dealt with nur ad din ali bin khakan adding if thou tarry longer on the road than shall suffice for the journey i will strike off thy head furthermore do thou tell the son of my uncle the whole story of nur ad din and how i sent him with my written orders and if thou find o my cousin that the king hath done otherwise than as i commanded bring him and the wazir al muin bin sawi to us in whatsoever guise thou shalt find them hearing and obedience replied jaafar and making ready on the instant he set out for bassorah where the news of his coming had foregone him and had reached to the ears of king mohammed when jaafar arrived and saw the crushing and crowding of the lieges he asked what means all this gathering so they told him what was doing in the matter of nur ad din whereupon he hastened to go to the sultan and saluting him acquainted him with the cause why he came and the caliph's resolve in case of any foul play having befallen the youth to put to death whoso should have brought it about then he took into custody the king and the wazir and laid them in ward and giving order for the release of nur ad din ali enthroned him as sultan in the stead of mohammed bin sulaiman after this jaafar abode three days in bassorah the usual guest time 
and on the morning of the fourth day nur ad din ali turned to him and said i long for the sight of the commander of the faithful then said ja'afar to mohammed bin sulaiman make ready to travel for we will say the dawn prayer and mount baghdad woods and he replied to hear is to obey then they prayed and they took horse and set out all of them carrying with them the wazir al mu'in bin sawi who began to repent of what he had done nur ad-din rode by ja'far's side and they stinted not faring on till they arrived at baghdad the house of peace and going in to the caliph told him how they had found nur ad-din nigh upon death thereupon the caliph said to the youth take this sword and smite with it the neck of thine enemy so he took the sword from his hand and stepped up to al mu'in who looked at him and said i did according to my mother's milk do thou according to thine upon this nur ad-din cast the sword from his hand and said to the caliph o commander of the faithful he hath beguiled me with his words and he repeated this couplet by craft and sleight i snared him when he came a few fair words i trap the noble game leave him then cried the caliph and turning to masrur said rise thou and smite his neck so masrur drew his sword and struck off his head then quoth the caliph to nur ad-din ali ask a boon of me o my lord answered he i have no need of the kingship of bassora my sole desire is to be honoured by serving thee and by seeing thy countenance with love and gladness said the caliph then he sent for the damsel anis al jalis and bestowed plentiful favours upon them both and gave them one of his palaces in baghdad and assigned stipends and allowances and made nur ad-din ali bin fazl bin khakan one of his cup companions and he abode with the commander of the faithful enjoying the pleasantest of lives till death overtook him yet continued shahrazad is not his story in any wise more wondrous than the history of the merchant and his children the king asked and what was that and shahrazad began to relate the tale of ghanim bin ayyub the distraught the thrall o love it hath reached me O auspicious king that in times of yore and in years and ages long gone before there lived in damascus a merchant among the merchants a wealthy man who had a son like the moon on the night of his fullness and withal sweet of speech who was named ghanim bin ayyub surnamed the distraught the thrall of love he had also a daughter own sister to ghanim who was called fitna a damsel unique in beauty and loveliness their father died and left them with abundant wealth and shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section 5 of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume 2When it was the thirty-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the merchant left his two children abundant wealth, and amongst other things an hundred loads of silks and brocades, musk pods and mother of pearl, and there was written on every bale, This is of the packages intended for Baghdad, it having been his purpose to make the journey thither when Almighty Allah took him to himself which was in the time of the caliph Harun al-Rashid. After a while his son took the loads, and bidding farewell to his mother and kindred and townsfolk, went forth with a company of merchants, 
putting his trust in Allah Almighty, who decreed him safety so that he arrived without let or stay at Baghdad. There he hired for himself a fair dwelling-house, which he furnished with carpets and cushions, curtains and hangings, and therein stored his bales and stabled his mules and camels, after which he abode a while resting. Presently the merchants and notables of Baghdad came and saluted him, after which he took a bundle containing ten pieces of costly stuffs, with the prices written on them, and carried it to the merchant's bazaar, where they welcomed and saluted him, and showed him all honour, and making him dismount from his beast, seated him in the shop of the syndic of the market, to whom he delivered the package. He opened it, and drawing out the pieces of stuff, sold them for him at a profit of two dinners on every dinner of prime cost. At this Ghanim rejoiced, and kept selling his silks and stuffs one after another, and ceased not to do on this wise for a full year. On the first day of the following year he went, as was his wont, to the exchange, which was in the bazaar, but found the gate shut, and inquiring the reason was told, One of the merchants is dead, and all the others have gone to follow his bier, and why shouldst thou not win the meed of good deeds by walking with them he replied yes and asked for the quarter where the funeral was taking place and one directed him thereto so he purified himself by the wuso ablution and repaired with the other merchants to the oratory where they prayed over the dead then walked before the bier to the burial place and Ghanim, who was a bashful man, followed them, being ashamed to leave them. They presently issued from the city, and passed through the tombs until they reached the grave, where they found that the deceased's kith and kin had pitched a tent over the tomb, and had brought thither lamps and wax candles. So they buried the body, and sat down while the readers read out and recited the Koran over the grave, and Ghanim sat with them, being overcome with bashfulness, and saying to himself, I cannot well go away till they do. They tarried listening to the Koranic perfection till nightfall, when the servants set supper and sweetmeats before them, and they ate till they were satisfied. Then they washed their hands, and again took their places. But Ganim's mind was preoccupied with his house and goods, being in fear of robbers and he said to himself i am a stranger here and supposed to have money if i pass the night abroad the thieves will steal my money-bags and my bales to boot so when he could no longer control his fear he arose and left the assembly having first asked leave to go about some urgent business and following the signs of the road he soon came to the city gate but it was midnight and he found the doors locked and saw none going or coming nor heard aught but the hounds baying and the wolves howling at this he exclaimed there is no majesty and there is no might save in allah i was in fear for my property and came back on this account but now i find the gate shut and I am in mortal fear for my life. Then he turned back, and looking out for a place where he could sleep till morning, presently found a Santon's tomb, a square of four walls with a date tree in the central court and a granite gateway. The door was wide open, so he entered and would fain have slept, but sleep came not to him and terror and the sense of desolation oppressed him for that he was alone amidst the tombs so he rose to his feet and opening the door looked out and lo he was aware of a light afar off in the direction of the city gate then walking a little way towards it he saw that it was on the road whereby he had reached the tomb this made him fear for his life so he hastily shut the door and climbed to the top of the dale tree where he hid himself in the heart of the fronds the light came nearer and nearer till it was close to the tomb then it stopped 
and he saw three slaves, two bearing a chest, and one with a lanthorn, an adze, and a basket containing some mortar. When they reached the tomb, one of those who were carrying the case said, What aileth thee, O Sabab? And said the other, What is the matter, O Kafir? Quoth he, Were we not here at supper-tide, and did we not leave the door open? Yes, replied the other, that is true. See, said Kafir, now it's shut and barred. How weak are your wits, cried the third who bore the adze, and his name was Bukyat. Know we not that the owners of the gardens used to come out from Baghdad and tend them, and, when evening closes upon them, they enter this place and shut the door, for fear lest the wicked black men like ourselves should catch them, and roast them, and eat them? Thou sayest sooth, said the two hours but by allah however that may be none amongst us is weaker of which than thou if ye do not believe me said bukyat let us enter the tomb and i will rouse the rat for you for i doubt not but that when he saw the light and us making for the place he ran up the date tree and hid there for fear of us when ghanim heard this he said in himself o oh, curtest of slaves may allah not have thee in his holy keeping for this thy craft and keenness of wit there is no majesty and there is no might save in allah the glorious the great how shall i win free of these blackamoors then said the two who bore the box to him of the adze swarm up the wall and open the gate for us o bakyat for we are tired of carrying the chest on our necks and when thou hast opened the gate thou shalt have one of those we catch inside a fine fat rat which we will fry for thee after such excellent fashion that not a speck of his fat shall be lost but bakyat answered i am afraid of somewhat which may weak wits have suggested to me we should do better to throw the chest over the gateway for it is our treasure if we throw it it will break replied they and he said i fear lest there be robbers within who murder folk and plunder their goods for evenings in their time of entering such place and dividing their spoil oh thou weak of wits said both the bearers of the box how could they ever get in here then they sat down the chest and climbing over the wall dropped inside and opened the gate whilst the third slave he that was called bakyat stood by them holding the adze the lanthorn and the hand-basket containing the mortar after this they locked the gate and sat down and presently one of them said o oh, my brethren we are wearied with walking and with lifting up and setting down the chest and with unlocking and locking the gate and now it is midnight and we have no breath left to open a tomb and bury the box so let us rest here two or three hours then rise and do the job meanwhile each of us shall tell how he came to be castrated and all that befell him from first to last the better to pass away our time while we take our rest thereupon the first he of the lanthorn and whose name was bakyat said i'll tell you my tale say on replied they so he began as follows the first tale of the first eunuch bakyat know o oh my brothers that when i was a little one some five years old I was taken home from my native country by a slave-driver who sold me to a certain apparitor. My purchaser had a daughter, three years old, with whom I was brought up. And they used to make mock of me, letting me play with her and dance for her and sing to her, till I reached the age of twelve and she that of ten. And even then they did not forbid me seeing her one day i went in to her and found her sitting in an inner room and she looked as if she had just come out of the bath which was in the house for she was scented with essences and reek of aromatic woods 
and her face shone like a circle of the moon on the fourteenth night. She began to sport with me, and I with her. Now I had just reached the age of puberty, so my prickle stood at point, as it were a huge key. Then she threw me on my back, and mounting a straddle on my breast, fell a wriggling and bucking upon me till she had uncovered my yard. When she saw it standing with head erect, she hent it in hand and began rubbing it upon the lips of her little slit outside her petticoat trousers. Thereat hot lust stirred in me, and I threw my arms round her, while she wound hers about my neck and hugged me to her with all her might, till, before I knew what I did, my pistol split up her trousers and entered her slit and did away her maidenhead. When I saw this I ran off and took refuge with one of my comrades. Presently her mother came in to her, and seeing her in this case, fainted clean away. However, she managed the matter advisedly, and hid it from the girl's father out of good will to me. Nor did they cease to call to me and coax me, till they took me from where I was. After two months had passed, her mother married her to a young man, a barber who used to shave her papa, and portioned and fitted her out of her own monies, whilst the father knew nothing of what had passed. On the night of consummation they cut the throat of a pigeon poult and sprinkled the blood on her shift. After a while they seized me unawares and gelded me, and when they brought her to her bridegroom they made me her aga, her eunuch, to walk before her wheresoever she went, whether to the bath or to her father's house. I abode with her a long time, enjoying her beauty and loveliness, by way of kissing and clipping and coupling with her, till she died, and her husband and mother and father died also, when they seized me for the royal treasury as being the property of an interstate and I found my way hither, where I became your comrade. This, then, O oh, my brethren, is the cause of my cullions being cut off, and peace be with you. He ceased, and his fellow began in these words, the tale of the second eunuch, Kafur. Know, O oh, my brothers, that when, beginning service as a boy of eight, I used to tell the slave dealers regularly and exactly one lie every year, so that they fell out with one another, till at last my master lost patience with me, and, carrying me down to the market, ordered the brokers to cry, Who will buy this slave knowing his blemish and making allowance for it? He did so, and they asked him, Pray what may be his blemish, and he answered, he telleth me one single lie every year. Now a man that was a merchant came up and said to the broker, How much do they allow for him with his blemish? They allow six hundred dirhams, he replied, and said the other, Thou shalt have twenty dirhams for thyself. So he arranged between him and the slave-dealer who took the coin from him, and the broker carried me to the merchant's house and departed after receiving his brokerage. The trader clothed me with suitable dress, and I stayed in his service the rest of my twelve month until the new year began happily. It was a blessed season, plantious in the produce of the earth, and the merchants used to feast every day at the house of some one among them till it was my master's turn to entertain them in a flower-garden without the city. So he and the other merchants went to the garden, taking with them all that they required of Provence and else beside, and sat eating and carousing and drinking till midday, when my master, having need of some matter from his home, said to me, O oh, slave, mount the she-mule, and hie thee to the house, and bring from thy mistress such and such a thing, and return quickly. I obeyed his bidding, and started for the house, but as I drew near it, I began to cry out and shed tears, whereupon all the people of the quarter collected great and small, and my master's wife and daughters, hearing the noise I was making, 
opened the door and asked me what was the matter said i my master was sitting with his friends beneath an old wall and it fell on one and all of them and when i saw what happened to them i mounted the mule and came hither in haste to tell you when my master's daughter and wife heard this they screamed and rent their raiment and beat their faces whilst the neighbours came around them then the wife overturned the furniture of the house one thing upon another and tore down the shelves and broke the windows and the lattices and smeared the walls with mud and indigo saying to me woe to thee o kafur come help me to tear down these cupboards and break up the vessels and this china ware and the rest of it so i went to her and aided her to smash all the shelves in the house with whatever stood upon them after which i went round about the terrace roofs and every part of the place spoiling all i could and leaving no china in the house unbroken till i had laid waste the whole crying out the while well away my master then my mistress fared forth barefaced wearing a head kerchief and not else and her daughters and the children sallied out with her and said to me o kafur go thou before us and show us the place where thy master lieth dead that we may take him from under the fallen wall and lay him on a bier and bear him to the house and give him a fine funeral so i went forth before them crying out slack my master and they after me with faces and heads bare and all shrieking alas alas for the man now there remained none in the quarter neither man nor woman nor epicene nor youth nor maid nor child nor old trot but went with us smiting their faces and weeping bitterly and i led them leisurely through the whole city the folk asked them what was the matter whereupon they told them what they had heard from me and all exclaimed there is no majesty and there is no might save in allah then said one of them he was a personage of consequence so let us go to the governor and tell him what hath befallen him when they told the governor and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section six of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume Two. Read by Lars Rolander. Section seven, Volume Two of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2, Section 7. When it was the fortieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when they told the governor, he rose and mounted and taking with him labourers with spades and baskets went on my track with many people behind him and i ran on before them howling and casting dust on my head and beating my face followed by my mistress and her children keening for the dead but i got ahead of them and entered the garden before them and when my master saw me in this state i smiting my face and saying well away my mistress alas 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 who is left to take pity on me now that my mistress is gone would i had been a sacrifice for her he stood aghast and his colour waxed yellow and he said to me what ails thee o kafir what is the matter o oh, my lord i replied when thou sentest me to the house i found that the saloon wall had given way and had fallen like a lair upon my mistress and her children and did not thy mistress escape no by allah o oh, my master not one of them was saved 
the first to die was my mistress thine elder daughter and did not my younger daughter escape no she did not and what became of the mare mule i used to ride is she safe no by allah o oh, my master the house walls and the stable walls buried every living thing that was within doors even to the sheep and geese and poultry so that they all became a heap of flesh and the dogs and cats are eating them and not one of them is left alive and hath not thy master my elder son escaped no by allah not one of them was saved and now there is not left of house or household nor even a sign of them and as for the sheep and geese and hens the cats and dogs have devoured them when my master heard this the light became night before his sight his wits were dazed and he so lost command of his senses that he could not stand firm on his feet he was as one struck with a sudden palsy, and his back was like to break. Then he rent his raiment and plucked out his beard, and casting his turban from off his head, buffeted his face till the blood ran down, and he cried aloud, Alas, my children! Alas, my wife! Alas, my calamity! To whom ever befell that which hath befallen me! The merchants, his friends, also cried aloud at his crying, and wept for his weeping, and tore their clothes, being moved to pity of his case. And so my master went out of the garden, smiting his face with such violence that from excess of pain he staggered like one drunken with wine. As he and the merchants came forth from the garden gate, behold, they saw a great cloud of dust and heard a loud noise of crying and lamentation so they looked and lo it was the governor with his attendants and the town folk a world of people who had come out to look on and my master's family following them all screaming and crying aloud and weeping exceeding sore weeping the first to address my owner were his wife and children and when he saw them he was confounded and laughed and said to them how is it with all of you and what befell you in the house and what hath come to pass you when they saw him they exclaimed praise to be to allah for thy preservation and threw themselves upon him and his children hung about him crying slack our father thanks to allah for thy safety o our father and his wife said to him art thou indeed well lord to allah who hath shown us thy face in safety and indeed she was confounded and her reason fled when she saw him and she asked o oh, my lord how didst thou escape thou and thy friends the merchants and he answered her and how fared it with thee in the house quoth they we were all well whole and healthy nor had aught of evil befallen us in the house save that thy slave kafur came to us bareheaded with torn garments and howling alas the master alas the master so we asked him what tidings o kafur and he answered a wall of the garden hath fallen on my master and his friends the merchants and they are all crushed and dead by allah said my master he came to me but now howling alas my mistress alas the children of the mistress and said my mistress and her children are all dead every one of them then he looked round and seeing me with my turban rent in rags round my neck howling and weeping with exceeding weeping and throwing dust upon my head he cried out at me so i came to him and he said woe to thee o ill-omened slave o horse and knave o thou damned breed what mischief thou hast wrought by allah i will flog thy skin from thy flesh and cut thy flesh from thy bones i rejoined 
by allah thou canst do nothing of the kind with me o my lord for thou boughtest me with my blemish and there are honest men to bear witness against thee that thou didst so accept in the condition and that thou knewest of my fault which is to tell one lie every year now this is only a half lie but by the end of the year i will tell the other half then will the lie stand whole and complete o oh, dog son of a dog cried my master o oh, most accursed of slaves is this all of it but a half lie verily if it be a half lie tis a whole calamity get thee from me thou art free in the face of allah by allah rejoined i if thou free me i will not free thee till my year is completed and i have told thee the half lie which is left when this is done go down with me to the slave market and sell me as thou boughtest me to whoso will buy me with my blemish but thou shalt not manumit me for i have no handicraft whereby to gain my living and this my demand is a matter of law which the doctors have laid down in the chapter of emancipation while we were at these words up came the crowd of people and the neighbours of the quarter men women and children together with the governor and his suit offering condolence so my master and the other merchants went up to him and informed him of the adventure and how this was but a half lie at which all wondered deeming it a whole lie and a big one and they cursed me and reviled me while i stood laughing and grinning at them till at last i asked how shall my master slay me when he bought me with this my blemish then my master returned home and found his house in ruins and it was i who had laid waste the greater part of it having broken things which were worth much money and also had done his wife who had said to him twas kafir who broke the vessels and china ware thereupon his rage redoubled and he struck hand upon hand exclaiming by allah in my life never saw i a horse unlike this slave and he saith this is but a half lie how then if he had told me a whole lie he would ruin a city ay or even two then in his fury he went to the governor and they gave me a neat thing in the bastinado line and made me eat stick till i was lost to the world and fainting fit came on me and whilst i was yet senseless they brought the barber who docked me and gelded me and cauterized the wound when i revived i found myself a clean eunuch with nothing left and my master said to me even as thou hast burned my heart for the things i held dearest so have i burnt thy heart for that of thy members whereby thou settest most store then he took me and sold me at a profit for that i was become an eunuch and i ceased not bringing trouble upon all wherever i was sold and was shifted from lord to lord and from notable to notable being sold and being bought till i entered the palace of the commander of the faithful but now my spirit is broken and my tricks are gone from me so alas are my ballocks when the two slaves heard his story they laughed at him and chaffed him and said truly thou art skite and skite son thou liedest an odious lie then quoth they to the third slave tell us thy tale o oh, sons of my uncle quoth he all that ye have said is idle i will tell you the cause of my losing my testicles and indeed i deserve to lose even more for i futtered both my mistress and my master's eldest son and heir but my story is a long one and this is not the time to tell it for the dawn o oh, my cousins draweth near 
and if morning come upon us with this chest still unburied we shall get into sore disgrace and our lives will pay for it so up with you and open the door and when we get back to the palace i will tell you my story and the cause of my losing my precious stones then he swarmed up and dropped down from the wall inside and opened the door so they entered and setting down the lantern dug between four tombs a hole as long as the chest and of the same breadth kafur plied the spade and savab removed the earth by baskets full till they reached the depth of the stature of a man when they laid the chest in the hole and threw back the earth over it then they went forth and shutting the door disappeared from ganem's eyes when all was quiet and he felt sure that he was left alone in the place his thought was busied about what the chest contained and he said to himself would that i knew the contents of that box however he waited till day broke when morning shone and showed her sheen whereupon he came down from the date tree and scooped away the earth with his hands till the box was laid bare and disengaged from the ground then he took a large stone and hammered at the lock till he broke it and opening the lid behold a young lady a model of beauty and loveliness clad in the richest of garments and jewels of gold and such necklaces of precious stones were the sultan's country even with them it would not pay their price she had been drugged with bang but her bosom rising and falling showed that her breath had not departed when ganim saw her he knew that some one had played her false and hocussed her so he pulled her out of the chest and laid her on the ground with her face upwards as soon as she smelt the breeze and the air entered her nostrils mouth and lungs she sneezed and choked and coughed when there fell out from her throat a pill of cretan bang had an elephant smelt it he would have slept from night to night then she opened her eyes and glancing around said in sweet voice and gracious words woe to thee o wind there is not in thee to satisfy the thirsty nor aught to gratify one whose thirst is satisfied where is tsar al bostam but no one answered her so she turned her and cried out ho sabia shariat al dur nur al huda naimat al sub be ye awake shava nusab halva sarifa out on you speak but no one answered so she looked all around and said woe's me have they entombed me in the tombs o oh, thou who knowest what man's thought embalms and who givest compensation on the day of doom who can have brought me from amid hanging screens and curtains veiling the harem rooms and set me down between four tombs all this while ganim was standing by then he said to her o oh, my lady here are neither screened rooms nor palace harems nor yet tombs only the slave henceforth devoted to thy love ganim bin ayub sent to thee by the omniscient one above that all thy troubles he may remove and win for thee every wish that cloth behove then he held his peace she was reassured by his words and cried i testify that there is no god but the god and i testify that mohammed is the apostle of god then she turned to ganim and placing her hands before her face said to him in the sweetest speech o oh, blessed youth who brought me hither see i am now come to myself o oh, my lady he replied three slave eunuchs came here bearing this chest and related to her the whole of what he had befallen him and how evening having closed upon him had proved the cause of her preservation otherwise she had died smothered then he asked her who she was and what was her story and she answered o oh, youth thanks be to allah who hath cast me into the hands of the like of thee 
but now rise and put me back into the box then fare forth upon the road and hire the first camel driver or muleteer thou findest to carry it to thy house when i am there all will be well and i will tell thee my tale and acquaint thee with my adventures and great shall be thy gain by means of me at this he rejoiced and went outside the tomb the day was now dazzling bright and the firmament shone with light and the folk had begun to circulate so he hired a man with a mule and bringing him to the tomb lifted the chest wherein he had put the damsel and set it on the mule her love now engrossed his heart and he fared homeward with her rejoicing for that she was a girl worth ten thousand gold pieces and her raiment and ornaments would fetch a mint of money as soon as he arrived at his house he carried in the chest and opening it and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say end of section seven of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume two read by lars rolander section eight volume two of the book of a thousand nights and a night translated by richard burton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by lars rolander the book of a thousand nights and a night volume two section eight when it was the forty-first night she said it hath reached me auspicious king that when ghanim son of ayub arrived with the chest at his house he opened it and took out the young lady who looked about her and seeing that the place was handsome spread with carpets and dight with cheerful colours and other deckings and noting the stuffs up piled and packed bales and other else than that knew that he was a substantial merchant and a man of much money thereupon she uncovered her face and looked at him and lo he was a fair youth so when she saw him she loved him and said o oh, my lord bring us something to eat on my head and mine eyes replied he and going down to the bazaar bought a roasted lamb and a dish of sweetmeats and with these dry fruits and wax candles besides wine and whatsoever was required of drinking materials not forgetting perfumes with all this gear he returned to the house and when the damsel saw him she laughed and kissed him and clasped his neck then she began caressing him which made his love wax hotter till it got the mastery of his heart they ate and drank and each had conceived the fondest affection for indeed the two were one in age and one in loveliness and when night came on ghanim bin ayub the distraught the thrall of love rose and lit the wax candles and lamps till the place blazed with light after which he produced the wine service and spread the table then both sat down again he and she and he kept filling and giving her to drink and she kept filling and giving him to drink and they played and toyed and laughed and recited verses whilst their joy increased and they dug in closer love each to each glory be to the uniter of hearts they ceased not to carouse after this fashion till near upon dawn when drowsiness overcame them and they slept where they were apart each from other till the morning then ghanim arose and going to the market bought all they required of meat and vegetables and wine and what not and brought them to the house whereupon both sat down to eat and ate their sufficiency when he set on wine they drank and each played with each till their cheeks flushed red and their eyes took on a darker hue and ghanim's soul longed to kiss the girl and to lie with her and he said o oh, my lady grant me one kiss of that dear mouth 
perchance it will quench the fire of my heart. O oh, Ghanim, replied she, wait till I am drunk and dead to the world, then steal a kiss of me secretly and on such wise that I may not know thou hast kissed me. Then she rose and taking off her upper dress sat in a thin shift of fine linen and a silken headkerchief. At this passion inflamed Ganim, and he said to her, O oh, my lady, wilt thou not vouchsafe me what I asked of thee? By Allah, she replied, that may not be thine, for there is written upon my trouser string a hard word. Thereupon Ganim's heart sank, and desire grew on him as its object offered difficulties, and he improvised these verses. I ask the author of mine ills to heal the wound with one sweet kiss. No, no, she cried, for ever no, but I, soft whispering, urged yes. Quoth she, then take it by my leave, when smiles shall pardon thine amiss. By force, cried I, nay, she replied, with love and gladness eke I wis. Now ask me not what next occurred. Seek grace of God, and wist of this. Deem what thou wilt of us for love, by calumnies the sweeter is. Nor after this care I won yot, whether my foe be known or not. Then his affection increased, and love fires rose hotter in his heart, while she refused herself to him, saying, Thou canst not possess me. They ceased not to make love and enjoy their wine and vassal, whilst Ganim was drowned in the sea of love and longing. But she redoubled in coyness and cruelty till the night brought on the darkness and let fall on them the skirts of sleep. Thereupon Ganim rose and lit the lamps and wax candles and refreshed the room and removed the table. Then he took her feet and kissed them and finding them like fresh cream, pressed his face on them, and said to her, O oh, my lady, take pity on one thy love hath tan, and thine eyes hath slain, for indeed I were heart whole but for thy bane, and he wept somewhat. O oh, my lord, and light of my eyes, quoth she, by Allah, I love thee in very sooth, and I trust to thy truth, but I know that I may not be thine. And what is the obstacle? asked he, when she answered, To-night I will tell thee my tale, that thou mayst accept my excuse. Then she threw herself upon him, and winding her arms like a necklace about his neck, kissed him and caressed him, and promised him her favours and they ceased not playing and laughing till love got the firmest hold upon both in their hearts. And so it continued a whole month, both passing the night on a single carpet-bed, but whenever he would enjoy her she put him off, whilst mutual love increased upon them, and each could hardly abstain from other. One night as he lay by her side, and both were warm with wine, Ganim passed his hand over her breasts, and stroked them. Then he slipped it down to her waist as far as her navel. She awoke, and sitting up, put her hand to her trousers, and finding them fast tied, once more fell asleep. Presently he again felt her, and sliding his hand down to her trouser string, began pulling at it, whereupon she awoke and sat upright. Ganim also sat up by her side, and she asked him, What dost thou want? I want to lie with thee, he answered, and that we may deal openly and frankly with each other. Quoth she, I must now declare to thee my case, that thou mayst know my quality. Then will my secret be disclosed to thee, and my excuse become manifest to thee. Quoth he, So be it. Thereat she opened the skirt of a shift, and taking up her trouser string, said to him, O oh, my lord! read what is worked on the flat of this string. So he took it in hand, and saw these words broidered on it in gold. 
I am thine, and thou art mine, O cousin of the apostle. When he read this, he withdrew his hand and said to her, Tell me who thou art. So be it, answered she. Know that I am one of the concubines of the commander of the faithful, and my name is Kut al Kulub, the food of hearts. I was brought up in the palace, and when I grew to woman's estate, he looked on me, and noting what share of beauty and loveliness the Creator had given me, loved me with exceeding love, and assigned me a separate apartment, and gave me ten slave girls to wait on me and all these ornaments thou seest me wearing. On a certain day he set out for one of his provinces, and the lady Subaida came to one of the slave girls in my service, and said to her, I have something to require of thee. What is it, O my lady? asked she, and the caliph's wife answered, When thy mistress Kut al Kulub is asleep, Put this piece of bang into her nostrils, or drop it into her drink, and thou shalt have of me as much money as will satisfy thee. With love and gladness, replied the girl, and took the bang from her, being a glad woman because of the money, and because aforetime she had been one of Zubaydah's slaves. So she put the bang in my drink, and when it was night drank, and the drug had no sooner settled in my stomach, then I fell to the ground, my head touching my feet, and I knew not of life, but that I was in another world. When her device succeeded, she bade put me in this chest, and secretly brought in the slaves and the doorkeepers, and bribed them. And on the night when thou wast perched upon the date tree, she sent the blacks to do with me as thou sawest. So my delivery was at thy hands, and thou broughtest me to this house, and hast entreated me honourably, and with thy kindest. This is my story, and I wot not what is become of the caliph during my absence. Know then my condition, and divulge not my case. When Ghanim heard her words, and knew that she was a concubine of the caliph, he drew back, for Abe of the caliphate beset him and sat apart from her in one of the corners of the place, blaming himself and brooding over his affair, and patiencing his heart, bewildered for love, of one he could not possess. Then he wept for excess of longing, and plained him of fortune and her injuries, and the world and its enmities, and praise be to him who causeth generous hearts to be troubled with love, and the beloved, and who endoweth not the minds of the mean and miserly with so much of it as even a grain weight. So he began repeating, The lover's heart for his beloved must meet, sad pain and from a charm spare sore defeat. What is love's taste? they asked and answered I. Sweet is the taste, but ah, tis bitter sweet. Thereupon Kut al Kulub arose and took him to her bosom and kissed him for the love of him was firm fixed in her heart so that she disclosed to him her secret and all the affection she felt and throwing her arms round ganim's neck like a collar of pearls kissed him again and yet again but he held off from her in awe of the caliph then they talked together a long while and indeed both were drowned in the sea of their mutual love and as the day broke ganim rose and donned his clothes and going to the bazaar as was his wont took what the occasion required and returned home he found her weeping but when she saw him she checked herself and smiling through her tears said thou hast desolated me o beloved of my heart by allah this hour of absence hath been to me like a year. I have explained to thee my condition in the excess of my eager love for thee. So come now near me, and forget the past, and have thy will of me. But he interrupted her, crying, I seek refuge with Allah. This thing may never be. 
How shall the dog sit in the lion's stead? What is the Lord's is unlawful to the slave. So he withdrew from her and sat down on a corner of the mat. Her passion for him increased with his forbearance. So she seated herself by his side and caroused and played with him till the two were flushed with wine and she was mad for her own dishonour. Then she sang these verses. The lover's heart is like to break in twain till when these coy denials are ah, till when o thou who fliest me sans fault of mine gazelles are wont at times prove tame to men absence aversion distance and disdain how shall young lover all these ills sustain thereupon ganim wept and she wept at his weeping and they ceased not drinking till nightfall when he rose and spread two beds each in its place for whom is this second bed asked she and he answered her one is for me and the other is for thee from this night forth we must not sleep save thus for that which is the lord's is unlawful to the thrall oh my master cried she let us have done with this for all things come to pass by fate and fortune but he refused and the fire was lighted in her heart and as her longing waxed fiercer she clung to him and cried by allah we will not sleep save side by side allah forfend he replied and prevailed against her and lay apart till the morning when love and longing redoubled on her and distraction and eager thirst of passion they abode after this fashion three full told months which were long and longsome indeed and every time she made advance to him he would refuse himself and say whatever belongeth to the master is unlawful to the man now when time waxed tiresome and tedious to her and anguish and distress grew on her she burst out from her oppressed heart with these verses how long rare beauty wilt do wrong to me who was it bade thee not belong to me without a chance thou weddest inner grace comprising every point of piquancy passion thou hast infused in every heart from eyelids driven sleep by deputy erst was i wet the spray made thin of leaf o cassia spray unleaf thy sin i see the heart erst hunted i how is it i spy the hunter hunted fair my heart by thee wondrouser still i tell thee a eh, that i am trapped while never up to trap thou be never grant my prayer for if i grudge thyself to thee i grudge my me more jealously and cry so long as life belong to me rare beauty how how long this wrong to me they abode in this state a long time and fear kept ganim a loaf from her so far concerning these two but as regards the lady subaida when in the caliph's absence she had done this deed by kut al kulub she became perplexed saying to herself what shall i tell my cousin when he comes back and asks for her what possible answer can i make to him then she called an old woman who was about her and discovered her secret to her saying how shall i act seeing that kut al kulub died by such untimely death oh my lady quoth the old crone the time of the caliph's return is near so do thou send for a carpenter and bid him make thee a figure of wood in the form of a corpse we will dig a grave for it midmost the palace and there bury it then do thou build an oratory over it and set therein lighted candles and lamps and order each and every in the palace to be clad in black furthermore command thy handmaids and eunuchs as soon as they know of the caliph's returning from his journey to spread straw over the vestibule floors and when the commander of the faithful enters and asks what is the matter let them say kut al kulub is dead 
and may Allah abundantly compensate thee for the loss of her. And for the high esteem in which she was held of our mistress, she hath buried her in her own palace. When he hears this he will weep, and it shall be grievous to him. Then will he cause perfections of the Koran to be made for her, and he will watch by night at her tomb. Should he say to himself, Verily, Subaida, the daughter of my uncle, hath compassed her in jealousy the death of Kut al -Kulub. or if love-longing overcoming him, and he bid her be taken out of her tomb, fear thou not, for when they dig down and come to the image in human shape, he will see it shrouded in costly grave clothes, and if he wish to take off the winding sheet, that he may look upon her, do thou forbid him, or let some other forbid him, saying, The sight of her nakedness is unlawful. The fear of the world to come will restrain him, and he will believe that she is dead, and will restore the figure to its place, and thank thee for thy doings, and thus thou shalt escape. Please Almighty Allah from his slow of despond. When the lady Subaida heard her words, she commended the counsel and gave her a dress of honour and a large sum of money, ordering her to do all she had said. So the old woman set about the business forthright, and bade the carpenter make her the aforesaid image, and as soon as it was finished, she brought it to the lady Subaida, who shrouded it and buried it, and built a sepulchre over it wherein they lighted candles and lamps, and laid down carpets about the tomb. Moreover, she put on black, and she spread abroad in the harem that Kut al Kulub was dead. After a time the caliph returned from his journey, and went up to the palace, thinking only of Kut al Kulub. He saw all the pages and eunuchs and handmaids habited in black, at which his heart fluttered with extreme fear, and when he went in to the lady Subaida, he found her also garbed in black. So he asked the cause of this, and they gave him tidings of the death of Kut al Kulub, whereon he fell a swooning. As soon as he came to himself, he asked for her tomb, and the lady Subaida said to him, Know, O prince of the faithful, that for his special honour I have buried her in my own palace. Then he repaired in his travelling garb to the tomb, that he might wail over her, and found the carpet spread and the candles and lamps lighted. When he saw this, he thanked Subaida for her good deed, and abode perplexed, halting between belief and unbelief till at last suspicion overcame him, and he gave order to open the grave and take out the body. When he saw the shroud and would have removed it to look upon her, the fear of Allah Almighty restrained him. And the old woman, taking advantage of the delay, said, Restore her to her place. Then he sent at once for fakirs and Koran readers, and caused perfections to be made over her tomb, and sat by the side of the grave, weeping till he fainted, and he continued to frequent the tomb, and sit there for a whole month. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 8 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2 Read by Lars Rolander Section 9, Volume 2 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2, Section 9. When it was the forty-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the caliph ceased not to frequent the tomb for the period of a whole month, at the end of which time it so happened one day that he entered the seraglio after dismissing the emirs and wazirs, and lay down and slept a while, and there sat at his head a slave-girl fanning him, and at his feet a second rubbing and shampooing them. 
Presently he awoke, and, opening his eyes, shut them again, and heard the handmaid at his head saying to her who was at his feet, A nice business this, O Kaiseran, and the other answered her, Well, O Kazip Alban? Verily, said the first, our lord knoweth naught of what had happened, and sitteth waking and watching by a tomb wherein is only a log of wood carved by the carpenter's art. And Kut al Kulub, quoth the other, what hath befallen her? She replied, Knowing that the lady Zubeda sent a pellet of bung by one of the slave women who was bribed to drug her, and when sleep overpowered her, she let put her in a chest, and ordered Zawab and Kafur and Bukhait to throw her amongst the tombs. What dost thou say, O Kazip al Ban? asked Kaiseran. Is not the lady Kut or Kulub dead? Nay, by Allah, she answered, and long may her youth be saved from death. But I have heard the lady Zubeda say that she is in the house of a young merchant named Ganim bin Ayyub of Damascus, highs the distraught, the thrall of love, and she hath been with him these four months, whilst our lord is weeping and watching by night at a tomb wherein there is no corpse. They kept on talking this sort of talk, and the caliph gave ear to their words, and, by the time they had ceased speaking, he knew right well that the tomb was a feint and a fraud, and that Kuta Kulub had been in Ganim's house for four months. Whereupon he was angered with exceeding anger, and, rising up, he summoned the emirs of his state, and his wazir, Jafar the Barmaki, came also, and kissed the ground between his hands. The caliph said to him in fury, Go down, O Jafar, with a party of armed men, and ask for the house of Ghanim, son of Ayyub. Fall upon it, and spoil it, and bring him to me with my slave-girl, Kuta Kulub, for there is no help but that I punish him. To hear is to obey, said Jafar, and setting out with the governor and the guards and a world of people, repaired to Ghanim's house. Now, about that time, the youth happened to have brought back a pot of dressed meat, and was about to put forth his hand to eat of it, he and Kut al when the lady, happening to look out, saw calamity surrounding the house on every side, for the wazir and the governor, the night-guard and the mamelukes, with swords drawn, had girded as the white of the eye girded the black. At this she knew that tidings of her had reached the caliph, her lord, and she made sure of ruin and her colour paled, and her fair features changed, and her favour faded. Then she turned to Ghanim and said to him, O oh, my love, fly for thy life! What shall I do? asked he, and whither shall I go, seeing that my money and means of maintenance are all in this house? And she answered, Delay not, lest thou be slain and lose life as well as wealth. O oh, my loved one, and light of mine eyes, he cried, how shall I do to get away when they have surrounded the house? Quoth she, Fear not, and, stripping off his fine clothes, dressed him in ragged old garments, after which she took the pot, and, putting in it bits of broken bread and a saucer of meat, placed the whole in a basket, and setting it upon his head, said, Go out in this guise, and fear not for me, who wotted right well what thing is in my hand for the caliph. So he went out amongst them, bearing the basket with its contents, and the protector vouchsafed him his protection, and he escaped the snares and perils that beset him, by the blessing of his good conscience and pure conduct. Meanwhile Jafar dismounted, and entering the house saw Kuda Kulub, who dressed and decked herself in splendid raiments and ornaments, and filled a chest with gold and jewellery, and precious stones, and rarities, and what else was light to bear and of value rare. When she saw Jafar come in, she rose, and, kissing the ground before him, said, O oh, my lord, the reed hath written of old the reed which Allah decreed. By Allah, O oh, my lady, answered Jafar, he gave me an order to seize Ghanim, son of Ayyub. And she rejoined, O oh, my lord, he made ready his goods, and set out therewith for Damascus, and I know nothing more of him. But I desire thee to take charge of this chest, and deliver it to me in the harem of the prince of the faithful. Hearing and obedience, said Jafar, and bade his men bear it away to the headquarters of the caliphate, together with Kuta Kulub, commanding them to entreat her with honour as one in high esteem. They did his bidding after they had wrecked and plundered Ghanim's house. Then Jafar went in to the caliph and told him all that had happened, 
and he ordered Kut al Kulub to be lodged in a dark chamber, and appointed an old woman to serve her, feeling convinced that Ghanim had debauched her and slept with her. Then he wrote a mandate to the Emir Mohammed bin Suleiman al Zaini, his viceroy in Damascus, to this effect. The instant thou shalt receive this our letter, seize upon Ghanim bin Ayyub, and send him to us. When the missive came to the viceroy, he kissed it, and laid it on his head. Then he let proclaim in the bazaars, Whoso is desirous to plunder, away with him to the house of Ghanim son of Ayyub. So they flocked thither, and they found that Ghanim's mother and sister had built him a tomb in the midst of the house, and sat by it, weeping for him whereupon they seized the two without telling them the cause, and, after spoiling the house, carried them before the viceroy. He questioned them concerning Ghanim, and both replied, For a year or more we have had no news of him. So they restored them to their place. Thus far concerning them, but as regards Ghanim, when he saw his wealth spoiled and his ruin utterest, he wept over himself till his heart well nigh break. Then he fared on at random till the last of the day, and hunger grew hard on him, and walking wearied him. So, coming to a village, he entered a mosque, where he sat down upon a mat, and propped his back against the wall. But presently he sank to the ground in his extremity of famine and fatigue. There he lay till dawn, his heart fluttering for want of food, and, owing to his sweating, the lice coursed over his skin, his breath waxed fatted, and his whole condition was changed. When the villagers came to pray the dawn prayer, they found him prostrate, ailing, hunger lean, yet showing evident signs of former affluence. As soon as prayers were over, they drew near him, and, understanding that he was starved with hunger and cold, they gave him an old robe with ragged sleeves, and said to him, O oh, stranger, whence art thou, and what sickness is upon thee? He opened his eyes and wept, but returned no answer, whereupon one of them, who saw that he was starving, brought him a saucer of honey and two barley scones. He ate a little, and they sat with him till sunrise, when they went to their work. He abode with them, in this state, for a month, whilst sickness and weakliness grew upon him, and they wept for him, and, pitying his condition, took counsel with one another upon his case, and agreed to forward him to the hospital in Baghdad. Meanwhile, behold, two beggar-women, who were none other than Ghanim's mother and sister, came into the mosque, and, when he saw them, he gave them the bread that was at his head, and they slept by his side that night, but he knew them not. Next day the villagers brought a camel, and said to the camelier, Set this sick man on thy beast, and carry him to Baghdad, and put him down at the spital Dol. So haply he may be medicined, and be healed, and thou shalt have thy hire. To hear is to comply, said the man. So they brought Ghanim, who was asleep, out of the mosque, and set him, mat and all, on the camel, and his mother and sister came out among the crowd to gaze upon him, but they knew him not. However, after looking at him and considering him carefully, they said, Of a truth, he favours our Garnim, poor boy. Can this sick man be he? Presently he woke, and finding himself bound with robes on a camel's back, he began to weep and complain, and the village people saw his mother and sister weeping over him, albeit they knew him not. Then they fared forth for Baghdad, but the camel-man forewent them, and, setting Ghanim down at the spittle gate went away with his beast. The sick man lay there till dawn, and, when the folk began to go about the streets, they saw him and stood gazing on him, for he had become as thin as a toothpick, till the syndic of the bazaar came up and drove them away from him, saying, I will gain paradise through this poor creature, for, if they take him into the hospital, they will kill him in a single day. Then he made his young man carry him to his house, where they spread him a new bed with a new pillow, and he said to his wife, Tend him carefully. And she replied, Good, on my head be it. Thereupon she tucked up her sleeves, and warming some water, washed his hands, feet, and body, after which she clothed him in a robe belonging to one of her slave girls, and made him drink a cup of wine, and sprinkled rose water over him. So he revived and complained, and the thought of his beloved Kuta Kulub made his grief redouble thus far concerning him, but as regards Kut al-Kulub, when the caliph was angered against her. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 9 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2
Section 10, Volume 2 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2, Section 10. When it was the forty-third night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the caliph was angered against Kutta Kulub, he ordered her to a dark chamber where she abode eighty days, at the end of which the caliph, happening to pass on a certain day the place where she was, heard her repeating poetry, and after she ceased reciting her verse, saying, O oh, my darling, O oh, my Ghanim, how great is thy goodness, and how chaste is thy nature! Thou didst dwell by one who did ill by thee, and thou guardest his honour who guard thine. And his harem thou didst protect, who to enslave thee and shine did elect. But thou shalt surely stand, thou and the commander of the faithful, before the just judge, and thou shalt be justified of him on the day when the Lord, to whom be honour and glory, shall be Kazi, and the angels of heaven shall be witnesses. When the caliph heard her complaint, he knew that she had been wronged, and, returning to the palace, sent Masrur the eunuch for her. She came before him with bowed head, and eyes tearful and heart sorrowful, and he said to her, O oh, Kuta Kulub, I find thou accusest me of tyranny and oppression, and thou avouches that I have done ill by one who did well by me. Who is this who hath guarded my honour, while I guard his to become dishonour? Who protected my harim, and whose harim I wrecked? He is Ghanim, son of Ayyub, replied she, for he never approached me in wantonness or with lewd intent. I swear by thy munificence, O commander of the faithful. Then said the caliph, There is no majesty, and there is no might save in Allah. Ask what thou wilt of me, O Kutha Kulub. O prince of the faithful, answered she, I require of thee only my beloved Ghanim, son of Ayyub. He did as she desired, whereupon she said, O Lord of the Muslims, if I bring him to thy presence, wilt thou bestow me on him? And he replied, If he come into my presence, I will give thee to him as the gift of the generous who revoketh not his largesse. O Prince of true believers, quoth she, suffer me to go and seek him. Haply Allah may unite me with him. And quoth he, Do even as thou wilt. So she rejoiced, and, taking with her a thousand dinars in gold, went out and visited the elders of the various faiths, and gave alms in Ghanim's name. Next day she walked to the merchant's bazaar, and disclosed her object to the syndic, and gave him money, saying, Bestow this in charity to the stranger. On the following Friday she fared to the bazaar, with other thousand dinars, and, entering the goldsmith's and jeweller's market street, called the chief, and presented to him a thousand dinners, with these words, Bestow this in charity to the stranger. The chief looked at her, and he was the syndic who had taken in Ghanim, and said, O oh, my lady, wilt thou come to my house and look upon a youth, a stranger I have there, and see how goodly and graceful he is? Now the stranger was Ghanim son of Ayyub, but the chief had no knowledge of him, and thought him to be some wandering pauper, some debtor whose wealth had been taken from him, or some lover parted from his beloved. When she heard his words, her heart fluttered, and her vitals yearned, and she said to him, Send with me one who shall guide me to thy house. So he sent a little lad who brought her to the house, wherein was the headman's stranger guest, and she thanked him for this. When she reached the house, she went in and saluted the syndic's wife, who rose and kissed the ground between her hands, for she knew her. Then quoth Kut al Where is the sick man who is with thee? She wept and replied, Here is he, O my lady. By Allah, he is come of good folk, and he beareth the signs of gentle breeding. You see him lying on yonder bed. So she turned and looked at him, and she saw something like him, but he was worn and wasted till he had become lean as a toothpick, so his identity was doubtful to her, and she could not be certain that it was he. Yet pity for him possessed her, and she wept, saying, Verily, the stranger is unhappy, even though he be a prince in his own land. And his case was grievous to her, and her heart ached for him. 
yet she knew him not to be Ganim. Then she furnished him with wine and medicines, and she sat a while by his head, after which she mounted and returned to her palace, and continued to visit every bazaar in quest of her lover. Meanwhile, Ganim's mother and sister, Fitna, arrived at Baghdad, and met the syndic who carried them to Kut al and said to her, O princes of beneficent ladies, there came to our city this day a woman and her daughter, who are fair of favour, and signs of good breeding and dignity are apparent in them, though they be dressed in hair-cloth, and have each one a wallet hanging to her neck, and their eyes are tearful, and their hearts are sorrowful. So I have brought them to thee, that thou mayst give them refuge, and rescue them from beggary, for they are not of asker folk, and, if it please Allah, we shall enter paradise through them. By Allah, O my master, cried she, thou makest me long to see them. Where are they? Adding, here with them to me. So he bade the eunuch bring them in, and, when she looked on them, and saw that they were both of distinguished beauty, she wept for them, and said, By Allah, these are people of condition, and show plain signs of former opulence. O oh, my lady, said the syndic's wife, we love the poor and the destitute, more especially as reward in heaven will recompense our love, and as for these persons, haply the oppressor hath dealt hardly with them, and hath plundered their property and harried their houses. Then Ganim's mother and sister wept with sore weeping, remembering their former prosperity, and contrasting it with their present poverty and miserable condition, and their thoughts dwelt upon son and brother, whilst Kut al wept for their weeping, and they said, we beseech Allah to reunite us with him whom we desire, and he is none other but my son named Ganim bin Ayud. When Kut al heard this, she knew them to be the mother and sister of her lover, and wept till a swoon came over her. When she revived, she returned to them, and said, Have no fear and sorrow not, for this day is the first of your prosperity, and the last of your adversity. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the forty-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Kut al had consoled them, she bade the syndic lead them to his house, and let his wife carry them to the hammam, and dress them in handsome clothes, and take care of them, and honour them with all honour, and she gave him a sufficient sum of money. Next day she mounted, and, riding to his house, went in to his wife, who rose up, and kissed her hands, and thanked her for her kindness. There she saw Ganim's mother and sister, whom the snig's wife had taken to the hammam, and clothed it afresh, so that the traces of their former condition became manifest upon them. She sat talking with them a while, after which she asked the wife about the sick youth who was in her house, and she replied, "'He is in the same state.' Then said Kut al "'Come, let us go and visit him.' So she arose, she and the chief's wife and Ganim's mother and sister, and went into the room where he lay and sat down near him. Presently Ganim bin Ayyub, the distraught, the thrall love, heard them mention the name of Kut al whereupon life returned to him, emaciated and withered as he was, and he raised his head from the pillow and cried aloud, "'Oh, Kut al She looked at him and made certain it was he, and shrieked rather than said, "'Yes, O oh, my beloved!' draw near to me said he and she replied surely thou art ganim bin ayub and he rejoined i am indeed hereupon a swoon came upon her and as soon as ganim's mother and his sister fitna heard these words both cried out o oh, our joy and fainted clean away when they all recovered kut al exclaimed praise be to allah who hath brought us together again and who hath reunited thee with thy mother and thy sister and she related to him all that had befallen her with the caliph, and said, I have made known the truth to the commander of the faithful, who believed my words, and was pleased with thee, and now he desireth to see thee, adding, He hath given me to thee. Thereat he rejoiced with extreme joy, when she said, Quit not this place till I come back, and, rising forthwith, betook herself to the palace, there she opened the chest which she had brought from Ganim's house, and, taking out some of the dinars, gave them to the syndic, saying, Buy with this money for each of them four complete suits of the finest stuff and twenty kerchiefs, and else beside of whatsoever they require. 
after which she carried all three to the baths, and had them washed and bathed, and made ready for them consommés, and gallangil water, and cider, against their coming out. When they left the hammam, they put on the new clothes, and she abode with them three days, feeding them with chicken meats and bullies, and making them drink sherbet of sugar candy. After three days their spirits returned, and she carried them again to the baths, and when they came out and had changed their raiment, she led them back to the syndic's house and left them there, whilst she returned to the palace and craved permission to see the caliph. When he ordered her to come in, she entered, and, kissing the ground between his hands, told him the whole story, and how her lord, Ganim bin Ayyub, the distraught, the thrall of love, and his mother and sister were now in Baghdad. When the caliph heard this, he turned to the eunuchs and said, Here with Ganim to me. So Jaffar went to fetch him, but Kutakulub forewent him and told Ganim, The caliph had sent to fetch thee before him, and charged him to show readiness of tongue and firmness of heart and sweetness of speech. Then she robed him in a sumptuous dress and gave him dinners in plenty, saying, Be lavish of largesse to the caliph's household as thou goest in to him. Presently Jaffar, mounted on his Nubian mule, came to fetch him, and Ganim advanced to welcome the wazir, and, wishing him long life, kissed the ground before him. Now the star of his good fortune had risen and shone brightly, and Jafar took him, and they ceased not faring together, he and the minister, till they went in to the commander of the faithful. When he stood in the presence, he looked at the wazirs and emirs and chamberlains and viceroys and grandees and captains, and then at the caliph. Hereupon he sweetened his speech and his eloquence, and, bowing his head to the ground, broke out in these extempore couplets. May that monarch's life span a mighty span, whose lavish of largesse all imperian, leashes scan, none other but he shall be Kaiser Heis, lord of lordly hall and of hot divan. Kings lay their gems on his threshold dust, as they bow and salam to the mighty man, and his glances foil them and all recoil, bowing beards to ground and with faces wan, yet they gain the profit of royal grace, the rank and station of high earth's plain is scant for thy world of man, camp there in Kwan's empyrean. May the king of kings ever hold thee dear, be counsel shine and right steadfast plan, till thy justice spread o'er the widespread earth, and the near and the far be of equal worth. When he ended his improvisation, the caliph was pleased by it, and marvelled at the eloquence of his tongue and the sweetness of his speech. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section ten. Section eleven, volume two of the book of A Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2, Section 11. When it was the forty-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the caliph, after marvelling at his eloquence of tongue and sweetness of speech, said to him, Draw near to me. So he drew near, and quoth the king, Tell me thy tale, and declare to me thy case. So Ghanim sat down and related to him what had befallen him in Baghdad, of his sleeping in the tomb, and of his opening the chest after the three slaves had departed and informed him, in short, of everything that had happened to him from commencement to conclusion, none of which we will repeat for interest fails in twice-told tales. The caliph was convinced that he was a true man, so he invested him with a dress of honour, and placed him near himself in token of favour, and said to him, Acquit me of the responsibility I have incurred, and Ghanim did so, saying, O our lord the sultan, of a truth thy slave and all things his two hands own are his masters. The caliph was pleased at this, and gave orders to set apart a palace for him, 
and assigned to him pay and allowances, rations and donations, which amounted to something immense. So he removed thither with sister and mother, after which the caliph, hearing that his sister Fitna was in beauty a very Fitna, a mere seduction, demanded her in marriage of Ghanim, who replied, She is thy handmaid, as I am thy slave. The caliph thanked him, and gave him a hundred thousand dinars, then summoned the witnesses and the kazi, and on one and the same day they wrote out the two contracts of marriage between the caliph and fitna, and between Ganim bin Ayub and Kut al Kulub, and the two marriages were consummated on one and the same night. When it was morning, the caliph gave orders to record the history of what had befallen Ganim from first to last, and to deposit it in the royal muniment rooms, that those who came after him might read it and marvel at the dealings of destiny, and put their trust in him who created the night and the day. Yet, O auspicious king, this story to which thou hast designed give ears is on no wise no more wondrous than the tale of King Omar bin al-Numan, and his son Sharkan and Sau al-Makan, and what befell them on things seld seen and peregrine. The king asked her, And what was their story? And she answered, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that there was in the city of safety, Baghdad, before the caliphate of Abd al-Malik bin Marwan, a king Omar bin al-Nu'uman Hais, who was of the mighty giants, and had subjected to the Khosres of Persia and the Kaisers of eastern Rome. For none could warm himself at his fire, nor could any avail to meet him in the field of foray and fray. And when he was angered, there came forth from his nostrils sparks of flame. He had made himself king over all quarters, and Allah had subjected to him all his creatures. His word went forth to all great cities, and his hosts had harried the farthest land. East and west had come under his command, with whatsoever regions lay interspersed between them. Hind and Sind and Sin, the holy land, al hijaz the rich mountains of al yaman and the archipelagos of india and china moreover he reigned supreme over the north country and diyarbakr or mesopotamia and over sudan the eastern negroland and the islands of the ocean and all the far-famed rivers of the earth sihun and yahun nile and euphrates he sent envoys and ambassadors to capitals the most remote, to provide him with true report, and they would bring back tidings of justice and peace, with assurance of loyalty and obedience, and of prayers in the pulpits for King Omar bin al Nu'uman, For he was, O ruler of the age, a right noble king and there came to him presents of rarities and toll and tribute from all lands of his governing. This mighty monarch had a son, Islip Sharkan, who was likest of all men to his father, and who proved himself one of the prodigies of his time for subduing the brave and bringing his contemporaries to bane and ban. For this his father loved him with love so great none could be greater and made him heir to the kingdom after himself. The prince grew up till he reached man's estate, and was twenty years old, and Allah subjected his servants to him by reason of his great might and prowess in battle. Now his father, King Omar, had four wives legally married, but Allah had vouchsafed him no son by them, save Sharkan whom he had begotten upon one of them, and the rest were barren. Moreover, he had three hundred and sixty concubines, after the number of days in the Coptic year, who were of all nations. 
and he had furnished for each and every a private chamber within his own palace for he had built twelve pavilions after the number of the months each containing thirty private chambers which thus numbered three hundred and three score wherein he lodged his handmaids and he appointed according to law for each one her night when he lay with her and came not again to her for a full year and on this wise he abode for a length of time meanwhile his son sharkan was making himself renowned in all quarters of the world and his father was proud of him and his might waxed and grew mightier so that he passed all bounds and bore himself masterfully and took by storm castles and cities presently by decree of the decreer a handmaid among the handmaids of omar bin uman became pregnant and her pregnancy being announced to the harim the king was informed thereof whereupon he rejoiced with exceeding joy and said haply it will be a son and so all my offspring will be males then he documented the date of her conception and entreated her with all manner of kindness but when the tidings came to sharkan he was troubled and the matter seemed to him a sore one and a grievous and he said verily one cometh who shall dispute with me the sovereignty so quoth he to himself if this concubine bear a male child i will kill it but he kept that intention hidden in his heart such was the case with sharkan but what happened in the matter of the damsel was as follows she was a rumia a greek girl by name sophia or sophia whom the king of rome and lord of caesarea had sent to king omar as a present together with great store of gifts and of rarities she was the fairest of favour and loveliest of all his handmaids and the most regardful of her honour and she was gifted with a wit as penetrating as her presence was fascinating now she had served the king on the night of his sleeping with her saying to him o king i desire of the god of the heavens that he bless thee this night with a male child by me so i may bring him up with the best of rearing and enable him to reach man's estate perfect in intelligence good manners and prudent bearing a speech which much pleased the king during her pregnancy she was instant in prayer fervently supplicating the lord to bless her with a goodly male child and make his birth easy to her and allah heard her petition so after her months were accomplished she sat safely upon the birth-stool now the king had deputed a eunuch to let him know if the child she should bring forth were male or female and in like way his son sharkan had sent one to bring him tidings of the same in due time sophia was delivered of a child which the midwives examined and found to be a girl with a face sheenier than the moon so they announced this to all present in the room whereupon the king's messenger carried the news to him and sharkan's eunuch did the like with his master who rejoiced with exceeding joy but after the two had departed quoth sophia to the midwives wait with me a while for i feel as if there were still somewhat in my womb then she cried out and the pains of childbed again took her and allah made it easy to her and she gave birth to a second child the wise women looked at it and found it a boy like the full moon with forehead flower white and cheek ruddy bright with rosy light whereupon the mother rejoiced as did the eunuchs and attendants and all the company and sophia was delivered of the afterbirth whilst all in the palace sent forth a thrill of joy the rest of the concubines heard it and envied her lot and the tidings reached omar son of al numan who was glad and rejoiced at the excellent news 
Then he rose and went to her and kissed her head, after which he looked at the boy, and bending over him kissed him, whilst the damsels struck the tabours and played on instruments of music. And the king gave order that the boy should be named Sau al Makan, and his sister Nusat al Saman. They answered, Hearing and obedience, and did his bidding. So he appointed wet nurses and dry nurses, and eunuchs and attendants to serve them, and assigned them rations of sugar and diet drinks and unguents and else beside, beyond the power of tongue to rehearse. Moreover, the people of Baghdad, hearing that Allah had blessed their king with issue, decorated the city, and made proclamation of the glad tidings with drum and tom-tom. And the emirs and wazirs and high dignitaries came to the palace, and wished King Omar bin al-Nu'uman joy of his son, Sa'u al makam and of his daughter Nusat al-Saman. Wherefore he thanked them, and bestowed on them dresses of honour, and further favoured them with gifts, and dealt largest to all, gentle and simple, who were present. After this fashion he did for four days full told, and he lavished upon Sophia raiment and ornaments and great store of wealth, and every few days he would send a messenger to ask after her and the new boys. And when four years had gone by, he provided her with the wherewithal to rear the two children carefully, and educate them with the best of instructions. All this while his son Sharkan knew not that a male child had been born to his father, Omar, son of al-Numan, having news only that he had been blessed with the birth of Nusat al-Saman and they hid the intelligence from him until days and years had sped by whilst he was busied in battling with the brave and fighting single-handed against the knights one day as king omar was sitting in his palace his chamberlains came in to him and kissing the ground before him said o king there be come ambassadors from the king of rome lord of constantinople the great and they desire admission to thee and submission to thy decree if the king command us to introduce them we will so do and if not there is no disputing his behest he bade them enter and when they came in he turned to them and courteously receiving them asked them of their case and what was the cause of their coming they kissed the ground before him and said o king glorious and strong o lord of the arm that is long know that he who has dispatched us to thee is king afridun lord of iona island and the nazarene armies the sovereign who is firmly established in the embry of constantinople to acquaint thee that he is now waging fierce war and fell with a tyrant and a rebel the prince of caesarea and the cause of this war is as follows one of the kings of the arabs in past time during certain of his conquests chanced upon a horde of the time of alexander whence he removed wealth past compute and amongst other things three round jewels big as ostrich eggs from a mine of pure white gems whose like was never seen by man upon each was graven characters of ionian characters and they have many virtues and properties amongst the rest that if one of these jewels be hung round the neck of a new-born child no evil shall befall him and he shall neither wail nor shall fever ail him as long as the jewel remain without fail when the arab king laid hands upon them and learned their secrets he sent to king afridun presents of certain rarities and amongst them the three jewels aforementioned and he equipped for the mission two ships one bearing the treasure and the other men of might to guard it from any who might offer hindrance on the high seas albeit well assured that none would dare waylay his vessels 
for that he was king of the Arabs, and more by token that their course lay over waters subject to the king of Constantinople, and they were bound to his port. Nor were there on the shore of that sea any save the subjects of the great king Afridun. The two ships set out and voyaged till they drew near our city, when there sailed out on them certain corsairs from that country, and amongst them troops from the prince of Caesarea, who took all the treasures and rarities in the ships, together with the three jewels, and slew the crews. When our king heard of this, he sent an army against them, but they routed it. Then he marched a second and a stronger, but they put this also to flight, whereupon the king waxed wroth and swore that he would not go forth against them save in his own person at the head of his whole army, nor would he turn back from them till he had left Caesarea of Armenia in ruins, and had laid waste all the lands and cities over which her prince held sway. So he sent us to the lord of the age and the time, Sultan Umar bin al-Numan, king of Baghdad and of Khorasan, desiring that he aid us with an army. So may honour and glory accrue to him, and he hath also forwarded by us somewhat of various kinds of presents, and of the king's grace he beggeth their acceptance, and the friendly boon of furtherance. Then the ambassadors kissed the ground before him. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 11 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2 Read by Lars Rolander Section 12, Volume 2 of the Book of A Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Reading by Lars Rolander The Book of A Thousand Nights and a Night Volume 2, Section 12 When it was the forty-sixth night, she said, It has reached me, O auspicious king, that after the ambassadors and retinue from the Constantinopolitan king had kissed the ground before Omar, and had delivered their embassage, they brought out the presents, which were fifty damsels of the choicest from Grecia land and fifty mamelukers in tunics and brocade, belted with girdles of gold and silver, each wearing in his ears hoops of gold with pendants of fine pearls, costing a thousand ducats every one. The girls were adorned in like fashion, and were clad in stuffs worth a treasury of money. When the king saw them, he rejoiced in them, and accepted them. Then he bade the ambassadors to be honourably entreated, and, summoning his vaziers, took counsel with them of what he should do. Herewith rose up among them a vazir, an ancient man, Dandan Hais, who kissed the ground before Omar, and said, O king, there is nothing better to do in this matter than equip an army valiant and victorious, and set over it thy son Sharkan with us as his lieutenants, and this reed commendeth itself to me on two accounts. First, because the king of Rome hath invoked thine assistance, and has sent thee gifts which thou hast accepted, and secondly, because while no enemy dareth attack our country, thine army may go forth safely, and should it succour the king of Grecia land and defeat his foe, the glory will be thine. Moreover, the news of it will be noised abroad in all cities and countries, and especially 
when the tidings shall reach the islands of the ocean and the kings of mauritania shall hear it they will send thee offerings of rarities and pay thee tribute of money the king pleased by the vassar's words and approving his reed gave him a dress of honour and said to him of the like of thee should kings ask counsel and it seems fit that thou shouldst conduct the van of our army and our son sharkan command the main battle then he sent for his son who came and kissed ground before him and sat down and he expounded to him the matter telling him what the ambassadors and the wazir dandan had said and he charged him to take arms and equip himself for the campaign enjoining him not to gainsay dandan in aught he should do moreover he ordered him to pick out of his army ten thousand horsemen armed cap a pie and inured to onset a stress of war accordingly sharkan arose on the instant and chose out a myriad of horsemen after which he entered his palace and mustered his host and distributed largest to them saying ye have delay of three days they kissed the earth before him in obedience to his commands and began at once to lay in munitions and provide provisions for the occasion whilst sharkan repaired to the armories and took therefrom whatsoever he required of arms and armour and thence to the stable where he chose horses of choice blood and others when the appointed three days were ended the army drew out of the suburbs of baghdad city and king omar came forth to take leave of his son who kissed the ground before him and received from the king seven parcels of money and then he turned to dandan and commended to his care the army of his son and the wazir kissed the ground before him and answered i hear and i obey and lastly he charged sharkan that he should consult the wazir on all occasions which he promised to do after this the king returned to his city and sharkan ordered the officers to muster their troops in battle array so they mustered them and their numbers was ten thousand horsemen besides footmen and camp followers then they loaded their baggage on their beasts and the war drums beat and the trumpets blared and the bannerals and standards were unfurled whilst sharkan mounted horse with the wazir dandan by his side and the colours fluttering over their heads so the horse fared forth and stinted not faring with the ambassadors preceding them till day departed and night drew nigh when they alighted and encamped for the night and as soon as allah caused the morn to-morrow they mounted and tried on guided by the ambassadors for a space of twenty days and by the night of the twenty-first they came to a fine and spacious wady well grown with trees and shrubbery here sharkan ordered them to alight and commanded a three days halt so they dismounted and pitched their tents spreading their camp over the right and the left slopes of the extensive valley whilst the wazir dandan and the ambassadors of king afridun pitched in the soul of the wady as for sharkan he tarried behind them for a while till all had dismounted and he had dispersed themselves over the valley sides he then slacked the reins of his steed being minded to explore the wady and to mount guard in his own person because of his father's charge and owing to the fact that they were on the frontier of grecia land and in the enemy's country so he rode out alone after ordering his armed slaves and his bodyguard to camp near the wazir dandan and he fared on along the side of the valley till a fourth part of the night was passed when he felt tired and drowsiness overcame him so that he could no longer urge horse with heel now he was accustomed to take rest on horseback 
so when slumber overpowered him he slept and the steed ceased not going on with him till half the night was spent and entered one of the thickets which was dense with growth but sharkan awoke not until the, his horse stumbled over wooded ground then he started from sleep and found himself among the trees and the moon arose and shone brightly over the two horizons eastern and western he was startled when he found himself alone in this place and said the say which never yet shamed its sayer. There is no majesty, and there is no might save in Allah, the glorious, the great. But as he rode on in fear of wild beasts, behold, the moon spread her glade light over a meadow, as if it were on the meads of paradise. And he heard pleasant voices, and a loud noise of talk and laughter, captivating the senses of men. So King Sharkan alighted, and, tying his steed to one of the trees, went over a little way till he came upon a stream, and heard a woman talking in Arabic, and saying, Now, by the crush of the Messiah, this is not well of you. But whoso utters a word, I will throw her and truss her up with her own girdle. He kept walking in the direction of the sound, and when he reached the further side, he looked, and behold, a stream was gushing and flowing, and antelopes at large were frisking and roving, and wild cattle amid the pasture moving, and birds expressed joy and gladness in their diverse tongues, and that place was perfled with all manner flowers and green herbs, even as a poet described it in these couplets most beautiful is earth in budding bloom when lucid waters course through plain and wood no work but his the all-great the all-glorious giver of all gifts giver of all good and as sharkan considered the place he saw in it a christian monastery within whose enceinte a castle towered high in the air catching the light of the moon through the midst of the convent passed a stream the water flowing amongst its gardens and upon the bank sat the woman whose voice he had heard while before her stood ten handmaids like moons and wearing various sort of raiment and ornaments that dazed and dazzled their beholder high bosomed virgins as saith of them the poet in these couplets the mead is bright with what is on't o merry maidens debonair double its beauty and its grace those drooping damsels slender fair virgins of graceful swimming gait ready with eye and lip to ensnare and like the tendrils vine they lose the rich profusion of their hair shooting their shafts and arrows from beautiful eyes beyond compare overpowering and transpiercing every froward adversaire sharkan gazed upon the ten girls and saw in their midst a lady like the moon at fullest with ringleted hair and forehead sheeny white and eyes wondrous wide and black and bright and temple locks like the scorpion's tail and she was perfect in essence and attributes as the poet said of her in these couplets she beamed on my sight with a wondrous glance and her straight slender stature and shamed the lance she burst on my sight with cheeks rosy red where all manner of beauties have habitants and the locks on her forehead were lowering as night, whence issues a dawn-tide of happiest chance. Then Sharkan heard her say to the handmaids, Come ye on, that I may wrestle with you, and gravel you, ere the moon set and the dawn break. So each came up to her in turn, and she grounded them forthright, and pinioned them with their girdles 
and ceased not wrestling and pitching them until she had overthrown one and all. Then there turned to her an old woman who was before her, and the beldam said as in wrath, O oh, strumpet, cost thou glory in grounding these girls? Behold, I am an old woman, yet I have thrown them forty times. So what hast thou to boast of? But if thou have the strength to wrestle with me, stand up, that I may grip thee and set thy head between thy heels. The young lady smiled at her words, but she was filled with an inward wrath and she jumped up and asked, O oh, my lady, Sat al Dawahi, by the truth of the Messiah, wilt thou wrestle with me in very deed, or dost thou jest with me? And she answered, Yeah. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 12 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2 Read by Lars Rolander Section 13, Volume 2 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2, Section 13 When it was the forty-seventh night, she said, It has reached me, O auspicious king, that when the young lady asked Satal Dawahi, by the truth of the Messiah, wilt wrestle with me, or dost jest? And she answered, Yea, I will wrestle with thee in very deed. Sharkan, looking on the while, the damsel cried, Rise up for the fall, and thou have spunk so to do. When the old woman heard this, she raged with exceeding rage, and her body hair stood on end like the bristles of a fretful hedgehog. Then she sprang to her feet, whilst the damsel stood up to her and said, Now, by the truth of the Messiah, I will not wrestle with thee unless I be naked, Mistress Whore. So she loosed her petticoat trousers, and putting her hand under her clothes, tore them off her body, then twisted up a silken kerchief into cord shape, girt it round her middle, and became as she were a scald head if Rita or a spotted snake. With this she inclined towards the damsel and said, Do thou as I have done. All this time Sharkan was gazing at the twain, and laughing at the beldam's loathly semblance. So the damsel leisurely rose, and, taking a sash of Yamani stuff, passed it twice round her waist. Then she tucked up her trousers and displayed two cowls of alabaster, carrying a moon of crystal, smooth and rounded, and a stomach which exhaled musk from its dimples, as it were a bed of Numan's anemones, and breasts like double pomegranates. Then the old woman leant towards her, and the two laid hold either of each while Charkan raised his head heavenwards and prayed Allah that the bell might beat the beldam. Presently the young woman get beneath the old woman, and gripping her waist cloth with the left and circling her neck with the right hand, hoisted her off the ground with both, whereupon the old woman strove to free herself, and in so doing fell on her back arsi versi with her legs high in air and her hairy bush between them showed manifest in the moonshine. Furthermore she let fly two great farts, one of which blew up the dust from the earth's face and the other steamed up to the gate of heaven. Sharkan laughed till he fell back upon the ground. Then he arose and, bearing his brand, looked right and left. But he saw no one save the old woman sprawling on her back and said to himself, he lied not who named thee Lady of Calamities. 
Verily thou knewest her prowess by her performance upon the others. So he drew near them to hear what should pass between them. Then the young lady went up to the old one, and throwing a wrapper of thin silk upon her nakedness, helped her to don her clothes and made excuses, saying, O oh, my lady, Sat al Dawai, I intended only to throw thee and not all this, but thou triedst to twist out of my hands, so laud to Allah for safety. She returned her no answer, but rose in her shame and walked away till out of sight, leaving the handmaids prostrate and pinioned, with the fair damsel standing amongst them. Quoth Sharkan to himself, Every luck has its cause. Sleep did not fall upon me, nor the war-horse bear me hither, save for my good fortune. For doubtless this maid, and what is with her, shall become booty to me. So he made towards his steed, and mounted and healed him on. When he sped as the shaft speeds from the bow, and in his hand he still held his brand bear of sheath, which he brandished, shouting the while his war-cry, Allah is almighty! When the damsel saw him, she sprang to her feet, and taking firm stand on the bank of the stream, whose breadth was six ells, the normal cubits made one bound and landed clear on the farther side, where she turned and cried out with a loud voice, who art thou, O thou fellow, that breakst in upon our privacy and pastime, and that to hanger in hand as if charging a host? Whence camest thou, and whither art thou going? Speak sooth, for truth will stand thee in good stead, and lie not, for lies come of villain breed. Doubtless thou hast wandered this night from thy way that thou chancest upon this place, whence escape were the greatest of mercies. For thou art now in an open plain, and did we shout but a single shout, would come to our rescue four thousand knights. So tell me what thou wantest, and if thou wouldst only have us set thee on the right road, we will do so. When Sharkan heard her words, he replied, I am a stranger of the Moslems, who fared forth this night single-handed, seeking for spoil. Nor could this moonlight show me a fairer booty than these ten maidens, so I shall seize them and rejoin my comrades with them. Quoth she, I would have thee know that as for the booty thou hast not come at it, and as for the handmaids, by Allah they shall never be thy spoil. Have I not told thee that to lie is villain vile? Quoth he, The wise man is he who takes warning by others. Thereupon quoth she, By the truth of the Messiah, did I not fear that thy death would be on my hands, I would shout a shout, should fill the mead for thee with war steeds and with men of might. But I take pity upon the stranger. So, if thou seek booty, I require of thee that thou alight from thy steed, and swear to me, by thy faith, that thou wilt not advance against me aught like arms in hand, and we will wrestle, I and thou. If thou throw me, set me on thy steed, and take all of us to thy booty, but if I throw thee, thou shalt become under my command." Swear this to me, for I fear thy treachery. Indeed it has become a common saw. Where perfidy is innate, their trust is a weakly mate. Now, and thou wilt swear, I will return and draw near to thee and tackle thee. Answered Sharkan, and indeed he lusted to seize her, and said in his soul, Truly she knoweth not that I am a champion of champions. Swear me by what oath thou wilt, and by what thou deemst most binding, and I will not approach thee with aught till thou hast made thy preparation, and saidst, Draw near that I wrestle with thee. If thou throw me, I have money wherewithal to ransom myself, and if I throw thee, will be booty and booty enough for me rejoined the damsel 
I am content herewith. And Sharkan was astounded at her words and said, And by the truth of the Apostle, whom Allah bless and keep, I too am content on the other part. Then said she, Swear to me by him whose sprite in body died, and dealt laws to rule mankind aright, that thou wilt not offer me aught of violence save by way of wrestling, else mayst thou die without the pale of al-Islam. Sharkan replied, By Allah, were a Qasi to swear me, even though he were a Qasi of the Qasis, he would not impose upon me such an oath as this. Then he sware to her by all she named, and tied his steed to a tree. But he was drowned in the sea of thought, saying in himself, Praise be to him who fashioned her from dirty water. Then he girt himself, and made ready for wrestling, and said to her, Cross the stream to me. But she replied, It is not for me to come over to thee. If thou wilt pass thou over here to me. I cannot do that, quoth he. And quoth she, O oh boy, I will come across to thee. So she tucked up her skirts, and leaping, landed on the other side of the stream by his side, whereupon he drew near to her, and bent him forwards, and clapped palms. But he was confounded by her beauty and loveliness, for he saw a shape which the hand of power had tanned with the dye leaves of the jan, which had been fostered by the hand of beneficence, and fanned by the seafers of fair fortune, and whose birth a propitious ascendant had greeted. Then she called out to him, O Moslem, come on and let us wrestle ere the break of morning, and tucked up her sleeves from a forearm like fresh curd, which illumined the whole place with its whiteness, and Sharkan was dazzled by it. Then he bent forwards and clapped his palms by way of challenge, she doing the like, and caught hold of her, and the two grappled and gripped and interlocked hands and arms. Presently he shifted his hands to her slender waist, when his fingertips sank into the soft folds of her middle, breeding languishment, and he fell a-trembling like a Persian reed in the roaring gale. So she lifted him up, and, throwing him to the ground, sat upon his breast with hips and hinder cheeks like moans of sand for his soul had lost mastery over his senses. Then she asked him, O Moslem, the slaying of Nazarenes is lawful to your folk. What then hast thou to say about being slain thyself? And he answered, O my lady, thy speech as regards slaying me is not other than unlawful, for our prophet Mohammed, whom Allah bless and preserve, prohibited the slaying of women and children, old men and monks. As it was thus revealed to your prophet, she replied, it behoveth us to render the equivalent of his mercy. So rise, I give thee thy life, for generosity is never lost upon the generous. Then she got off his breast, and he rose and stood shaking the dust from his head against the owners of the curved rib. Even women... And she said to him, Be not ashamed, but verily one who entereth the land of Rome in quest of booty, and comes to assist kings against kings, how happens it that he has not strength enough to defend himself from one made out of the curved rib? It was not for lack of strength in me, he answered, nor didst thou throw me by thy force. It was thy loveliness overthrew me. So, if thou wilt grant me another bout, it will be of thy courtesy. She laughed and said, I grant thee thy request. But these handmaids have long been pinioned, and their arms and sides are weary, and it were only right I should lose them, for haply this next wrestling boat will be long. Then she went to the slave-girls, and, unbinding them, said to them in the tongue of Greece, 
Get ye to some safe place till I foil this Muslim's lust and longing for you. So they went away, whilst Sharkan kept gazing at them, and they kept turning to look at the two. Then each approached the adversary, and he set his breast against hers, but when he felt waist touch waist, his strength failed him, and she, waxing ware of this, lifted him with her hands swiftier than the blinding leaven flash, and threw him to the ground. He fell on his back, and then she said to him, Rise, I give thy thy life a second time. I spared thee in the first count because of thy prophet, for that he made unlawful the slaying of women, and I do so on the second count because of thy weakliness and the greenness of thine years and thy strangerhood. But I charge thee, if there be in the Muslim army sent by Omar bin al-Numan to succour the king of Constantinople, a stronger than thou, send him hither and tell him of me. For in wrestling there are shifts and trips catches and holds, such as the feint or falsing and the snap of first grip, the hug, the feet catch, the thigh light, the jostle and the leg lock. By Allah, O oh my lady, quoth Sharkan, and indeed he was highly incensed against her. Had I been Master al-Safti, Master Mohammed Kimal, or Ibn al-Sadi, as they were in their prime, I had kept no note of these shifts thou mentionest. For, O oh, my mistress, by Allah thou hast not grasped me by thy strength, but by blandishments of thy back parts. For we men of Mesopotamia so love a full-formed thigh, that nor sense was left me, nor foresight. But now, and thou wish... Thou shalt try a third fall with me, while my wits are about me, and this last match is allowed me by the laws of the game, which says, The best of three. Moreover, I have regained my presence of mind. When she heard his words, she said to him, Hast thou not had a belly full of this wrestling, O vanquished one? However, come on! and thou wilt but know that this must be the last round then she bent forward and challenged him and sharkan did likewise setting to it in real earnest and being right cautious about the throw so the two strove a while and the damsel found in him a strength such as he had not observed before and said to him o moslem thou art now on thy mettle yes he replied thou knowest that there remains to me but this one round after which each of us will wend a different way she laughed and he laughed too then she overreached at his thigh and caught firm hold of it unawares which made him greet the ground and fall full on his back she laughed at him and said art thou an eater of bran Thou art like a Badavi's bonnet, which falls off with every touch, or else the father of winds that drops before a puff of air. Fie upon thee, O thou poor thing! Adding, Get thee back to the Moslem army, and send us other than thyself, for thou fairest of Thus, and proclaim for us among the Arabs and Persians, the Turks, and Dalamites. Whoso has might in him, let him come to us. Then she made a spring and landed on the other side of the stream, and said to Sharkan, laughing, Parting with thee is right grievous to me, O my lord. But get thee to thy mates before dawn, lest the knights come upon thee and pick thee up on their lance points. Thou hast no strength to defend thee against a woman, so how couldst thou hold thine own amongst men of might and knights? Sharkan was confounded and called to her as she turned from him, making towards the convent. O oh, my lady, wilt thou go away and leave the miserable stranger? 
the broken-hearted slave of love? So she turned to him, laughing, and said, What is thy want? I will grant thee thy prayer. Have I set foot in thy country, and tasted the sweetness of thy courtesy? replied he. And shall I return without eating of thy victual, and tasting thy hospitality? I who have become one of thy servitors? None balk kindliness save the base, she rejoined. Honour us in Allah's name. On my head and eyes be it. Mount thy steed and ride along the brink of the stream over against me, for now thou art my guest. At this Sharkan was glad, and, hastening back to his horse, mounted and walked him abreast of her, and she kept faring on till they came to a drawbridge, built of beams of the white poplar, hung by pulleys and steel chains, and made fast with hooks and padlocks. When Sharkan looked, he saw awaiting her upon the bridge the same ten handmaids whom she had thrown in the wrestling boats. And as she came up to them, she said to one in the Greek tongue, Arise, and take the reins of his horse, and conduct him across into the convent. So she went up to Sharkan, and led him over, much puzzled and perturbed with what he saw, and saying to himself, Oh, would that the vassir Dandan were here with me, that his eyes might look upon these fairest of favours. Then he turned to the young lady and said to her, O oh, marvel of loveliness, now I have two claims upon thee, first the claim of good fellowship, and secondly for that thou hast carried me to thy home and offered me thy hospitality. I am now under thy commandance and thy guidance so do me one last favour by accompanying me to the lands of al-islam where thou shalt look upon many a lion-hearted warrior and thou shalt learn who i am when she heard this she was angered and said to him by the truth of the messiah thou hast proved thyself with me a man of keen wit but now I see what mischief therein in thy heart, and how thou canst permit thyself a speech which proves thy traitorous intent. How should I do as thou sayest, when I wot that if I came to that king of yours, Omar bin al nuuman I should never get free from him? For truly he hath not the like of me, or behind his city walls, or within his palace halls, lord of baghdad and of khorasan though he be who has built for himself twelve pavilions in number as the months of the year and in each a concubine after the number of the days and if i come to him he would not prove shy of me for your folk believe i am lawful to have and hold as is said in your writ or those women whom your right hand shall possess as slaves. So how canst thou speak thus to me? As for thy saying, thou shalt look upon the braves of the Moslems. By the truth of the Messiah, thou sayest that which is not true. For I saw your army when it reached our land these two days ago, and I did not see that your ordinance was the ordinance of kings but i beheld only a rabble of tribesmen gathered together and as to thy words thou shalt know who i am i did not do thee kindness because of thy dignity but out of pride in myself and the like of thee should not talk thus to the like of me even wert thou sharkan omar bin al nuuman's son the prowess name in these days knowest thou sharkan asked he and she answered yes and i know of his coming with an army numbering ten thousand horsemen also that he was sent by his sire with his force to gain prevalence for the king of constantinople o oh, my lady said sharkan i adjure thee by the religion 
tell me the cause of all this, that sooth may appear to me clear of untruth, and with whom the fault lies. Now, by the virtue of thy faith, she replied, did I not fear lest the news of me be bruited abroad, that I am of the daughters of Rome? I would adventure myself, and sally forth single-handed against the ten thousand horsemen, and slay their leader, the Vasir Dandan, and vanquish their champion Sharkan. Nor would aught of shame accrue to me thereby, for I have read books and studied the rules of good breeding in the language of the Arabs. But I have no need to vaunt my own prowess to thee, more by token as thou hast proved in thy proper person my skill and strength in wrestling, and thou hast learnt my superiority over other women. Nor indeed had Sharkan himself been here this night, and it were said to him, Clear this stream, could he have done it, and I only long and lust that the Messiah would throw him into my hands in this very convent, that I might go forth to him in the habit of a man, and drag him from his saddle-seat, and make him my captive, and lay him in bilbos. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 13 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2 Read by Lars Rolander Section 14, Volume 2 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2, Section 14 when it was the forty-eighth night. She said, It has reached me, O auspicious king, that when the Nazarene damsel said to Sharkan, and he listening impatiently now, Verily, if Sharkan fell into my hands, I would go forth to him in the habit of a man, and drag him from his saddle-seat, and make him my captive, and lay him in bilbos. Pride and passion and nightly jealousy took possession of him, and he desired to discover and declare himself, and to lay on load. But her loveliness restrained him, and he began repeating, And faulty of one fault the beauty prove, her charms a thousand advocates shall move. So she went up, and Sharkan after her, and when he saw the maiden's back and hinder cheeks, that clashed against each other, like rollers in the rolling sea, he extemporized these couplets. For her sins in a pleader that bro, and all hearts his fair pleading must bow. When I saw it, I cried, To-night, the moon at its fullest doth show. Thou bulk his own ifrit try about, spite his force she would deal him a throw. The two fared on till they reached a gate over which rose a marble archway. This she opened and ushered Sharkan into a long vestibule, vaulted with ten connected arches, from each of which hung a crystal lamp, glistening like a spark of fire. The handmaids met her at the further end, bearing wax candles of goodly perfume, and wearing on their heads golden fillets, crusted with all manner bezel gems and went on before her, Sharkan still following, till they reached the inner convent. There the Moslems saw couches and sofas ranged all around, one opposite the other, and all overhung with curtains flowered in gold. The monastery floor was paved with every kind of vari-coloured marvels and mosaic work, and in the midst stood a basin that held forth, and twenty jetting fountains of gold, whence the water ran like molten silver, 
whilst at the upper end stood a throne spread with silks, fit only for kings. Then said the damsel, Ascend, O my lord, this throne. So he went up to it and sat down, and she withdrew to remain absent for some time. Sharkan asked of her from one of the servants who answered him, She has gone to her dormitory, but we will serve thee even as she ordered. So they set before him viands of rare varieties, and he ate his sufficiency, when they brought him a basin of gold and an ewer of silver, and he washed his hands. Then his thoughts reverted to his army, knowing not what had befallen it, in his absence, and calling to mind also how he had forgotten his father's injunctions, so he was troubled about his case, repenting of what he had done till the dawn broke and the day appeared, when he lamented and sighed, and became drowned in a sea of sadness, and repeated, I am not lost to prudence, but indeed, here I am bewildered what shall be my reed. Would any aid me in mine ails of love? By my own might and slate would I be freed. But, ah, my heart is lost and passion shent. To none save Allah can I trust my need. When he ended his verse, behold, there came up to him a rare show, and a fair more than twenty maidens, like crescents, encompassing the young lady, who shone in their midst as the full moon among the constellations guarding and girding her. She was clad in brocades befitting kings. Her breasts were like twin pomegranates, a woven sewn set with all kinds of jewels tightly clasped her waist which expanded below into jutting hips and her hinder cheeks stood out as a mound of crystal supporting a silvern shaft when sharkan looked at her his wits went nigh to fly away from him with delight and he forgot army and vassir as he gazed on her fair head decked and dyed with a network of pearls set off by diverse sorts of gems Handmaids on her right and handmaids on her left bore her train, as she paced with dainty graceful gait in all the pride of seemlyhead. He sprang to his feet, seeing such beauty and loveliness, and cried aloud, Beware, and beware of that zone rarely fair, and broke out into these couplets. With heavy back parts, high breasts delicate, and lissom form that sways with swimming gait she deftly hides love longing in her breast but i may never hide its ban and bait while hosts and followers her steps precede like pearls now necklaced and now separate she gazed upon him for a long time and considered him till she was assured of him when she came up to him and said in very sooth the place is honoured and illumined by thee, O Sharkan. How sped thy night, O hero, after we went away and left thee? Adding, verily lying is a vile thing, and a shameful, especially in great kings. And thou art crowned Prince Sharkan, son and heir of King Omar bin al-Nu'uman. So henceforth make no secret of thy rank and condition nor let me hear aught from thee but the truth, for leasing bequeatheth hate and despite. And as thou art pierced by the shaft of fate, be resignation thine, and abide content to wait. When he heard her words, he saw that artifice availed him not, and he acknowledged the truth, saying, I am Sharkan bin Omar al Nu'uman whom fortune has afflicted and cast into this place. So whatso thou willst, do it in my case. She hung her head groundwards a long while, then turned to him and said, Be of good cheer, and let thine eyes be cool and clear, for thou art the guest of my hospitality, and bread and salt hast made a tie between me and thee, wherefore thou art in my ward, and under my safeguard. Have no fear, for, 
by the truth of the Messiah, if all on earth sought to do thee hurt, they should not come at thee, till life had left my body for thy sake indeed thou art now under the charge of the messiah and of me hereat she sat her down by his side and fell to playing with him till his alarm subsided and he knew that had she desired to slay him she would have done so during the past night presently she bespoke in the grecian tongue one of her slave girls who went away and soon came back bringing a beaker and a tray of food but Sharkan abstained from eating and said to himself, Haply she hath put somewhat in this meat. She knew what was in his thought, so she turned to him and said, By the truth of the Messiah, the case is not on such wise, nor is there aught in this meat of what thou suspectest. Had my mind been set on slaying thee, I had slain thee ere now. Then she walked up to the tray, and ate of every dish a mouthful, whereupon Sharkan came forward and ate too. She was pleased at this, and both ate till they were satisfied. They washed their hands, and after that she rose and ordered a handmaid to bring perfumes and herbs of sweet savour, wines of all colours and kinds, and a wine service with vessels of gold silver and crystal she filled a first goblet and drank it off before offering it to him even as she had done with the food then she crowned a second and handed it to him he drank and she said to him o moslem see how thou art here in all solace and delight of life and she ceased not to drink and ply him with drink till he took leave of his wits and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say end of section fourteen of the book of a thousand nights and a night volume two read by lars rolander Section 15, Volume 2 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night. Translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night. Volume 2. Section 15 When it was the forty-ninth night, she said, It has reached me, O auspicious king, that the damsel ceased not to drink and ply Sharkan with drink, till he took leave of his wits, for the wine and the intoxication of love he bore her. Presently she said to the slave girl, O Marjana, bring us some instruments of music to hear is to obey said the handmaid and going out returned in the twinkling of an eye with a damascus lute a persian harp a tartar pipe and an egyptian dulcimer the young lady took the lute and after tuning each several string began in gentle undersong to sing softer than zephyr's wing and sweeter than tasmin spring with heart safe and secure from everything the couplets following allah assain those ein what streams of blood they shed how many an arrow glance those lids of thine have sped i love all lovers who to lovers show them cure twere wrong to rue the love in wrong head born and bred haply fall hapless i for thee no sleeping kens heaven help the hapless heart by force of thee misled thou doomst me to death who art my king and i ransom with life the deemster who would doom me dead 
Thereupon each and every of the maidens rose up and, taking an instrument, played and recited couplets in the roomy tongue. Then their mistress sang also, and seeing Sharkan in ecstasies, asked him, O Moslem, dost thou understand what I say? And he answered, Nay, my ecstasy comes from the beauty of thy finger sips. She laughed and continued, if I sing to thee in Arabic, what wouldst thou do? I should no longer, quoth he, be master of my senses. Then she took an instrument, and changing the measure, began singing these verses. The smack of parting smear to me, how then bear patience alwe? I'm girl by ills in trinity, severance distance cruelty my freedom stole that fairest she and partaking irks me bitterly when she ended her verse she looked at sharkan and found him lost to existence and he lay for a while stretched at full length and prone among the maidens then he revived and remembering the songs again inclined to mirth and merriment, and the twain returned to their wine and vassal, and continued their playing and toying, their pastime and pleasure till day ceased, illuminating, and night drooped her wing. Then the damsel went off to her dormitory, and when Sharkan asked after her, they answered, She is gone to her sleeping chamber, whereto he rejoined, under Allah's ward and his good guard. As soon as it was morning, a handmaid came to him and said to him, My mistress biddeth thee to her. So he rose and followed her, and, as he drew near her lodging, the damsel welcomed him with smitten tabrets and songs of greeting, and led him through a great door of ivory, studded with pearls and jewels. Thence they passed with him into a tall and spacious hall, at the upper end of which was a wide dais carpeted with all kinds of silks, and round it open lattices commanding a view of trees and streams. About the saloon were figures carved in human form, and fashioned on such wise that the air passed through them, and set in motion musical instruments within so that the beholder would fancy they spoke. Here sat the young lady, looking at the figures, but when she saw Sharkan, she sprang to her feet, and, taking him by the hand, made him sit down by her side, and asked him how he had passed the night. He blessed her, and the two sat talking a while till she asked him, Knowst thou aught touching lovers and slaves of love? And he answered, Yes, I wot somewhat in verse on that matter. Let me hear it, quoth she, so he began quoting. Pleasure and health, good cheer, good appetite, to Asa freest with our name and fame. By Allah would I near her, off she flies. A tangent granting, less the more I claim, I dot on Asa, but when clear I off, my rivals clears me too, that dearest dame, like wandering wight that chews for shade a cloud, which ere siesta done, thin air became. When she heard this, she said, Verily al Kutair was conspicuous for sweet speech and chaste, and he was superlative in his praise of Asa when he sang. And she began to recite. Did Asa deal behest to son Unun? The judge had judged her beauty's bestest boon, and girls who come to me and carp at her, God make their rosy cheeks her sandal shoon. And indeed, quoth she, it was said that Asa boasted exceeding beauty and loveliness. Then she asked Sharkan, saying, O prince, cost thou know aught of Jamil's verses 
of Butaina. If so, repeat to us somewhat of them. And he answered, Yes, I know them better than any. Whereupon he began repeating these couplets. Jamil in holy war go fight, to me they say, What war, save fight for fair ones, would I ever essay? To me their every word and work are mere delight, And martyrs creep I all they slay in fight and fray, And ask I, O oh, Bhutaina, what's this love, I pray? Which eats my heart, quoth she, twill stay for ever and a and when i cry of wits return some small display for daily use quoth she far far tis fled away thou seek'st my death not else thy will can satisfy while i no goal espy save thee and thee alway thou hast spoken right well said she o king's son and Jamal also spoke excellently well. But what would Butaina have done with him that he says in his hemistich? Thou seekst my death, not else thy will can satisfy. O oh, my lady, quoth Sharkan, she wills to do him what thou willst to do with me, and even that will not satisfy thee. She laughed at his opportune reply and they ceased not carousing till day put out her light and night came in darkness tight then she rose and went to her dormitory and slept while sharkan slept in his place till morning dawned as soon as he awoke the handmaids came to him with tabrets and other instruments of mirth and merriment as wont and kissing the ground between his hands said to him bismillah in Allah's name be so kind as to come, our mistress biddeth thee to her presence. So he rose and accompanied the slave girls who surrounded him, playing on tabrets and other instruments of music, till they passed from that saloon into another and yet more spacious hall, decorated with pictured likenesses and figures of birds and beasts, passing all description. Sharkan marvelled at the art and artifice of the place, and began reciting. He plucks fruits of her necklace in revelry, and her breast-pearls that bedded in gold mine lie. Pure water on silvern bars is her brow, and her cheeks show roses with rubies vie. Me seems in her eyne that the violet's hue lies purpling set in the ithmid's die. When the lady saw Sharkan, she stood up to him in honour and, taking his hand, seated him by her side and asked, O son of King Omar bin al Nu'uman, hast thou any cunning in the game of chess? Yes, he answered, but do not thou with me as said the poet. I speak, and longing love upties me and unties me, till with her honeydew of inner lip she plies me. I brought the chessboard, and my leafest lover plays me, with white and black, but black cum white never satisfies me. Twas as if king for castle I were fain to place me, till wilful loss of game at wixt to queen surprise me. And if I seek to read intent in eyes that eye me, O man, that glance askance with hint of wish defies me. Then she brought the chessboard and played with him. But Sharkan, instead of looking at her moose, kept gazing at her fair mouth and putting knight in place of elephant and elephant instead of knight. She laughed and said to him, if thy play be after this fashion, thou knowest naught of the game. This is only our first, replied he. Judge not by this bout. When she beat him, he replaced the pieces in position and played again with her. But she beat him a second time, a third, a fourth, and a fifth. 
So she turned to him and said, Thou art beaten in everything. And he replied, O my lady, how should one playing with the like of thee avoid being beaten? Then she bade bring food, and they ate and washed their hands, after which the wine was set before them, and they drank. Presently she took the dulcimer, for her hand was cunning in smiting it, and she began repeating to an accompaniment these couplets. Twixt the close tide and open wide no medium fortune knoweth. Now ebb and flow, then flow and ebb, this wise her likeness shows. Then drink her wine, the sign she's thine, and smiling thou dost find her. Anon she'll fall and fare away, when all thy good forth goes. They ceased not carouse till nightfall, and this day was pleasanter ever than the first. When darkness set in, the lady betook her to her dormitory, leaving him alone with the handmaids. So he threw himself on the ground and slept till dawn, when the damsels came to him with tambourines and other instruments, according to custom. Seeing them, he roused him hastily, and sat up and they carried him to their mistress, who came to meet him, and, taking him by the hand, seated him by her side. Then she asked him how he had passed his night, whereat he prayed that her life be prolonged, and she took the lute and sang to it these verses, which she improvised. Never incline thee to part, which embitters the heart, even the sun, when he sets, shall in pallor depart. While they were solacing themselves after this fashion, behold, there arose a great and sudden clamour, and a confused crowd of knights and men rushed in, holding drawn swords that glittered and gleamed in their hands, and cried aloud in the Grecian tongue, Thou hast fallen into our hands, O Sharkan, so make thee sure of death. When he heard this, he said to himself, By Allah, she has entrapped me and held me in play till her men should come. These are the knights with whom she threatened me, but it is I who have thrown myself into this strait. Then he turned towards the young lady to reproach her, but saw that she had changed colour and her face was pale, and she sprang to her feet and asked the crowd, who are ye? O most gracious princess and peerless onion pearl, answered the leading knight, dost thou weet who is yon man by thy side? Not I, she replied, who may he be? Quoth the patrician, this is of towns the highwayman, this is he who rides in the horseman's van. This is Sharkan, son of King Omar bin al Nu'uman. This is he that forces fortalice and penetrates every impregnable place. The news of him reached King Hardub, thy father, by report of the ancient dame Sat al Dabahi, and thy sire, our sovereign, has made sure that thou hast rendered good service to the army of the Greeks by taking captive this ominous lion. When she heard this, she looked at the knight and asked him, What be thy name? And he answered, I am Masura, son of thy slave Masura bin Kasharda, knight of knights. And how, quoth she, durst thou enter my presence without leave? Quoth he, O my lady, when I came to the gate, none forbade me, neither chamberlain nor porter, but all the doorkeepers rose and forewent us as of wont, although when others come they leave them standing at the gate while they ask permission to admit them. But this is not a time for long talking when the king is expecting our return with this prince, the scorpion sting of the Islamitic host, that he may kill him and drive back his men whither they came, without the bane of battling with them. These words be ill words, rejoined the princess, 
and Dame Sat al Dawahi lied, avouching an idle thing and a vain, whereof she weeteth not the truth. For by the virtue of the Messiah, this man who is with me is not Sharkan, nor is he a captive, but a stranger who came to us seeking our hospitality, and I made him my guest. So even were we assured that this be Sharkan, and were it proved to us that it is he beyond a doubt i say it would ill befit mine honour that i should deliver into your hands one who has entered under my protection so make me not a traitor to my guest and a disgrace among men but return to the king my father and kiss the ground before him and inform him that the case is contrary wise to the report of the lady sat al dabahi o oh, abrisa replied masura the knight i cannot return to the king's majesty without his sceptre and enemy quoth she and indeed she had waxed very wroth out on thee return to him with my answer and no blame shall befall thee quoth masura i will not return without him Thereupon her colour changed, and she exclaimed, Exceed not in talk and vain words, for verily this man had not come in to us were he not assured that he could of himself and single-handed make head against an hundred riders. And if I said to him, Thou art Sharkan, son of King Omar bin al numan he would answer yes. But it is not of your competence to let or hinder him for if you do so he will not turn back from you till he has slain all that are in this place behold here he is by my side and i will bring him before you sword and targe in his hand albeit i were safe from thy wrath answered masura the knight i am not safe from that of thy father and when i see him i shall sign to thee knights to take him captive and we will carry him to the king bound and in abject sort when she heard this she said the matter shall not pass thus for it would be blazoning mere folly this man is but one and ye are an hundred knights so if you would attack him come out against him one after one that it may appear to the king which is the valiant amongst you and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section fifteen of the Book of the Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume Two. Read by Lars Rolander. Section sixteen, Volume Two, of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night. Translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Filippo Joaquin. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2, Section 16. When it was the fiftieth night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Princess Abriza said to the knight, This man is but one, and ye are an hundred. So if ye would attack him, come out against him one after one, that it may appear to the king which is the valiant. Quoth Musura the knight, By the truth of the Messiah thou sayest sooth, and none but I shall sally out against him first quoth she wait till i go to him and acquaint him with the case and hear what answer he will make if he consent tis well but if he refuse he shall on no wise come to him for i and my handmaids and whosoever is in the convent will be his ransom so she went to sharkan and told him the news whereat he smiled and knew that she had not informed any of the emirs. But that tidings of him had been bruited and blazed abroad, 
till the report reached the king against her wish and intent. So he again began reproaching himself and said, How came I to adventure and play with my life by coming to the country of the Greeks? But hearing the young lady's proposal, he said to her, Indeed their onset, one after one, would be overburdensome to them. Will they not come out against me ten by ten? That would be villainy, said she. Let one have it one. When he heard this, he sprang to his feet and made for them with his sword and battle gear. And Musra the knight also sprang up and bore down upon him. Sharkan met him like a lion and delivered a shoulder cut which clove him to the middle and the blade came out gleaming and glittering from his back and bowels. When the lady beheld the swashing blow, Sharkan's might was magnified in her sight, and she knew that when she overthrew him in the wrestle, it was not by her strength, but by her beauty and loveliness. So she turned to the knights and said, Take Reek for your chief, Thereupon out came the slain man's brother, a fierce and furious knight, and rushed upon Sharkan, who delayed not, but smote him also with a shoulder cut, and the sword came out glittering from his vitals. Then cried the princess, O ye servants of the Messiah, avenge your comrade! So they ceased not charging down upon him, one after one, and Sharkan also ceased not playing upon them with a blade, till he had slain fifty knights, the lady looking on the while. And Allah cast a panic into the hearts of the survivors, so that they held back and dared not meet him in the duel, but fell upon him in a body. And he laid on load with heart firmer than a rock, and smote them and trod them down like straw under the threshing sled, till he had driven sense and soul out of them. Then the princess called aloud to her damsels, saying, Who is left in the convent? And they replied, None but the gatekeepers. Whereupon she went up to Sharkan and took him to her bosom, he doing the same, and they returned to the palace after he had made an end of the melee. Now there remained a few of the knights hiding from him in the cells of the monastery, and when the princess saw this, she rose from Sharkan's side and left him for a while, but presently came back clad in closely meshed coat of ring mail and holding in her hand a fine Indian scimitar. And she said, Now by the truth of the Messiah, I will not be a niggard of myself for my guest, nor will I abandon him, though for this I abide a reproach and a by word in the land of the Greeks. Then she took reckoning of the dead and found that he had slain fourscore of the knights, and other twenty had taken to fly. When she saw what work he had made with them, she said to him, Allah bless thee. O Sharkan, the cavaliers may well glory in the like of thee. Then he rose, and wiping his blade clean of the blood of a slain, began reciting these couplets. How oft in the melee I've cleft the array, and given their bravest to lions a prey. Ask of me and of them when I prove me proud, over creation on days of the foray and fray when I left in the onslaught their lions to lay, on the sand of the lowlands in fieriest day. When he ended his verse, the princess came up to him with smiles and kissed his hand. Then she doffed her hauberk, and he said to her, O lady mine, wherefore didst thou don that coat of mail and bear thy brand? To guard thee against these caitiffs, she replied. Then she summoned the gatekeepers and asked them, How came ye to admit the king's knights into my dwelling 
without leave of me? And they answered, O princess, it is not our custom to ask leave of thee for the king's messengers, and especially for the chief of his knights. Quoth she, I think you were minded only to disgrace me and murder my guest. And bade Sharkan smite their necks. He did so, and she cried to the rest of her servants, Of a truth they deserved even more than that. Then turning to Sharkan, she said to him, Now that there hath become manifest to thee what was concealed, thou shalt be made acquainted with my history. Know, then, that I am the daughter of King Hardub of Rome. My name is Habriza, and the ancient dame Iklep Zat al Dawahi is my grandmother by the sword side. She it certainly is who told my father of thee, and as surely she will compass as light to slay me. More by token as thou hast slain my father's chivalry, and it is noised abroad that I have separated myself from the Nazareans, and have become no better than I should be with the Muslims. Wherefore it were wiser that I leave this dwelling while Zat al-Dawahi is on my track. But I require of thee the like kindness and courtesy I have shown thee, for enmity will surely befall between me and my father on thine account. So do not thou neglect to do aught that I shall say to thee, remembering all this betide in me not save by reason of thee. Hearing her words, Sharkan joyed greatly. His breast broadened, and his wits flew from him for delight. And he said, By Allah, none shall come at thee, while life is in my bosom. But hast thou patience to bear parting from thy parents and thy people? Even so, she answered. And Sharkan swore to her, and the two plighted their troth. Then said she, Now is my heart at ease, but there remaineth one other condition for thee. What is it? asked he, and she answered, It is that thou return with thy host to thine own country. Quoth he, O lady mine, my father, King Omar bin al-Numan, sent me to wage war upon thy sire, on account of the treasure he plundered from the king of Constantinople and amongst the rest three great jewels, noted givers of good fortune. Quoth she, Cheer thy heart, and clear thine eyes. I will tell thee the whole of the tale, and the cause of our feud with the king of Constantinople. Know that we have a yearly festival, highs the convent feast, whereat kings from all quarters and the noblest women are wont to congregate, thither also some merchants and traders with their wives and families, and the visitors abide there seven days. I was wont to be one of them, but when there befell enmity between us, my father forbade me to be present at the festival for the space of seven years. One year it chanced that amongst the daughters of the great who resorted to the patron as was their custom, came a daughter of the king of Constantinople, a beautiful girl named Sophia. They tarried at the monastery six days, and on the seventh the folk went their ways. But Sophia said, I will not return to Constantinople save by water. So they equipped for her a ship in which she embarked with her suite and making sail they put out to sea. But as they were voyaging, behold, a contrary wind caught them and drove the vessel from her course till, as fate and fortune would have it. She fell it with a Nazarene craft from the Camphor Island, carrying a crew of five hundred armed Franks, who had been cruising about a long time. When they sighted the sails of the ship, wherein Sophia and her women were, they gave chase in all haste, and in less than an hour they came up with her. Then they laid the grappling irons aboard her, 
and captured her. Then taking her in tow, they made all sail for their own island, and were but a little distant from it, when the wind veered round, and splitting their sails, drove them on to a shoal which lies off our coast. Thereupon we sallied forth, and, looking on them as spoil driven to us by fate, boarded and took them, and, slaying the man, made prize of the wreck, wherein we found the treasures and rarities in question, and forty maidens, amongst whom was the king's daughter, Sophia. After the capture, we carried the princess and her women to my father, not knowing her to be a daughter of King Afridun of Constantinople, and he chose out for himself ten, including her, and divided the rest among his dependents. Presently he set apart five damsels, amongst whom was the king's daughter, and sent them to thy father, King Omar bin al-Numan, together with other gifts, such as broadcloth, and woolen stuffs, and Grecian seals. Thy father accepted them, and chose out from amongst the five girls Sophia, daughter of King Afridun. Nor did we hear more of her till the beginning of this year, when her father wrote to my father in words unfitting for me to repeat, rebuking him with menaces, and saying to him, Two years ago you plundered a ship of ours, which had been seized by a band of Frankish pirates, in which was my daughter, Sophia, attended by her maidens, numbering some threescore. Yet ye informed me not thereof by messenger or otherwise, nor could I make the matter public, lest reproach befall me amongst the kings, by reason of my daughter's honour. So I concealed my case till this year, when I wrote to certain Frankish corsairs, who sought news of my daughter from the kings of the isles. By Allah, we carried her not forth of thy realm, but we have heard that King Hardub rescued her from certain pirates, and they told me the whole tale. Then he added in the writing which he writ to my father, Except you wish to be at feud with me, and design to disgrace me, and dishonor my daughter, you will, the instant my letter reacheth you, send my daughter back to me. But if you slight my letter, and disobey my commandment, I will assuredly make you full return for your foul dealing, and the baseness of your practices. When my father read this letter, and understood the contents, it vexed him, and he regretted not having known that Sophia, King Afridun's daughter, was among the captured damsels, that he might have sent her back to her sire. And he was perplexed about the case, because, after so long a time, he could not send to King Omar bin al-Numan, and demand her back from him, especially as he had lately heard that heaven had granted him boon of babe by this Sophia. So when we pondered that truth, we knew that this letter was none other but grievous calamity, and my father found nothing for it but to write an answer to King Afridun, making his excuses and swearing to him by strong oath that he knew not his daughter to be among the bevy of damsels in the ship, and setting forth how he had sent her to King Omar bin al-Numan, who had gotten the blessing of Ishuf by her. When my father's reply reached King Afridun, he rose up and sat down, and roared and foamed at the mouth, crying, What? Shall he take captive my daughter, and even her with slave girls? and pass her on from hand to hand, sending her for a gift to kings, and they lie with her without marriage contract? By the Messiah and the true faith, said he, I will not desist till I have taken my blood vengeance for this, and have wiped out my shame. And indeed I will do a deed 
which the chroniclers shall chronicle after me. So he bided his time, till he devised a device, and laid notable toils and snares, when he sent an embassy to thy father, King Omar, to tell him that which thou hast heard. Accordingly thy father kept thee and an army with thee, and sent thee to King Afridun, whose object is to seize thee and thine army to boot. As for the three jewels whereof he told thy father when asking his aid, there was not one soothfast word in that matter, for they were with Sophia, his daughter, and my father took them from her when he got possession of her and of bird maidens, and gave them to me in free gift, and they are now with me. So go thou to thy host, and turn them back, ere they be led deep into, and shut in by, the land of the bevy of damsels in the ship, and setting forth the Franks and the country of the Greeks. For as soon as you have come far enough into their interior, they will stop the roads upon you, and there will be no escape for you till the day of retribution and retaliation. I know that thy troops are still halting where thou leftest them, because thou didst order a three days rest. Withal they have missed thee all this time, and they wot not what to do. When Sharkan heard her words, he was absent a while in thought. Then he kissed Princess Abrizah's hand, and said, Praise be to Allah, who hath bestowed thee on me, and appointed thee to be the cause of my salvation, and the salvation of whoso is with me. But tis grievous to me to part from thee, and I know not what will become of thee after my departure. Go now to thine army, she replied, and turn them back, while ye are yet near your own country. If the envoys be still with them, lay hand on them and keep them, that the case may be made manifest to you. And after three days I will be with you, and we will enter Baghdad together. As he turned to depart, she said, Forget not the compact which is between me and thee. Then she rose, to bid him farewell, and embrace him, and quench the fire of desire. So she took leave of him, and throwing her arms round his neck, wept with exceeding weeping, and repeated these verses. I bade adieu, my right hand wiped my tears away, the while my left hand held her in a close embrace. Fearest thou not? Quoth she, of shame? I answered, Nay, the lover's parting day is lover's worst disgrace. Then Sharkan left her and walked down from the convent. They brought his steed, so he mounted and rode downstream to the drawbridge, which he crossed and presently threaded the woodland paths and passed into the open meadow. As soon as he was clear of the trees, he was aware of horsemen, which made him stand on the alert, and he bared his brand and rode cautiously. But as they drew near and exchanged curious looks, he recognized them, and behold, it was the wazir Dandan and two of his emirs. When they saw him and knew him, they dismounted, and saluting him, asked the reason of his absence whereupon he told them all that had passed between him and Princess Abriza from first to last. The wazir returned thanks to Almighty Allah for his safety, and said, Let us at once leave these lands, for the envoys who came with us are gone to inform the king of our approach, and haply he will hasten to fall on us and take us prisoners. So Sharkan cried to his men to saddle and mount, which they did, and setting out at once, they stinted not, faring till they reached the soul of the valley wherein the host lay. The ambassadors, meanwhile, 
had reported Sharkhan's approach to their king, who forthright equipped a host to lay hold of him and those with him. But Sharkhan, escorted by the wazir Dandan and the two emirs, had no sooner sighted the army that he raised the cry, March! March! They took horse on the instant and fared through the first day and second and third day, nor did they cease faring for five days, at the end of which time they alighted in a well-wooded valley, where they rested a while. Then they again set out, and stayed not riding for five and twenty days, which placed them on the frontiers of their own country. Here, deeming themselves safe, they halted to rest. And the country people came out to them with guest gifts for the men, and provender and forage for their beasts. They tarried there two days, after which, as all would be making for their homes, Sharkhan put the wazir Dandan in command, bidding him lead the host back to Baghdad. But he himself remained behind with an hundred riders, till the rest of the army had made one day's march. Then he called, To horse! and mounted with his hundred men. They rode on to Parasang's space, till they arrived at a gorge between two mountains, and lo, there arose before them a dark cloud of sand and dust. So they checked their steeds a while, till the dust opened and lifted, discovering beneath it an hundred cavaliers, lion-faced and in mail coat cased. As soon as they drew within earshot of Sharkhan, and his many, they cried out to them, saying, By the virtue of John and Mary, we have won to our wish. We have been following you by forced marches, night and day, till we forewent you to this place. So dismount and lay down your arms, and yield yourselves, that we may grant you your lives. When Sharkhan heard this, his eyes stood out from his head, and his cheek flushed red, and he said, How is it, O Nazarene dogs? He dare enter our country and overmatch our land? And doth not this suffice you, but you must adventure yourselves and address us in such unseemly speech? Do you think to escape out of our hands and return to your country? Then he shouted to his hundred horsemen, Up, and at these hounds! for they even you in number. So saying, he bared his saber and bore down on them, he and his. But the Franks met them with hearts firmer than rocks, and white dashed against white, and night dashed upon night, and hot waxed the fight, and sore was the affright, and nor parley not cries of quarter helped their plight and they stinted not to charge and to smite, right hand meeting right, nor to hack and hew with blades bright white, till day turned to night and gloom oppressed the sight. Then they drew apart, and Sharkhan mustered his men, and found none wounded save four only, who showed hurts but not death hurts. Said he to them, By Allah, my life long have I waded in the clashing sea of fight, and I have met many a gallant sprite, but none so unfrightened of the sword that smites, and the shock of men that affrights like these valiant knights. No, O king, said they, that there is among them a Frankish cavalier who is their leader, and indeed he is a man of valor, and fatal is his spear thrust. But by Allah, he spares us, great and small, for whose opulsing to his hands he lets him go and forbears to slay him. By Allah, had he willed, he had killed us all. Sharkhan was astounded when he heard what the knight had done, and such high report of him. So he said, When the morn shall morrow, we will draw out and defy them, for we are an hundred, to their hundred, and we will seek aid against them from the Lord of the heavens. So they rested that night in such intent, 
whilst the Franks gathered around their captain and said, Verily this day we did not win our will of these. And he replied, At early dawn, when the morrow shall mourn, we will draw out and challenge them, one after one. They also rested in that mine, and both camps kept guard until Almighty Allah sent the light of day dawn. Thereupon King Sharkan and his hundred riders took horse and rode forth to the plain, where they found the Franks ranged in line of battle. And Sharkan said to his followers, Our foes have determined like ourselves to do their devoir, so up and at them and lay on load. Then came forth an herald of the Franks and cried out, saying, let there be no general engagement betwixt us this day, save by the duel, a champion of yours against a champion of ours. Whereupon one of Sharkan's riders dashed out from the ranks and craved between the two lines, crying, Ho, oh, who is for smiting? Let no dastard engage me this day, nor neitherling. Hardly had he made an end of his vaunt, when there sallied forth to him a Frankish cavalier, armed cap a pied, and clad in a surcoat of gold stuff, riding on a grey white steed, and he had no hair on his cheeks. He urged his charger on to the midst of the battle plain, and the two fell to daring do of cut and thrust, but it was not long before the Frank foined the Muslim with a lance point and toppling him from his steed, took him prisoner, and led him off crestfallen. His folk rejoiced in their comrade, and forbidding him to go out again to the field, sent forth another, to whom sallied out another Muslim, brother to the captive, and offered him battle. The two fell too, either against the other, and fought for a little while, till the Frank bore down upon the Muslim, and pulsing him with a feint, tumbled him by a thrust of the lance heel from his destrier, and took him prisoner. After this fashion, the Muslims ceased not dashing forwards, one after one, and the Franks to unhorse them and take them captive, till day departed, and the night with darkness upstarted. Now they had captured of the Muslims twenty cavaliers, and when Sharkan saw this, it was grievous to him, and he mustered his men and said to them, What is this thing that hath befallen us? Tomorrow I myself will go forth to the field and offer singular combat to their chief and learn what is the cause of his entering our land and warn him against doing battle with our band. If he persist, we will punish him with death, and if he prove peaceable, we will make peace with him. They righted on this wise, till Allah Almighty caused the morn to dawn, when mounted the twain, and drew up for battle fain. And Sharkan was going forth to the plain, but behold, more than one half of the Franks dismounted and remained on foot before one of them who was mounted, till they reached the midst of the battle plain. Sharkan looked at that horseman, and lo, he was their chief. He was clad in a surcoat of blue satin and a close-ringed mail shirt. His face was as the moon when it rises, and no hair was upon his cheeks. He hand in hand an Indian scimitar, and he rode a sable steed with a white blaze on brow, like a deer ham. And he smote the horse with heel, till he stood almost in the midst of the field, when signing to the Muslims, he cried out in fluent Arab speech, Ho, Sharkan! Ho, son of Omar bin al-Numan! Ho, thou who forcest fortalis! and overthrowest cities and countries, up and out to battle bout, and blade single-handed wield with one who halves with thee the field. 
thou art prince of thy people, and I am prince of mine. And whoso overcometh the adversary, him let the other's men obey, and come under his sway. Hardly had he ended his speech, when out came Sharkhan with a heart full of fury, and urging his steeds into the midst of the field, closed like a raging lion with the Franks who encountered him with weariness and steadfastness, and met him with a meeting of warriors. Then they fell to foining and hewing, and they stinted not of onset and offset, and give and take, as they were two mountains clashing together, or two seas together dashing. Nor did they cease fighting until day darkened, and night starkened. Then they drew apart, and each returned to his own party. But as soon as Sharkhan forgathered with his comrades, he said, Never looked I on the like of this cavalier. He hath one quality I have not yet seen in any, and this it is that, when his foeman uncovereth a place for a death blow, he reverseth his weapon and smiteth with a lance heel. In very deed I know not what will be the issue twixt him and me, but is my wish that he had in our host his like and the like of his men. Then he went to his rest for the night, and when morning dawned, the Frank came forth and rode down to the midfield where Sharkhan met him, and they fell to fighting and to wheeling, left and right and necks were stretched out to see the sight, nor did they stint from strife and sword play and lunge of lance with main and might, till the day turned to night and darkness overwhelmed the light. Then the twain drew asunder and returned each to his own camp, where both related to their comrades what had befallen them in the duel. And at last the Frank said to his men, Tomorrow shall decide the matter. So they both passed the night restfully till dawn, and as soon as it was day, they mounted, and each bore down on other, and ceased not to fight till half the day was done. Then the Frank bethought him of a ruse, first urging his steed with heel, and then checking him with the rein so that he stumbled and fell with his rider. Thereupon Sharkhan threw himself on the foe, and would have smitten him with the sword, fearing lest the strife be prolonged, when the Frank cried out to him, O oh, Sharkhan, champions are not wont to do thus. This is the act of a man accustomed to be beaten by a woman. When Sharkhan heard this, he raised his eyes to the Frank's face, and gazing steadfastly at him, recognized in him Princess Abrisa, with whom that pleasant adventure had befallen him in the convent, whereupon he cast Bran from hand, and kissing the earth before her, asked her, What moved thee to a deed like this? And she answered, I desire to prove thy prowess afield and test thy doughtiness in tilting and jousting. These that are with me are my handmaids, and they are all clean maids, yet they have vanquished thy horsemen in fair press and stress of plain. And had not my steed stumbled up with me, thou shouldst have seen my might and prowess in combat. Sharkhan smiled at her speech and said, Praise be to Allah for safety and for my reunion with thee, O Queen of the Age. Then she cried out to her damsels to lose the twenty captives of Sharkhan's troop and dismount. They did as she bade, and came and kissed the earth before her and Sharkhan, who said to them, It is the like of you that kings keep in store for the need hour. Then he signed to his comrades to salute the princess. So all alighted and kissed the earth before her, for they knew the story. After this, the whole two hundred took horse and fared on night and day for six days' space, 
till they drew near to Baghdad, when they halted, and Sharkan bade Abriza and her handmaids doff the Frankish garb that was on them. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 16 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2 Recording by Filippo Joachim Section 17, Volume 2 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Filippo Joachim. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2, Section 17. When it was the fifty-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, the Sharkan bade Princess Abriza and her damsels doff the garb that was on them and donned the garments of daughters of Greece, and thus did they. Then he dispatched the company of his companions to Baghdad to acquaint his father Omar bin al-Numan with his arrival, and report that he was accompanied by Princess Abriza, daughter of King Hardub, lord of Grishaland. They halted forthright in the place they had reached, and Sharkan also halted, and all righted there. And when Almighty Allah made morning dawn, Sharkan and his company, and Abriza and her company, took horse and fared on towards the city, when, lo, on the way they met the wazir Dandan, who had come out amongst a thousand horse to honor Abriza and Sharkan by a special commandment of King Omar, son of Al-Numan. When the two drew near, they turned towards them and kissed ground before them. Then they mounted again and escorted them into the city and went up with them to the palace. Sharkan walked in to his father, who rose and embraced him and questioned him of his case. So he told him all that Abriza had told him, and what had passed between them, and said, She hath parted from her sire, and departed from her reign, and hath chosen to take part with us, and make her abode with us. And indeed, he said to his father, the king of Constantinople hath plotted to do us a mischief, because of his daughter Sophia, for that the king of Greece had made known to him her story, and the cause of her being given to thee, and he, the Grecian king, not knowing her to be daughter of King Afridun, lord of Constantinople, and had he known that, he would not have bestowed her upon thee, but he would have restored her to her parent. And of a verity, he continued, we were saved from these perils only by the Lady Abriza, and never saw we a more valiant than she and he went on to tell his father all that had passed from first to last of the wrestling and the single fighting. When King Omar heard the story of Sharkan, Abriza was exalted in his eyes, and he longed to see her and question her. Thereupon Sharkan went out to her and said, The king calleth for thee. She replied, I hear and I obey and he took her and brought her in to his father, who was seated on his throne, and who, having dismissed his high officers, was attended only by his eunuchs. The princess entered, and kissing the ground between his hands, saluted him in choice terms. He was amazed at her eloquent speech, and thanked her for her dealing with his son, Sharkan, and bade her be seated. So she sat down and unveiled her face. And when the king saw her beauty, his reason fled his head, and he made her draw near and showed her favor, appointing her an especial palace for herself and her damsels, and assigning them sold and allowances. Then began he to ask her of the three jewels aforesaid, and she answered, 
here be thy with me, O king of the age. So saying, she rose, and going to her lodging, unpacked her baggage, and from it brought out a box, and from the box a casket of gold. She opened the casket, and taking out those three jewels, kissed them and gave them to the king. Then she went away, bearing his heart with her. After her going, the king sent for his son Sharkan, and gave him one jewel of the three. And when he inquired of the other two, replied, O oh, my son, I mean to give one to thy brother, Zaw al-Makan, and the other to thy sister, Nusat al-Zaman. But when Sharkan heard that he had a brother, for to that time he knew only of his sister, he turned to his sire and said to him, O king, hast thou a son other than myself? He answered, Yes, and he is now six years old, adding that his name was Zaw al-Makan, and that he and Nuzat al-Zaman were twins, born at a birth. This news was grievous to Sharkan, but he kept his secret and said, The blessing of Allah most high be upon them and he cast the jewel from his hand, and shook the dust off his clothes. Quoth the king, How do I see thee change thy manner, when hearing of this, considering that after me thou becomes heir of the kingdom? Of a truth, the troops have sworn to thee, and the emirs and grandees have taken the oath of succession to thee, and this one of the three jewels is thine. Sharkan bowed his head to the ground, and was ashamed to bend the words with his parent, so he accepted the jewel and went away, knowing not what to do for exceeding wrath, and stayed not, walking till he had entered Abrizah's palace. As he approached, she stood up to meet him and thanked him for what he had done, and prayed for blessings on him and his sire. Then she sat down and seated him by her side. But when he had taken his place, she saw rage in his face and questioned him. Whereupon he told her that Allah had blessed his father with two children by Sophia, a boy and a girl, and that he had named the boy Zaw al-Makan and the girl Nushat al-Zaman, adding, He hath kept the other two jewels for them and hath given me one of thine, so I left it behind. I knew not of Zaw al-Makan's birth till this day, and the twain are now six years old. So when I learned this, wrath possessed me, and I tell thee the reason of my rage, and hide nothing from thee. But now I fear, lest my father take thee to wife, for he loveth thee, and I saw in him signs of desire for thee. So what wilt thou say if he wish this? Was she, No, O Sharkan, that thy father hath no dominion over me, nor can he have me without my consent, and if he prevail over me by force, I will take my own life. As for the three jewels, it was not my intent that he should give any of them to either of his children, and I had no thought but that he would lay them up in his treasury with his things of price. But now I desire of thy favor that thou make me a present of the jewel which he gave thee, if thou have accepted it. Hearkening and obedience, replied Sharkan, and gave it to her. Then said she, Fear nothing, and talked with him a while, and continued, I fear lest my father hear that I am with you, and sit not patiently under my loss, but do his endeavor to find me. And to that end he may ally himself with King Afridun on account of his daughter Sophia, and both come on thee with armies, and so there befall great turmoil. When Sharkan heard these words, he said to her, O my lady, if it please thee to sojour with us, take no thought of them, though there gather together against us all that be on land and on sea. Tis well, 
rejoined she, and if ye entreat me fair, I will tarry with you, and if ye deal evilly by me, I will depart from you. Then she bade her slave maidens bring food, so they set the tables, and Charkan ate a little, and went away to his own house, disturbed and perturbed. Such was his case. But regarding the affairs of his father, Omar bin al-Numan, after dismissing his son Sharkan, he rose, and taking the other two jewels, betook himself to the Lady Sophia, who stood up when she saw him, and remained standing till he was seated. Presently his two children, Zaw al-Makan and Nuzat al-Zaman, came to him, and he kissed them and hung a jewel round each one's neck, at which they rejoiced and kissed his hands. Then went they to their mother, who joyed in their joy, and wished the king long life. So he asked her, Why hast thou not informed me all this time that thou art the daughter of King Afridun, lord of Constantinople, that I might have honoured thee still more, and enlarged thee in dignity, and raised thy rank? O king, answered Sophia, and what could I desire greater or higher than this my standing with thee, overwhelmed as I am with thy favours and thy benefits? And furthermore, Allah hath blessed me with two children by thee, a son and a daughter. Her reply pleased the king, and after leaving her, he set apart for her and her children a wondrous fine palace. Moreover, he appointed for them eunuchs, and attendants, and doctors of law, and doctors of philosophy, and astrologers, and physicians, and surgeons, to do them service. And in every way he redoubled his favor, and entreated them with the best of treatment. And presently he returned to the palace of his dominion, and to his court, where he distributed justice among the lieges so far concerning him and Sophia and her children. But in the matter of Abriza, the king was greatly occupied with love of her, and burnt with desire of her night and day. And every night he would go in to her, and converse with her, and pay his court to her. But she gave him no answer, only saying, O king of the age, I have no desire for men at this present. When he saw her withdraw from him, his passion waxed hotter, and his longing and pining increased until, when weary of this, he summoned his wazir Dandan, and opening his very heart to him, told him of his love for Princess Abriza, daughter of Ardub, and informed him how she refused to yield to his wishes, and how desire for her was doing him to die, for that he could get no grace of her. The wazir, hearing these words, said to the king, As soon as it is dark night, take thou a piece of band, the measure of a miscal, about an ounce, and go in to her and drink somewhat of wine with her. When the hour of ending the carousel shall draw near, fill her a last cup, and dropping therein the bang, give it to her to drink, and she will not reach her sleeping chamber ere the drug take effect on her. Then do thou go in to her, and take thy will of her, and such is my advice. Thy reed is all right, quoth the king, and seeking his treasury, he took thence a piece of concentrated bang. If an elephant smelt it, he would sleep from ear to ear. This he put in his bosom pocket, and waited till some little of the night went by when he betook himself to the palace of Princess Abriza, who, seeing him, stood up to receive him. But he bade her sit down. So she sat down, and he sat by her, and he began to talk with her of wine and wassail. whereupon she furnished the kerosene table and placed it before him. Then she set on the drinking vessels and lighted the candles in order to bring dried fruits and sweet meats, and all that pertaineth to drinking. 
so they fell to tippling, and the king ceased not to pledge her, till drunkenness crept into her head. And seeing this, he took out the bit of bang from his pocket, and holding it between his fingers, filled the cup with his one hand, and drank it off. Then, filling the second, he said, To thy companionship, and dropped the drug into her cup, she knowing not of it. She took it and drank it off. Then she rose and went to her sleeping chamber. He awaited for less than an hour, till he was assured that the dose had taken effect on her and had robbed her of her senses. When he went in to her and found her thrown on her back, and she had doffed her petticoat trousers, and the air raised the skirt of her shift and discovered what was between her tides. When the king saw the state of things and found a lighted candle at her head and another at her feet, shining upon water tides enshrined, he took leave of his five senses for lust, and Satan seduced him, and he could not master himself, but put off his trousers and fell upon her and abated her maiden head. Then he rose off her and went to one of her women, by name Marjana, and said, Go in to thy lady and speak with her. So she went in to her mistress and found her lying on her back insensible, with the blood running down to the calves of her legs, whereupon she took a kerchief and wiped away the blood and lay by her that night. As soon as Almighty Allah brought the dawn, the handmaid Marjana washed her mistress's hands and feet, and brought rose water, and bathed her face and mouth with it. Whereupon she sneezed and yawned, and cast up from her inside that bit of bang like a bolus. Then she revived, and washed her hands and mouth, and said to Marjana, Tell me what hath befallen me. So she told her what had passed, and how she had found her, lying on her back, with the blood running down, wherefore she knew that King Omar bin al-Numan had lain with her, and had undone her, and taken his will of her. And this she grieved, with exceeding grief, and retired into privacy, saying to her damsels, Deny me to whoso would come in to me, and say to him that I am ill, till I see what Allah will do with me. Presently the news of her sickness came to the king, so he sent her sherbets and sugar electuaries. Some months she thus passed in solitude, during which time the king's flame cooled, and his desire for her was quenched, so that he abstained from her. Now she had conceived by him, and when three months of child-breeding had gone by, her pregnancy appeared, and her belly swelled, and the word was straightened upon her. So she said to her handmaid Marjana, Know that it is not the folk who have wronged me, but I who sinned against my own self, in that I left my father and mother and country. Indeed, I abhor life, for my spirit is broken, and neither courage nor strength is left me. I used, when I mounted my steed, to have the mastery of him, but now I am unable to ride. If I be brought to bed among them, I shall be dishonored before my hand women, and every one in the palace will know that he hath taken my maidenhead in the way of shame. And if I return to my father, with what face shall I meet him, or with what face shall I have recourse to him? How well, quoth the poet, say, what shall solace one who hath nor home, nor stable steed, nor cup companion, nor a cup, nor place to house his head? Marjana answered her, "'Tis thine to command, I will obey. And Abriza said, I desire at once to leave this place secretly, so that none shall know of me but thou, and return to my father and my mother, 
for when flesh stinketh, there is naught for it but its own folk, and Allah shall do with me even as he will. O princess, Majana replied, what thou wouldest do is well. Then she made matters ready, and kept her secret, and waited for some days, till the king went out to chase and hunt, and his son Sharkan betook himself to certain of the fortress to sojourn there a while. Then said she to Marjana, I wish to set out this night, but how shall I do against my destiny? For already I feel the pangs of labor and childbirth, and if I abide other four or five days, I shall be brought to bed here, and I shall be unable to travel to my country. But this is what was written on my forehead. Then she considered a while, and said to Marjana, Look us out a man who will go with us and serve us by the way, for I have no strength to bear arms. By Allah, O my lady, replied Marjana, I know none but a black slave called al Kasban, who is one of the slaves of King Omar bin al-Numan. He is a valiant white, and he keepeth guard at our palace gate. The king appointed him to attend us, and indeed we have overwhelmed him with our favors. So, Luki, I will go out and speak with him of this matter, and promise him some money, and tell him that, if he have a mind to tarry with us, I will marry him to whom he will. He told me before, today, that he had been a highwayman, so if he consent to us, we shall win our wish and reach to our own land. She rejoined, Call him, that I may talk with him. Whereupon Marjana fared forth, and said to the slave, O Ghazban, Allah prosper thee, so thou fall in with what my lady saith to thee. Then she took him by the hand, and brought him to the princess, whose hands he kissed, but as she beheld him, her heart took fright at him. However, she said to herself, of a truth, need giveth the law, and she approached to speak with him, yet her heart started away from him. Presently she said, O Gazban, say me, wilt thou help me against the perfidies of fortune, and conceal my secret if I discover it to thee? When the slave saw her, his heart was taken by storm, and he fell in love with her forthright, and could not but reply, O my mistress, whatsoever thou biddest me do, I will not depart therefrom. Quoth she, I would have thee take me at this hour, and take this my handmaid, and saddle us two camels, and two of the king's horses, and set on each horse a saddle bag of goods, and somewhat of provant, and go with us to our own country, where, if thou desire to abide with us, I will marry thee to her thou shalt choose of my handmaidens, or, if thou prefer return to thine own land, we will marry thee, and give thee whatso thou desires, after thou hast taken of money what shall satisfy thee. When al Ghazban heard this, he rejoiced with great joy, and replied, O my lady, I will serve both of you with mine eyes, and will go at once and saddle the horses. Then he went away gladsome, and saying to himself, I shall get my will of them, and if they will not yield to me, I will kill them both and take their riches. But he kept this his intent to himself, and presently returned with two camels and three head of horses, one of which he rode. And Princess Abriza made Marjana mount the second, she mounting the third, albeit she was in labor pains, and possessed not her soul for anguish. And the slave ceased not traveling with them night and day through the passes of the mountains, till they remained but musingly marched between them and their own country. When the travail pangs came upon Abriza, and she could no longer resist, so she said to Al-Ghazban, 
set me down, for the pains of labor are upon me. And cried to Marjana, Do thou alight, and sit by me, and deliver me. Then Marjana dismounted from her horse, and Algasban did in like sort. And they made fast the bridles, and helped the princess to dismount, for she was a swan from excess of anguish. When Algasban saw her on the ground, Satan entered into him, and he drew his falchion, and brandishing it in her face, said, O my lady, vouchsafe me thy favors. Hearing these words, she turned to him and said, It remaineth for me only that I yield me to a negro slaves, after having refused the kings and braves. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 17 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2, Recording by Filippo Joachim. Section 18, Volume 2 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Filippo Joachim The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Volume 2 Section 18 When it was the fifty-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Princess Abriza said to the black slave Algasban, It remaineth for me only that I yield me to negro slaves after having refused kings and braves. And she was wroth with him, and cried, Woe to thee! What words are these thou sayest? Out on thee, and talk not thus in my presence, and know that I will never consent to what thou sayest. Though I drink the cup of death, wait till I have cast my burden, and am delivered of the afterbirth, and then, if thou be able thereto, do with me as thou wilt, but, and thou leave not lewd talk at this time, assuredly I will slay myself with my own hand, and be at peace from all this. And she began reciting extempore, O spare me, thou Gasban, indeed enow for me, are heavy strokes of time, mischief and misery. Hoard on my lord for fence to all humanity, Quoth he, who breaks my bidding, hell for home shall see. And if thou live not suing me to whoredom's way, Against the almighty choicest gift my chastity, Upon my tribesmen I with might and main will call, And gather all, however far or near they be. And with Yamani blade, were I in peace hewn, Never shall he sight my face, who makes for villainy, the face of freeborn come of noble folk and brave, what then can be to me the seed of whoreson slave? When Gasban heard these lines, he was wroth exceedingly, his eyes reddened with blood, and his face became a dusty grey, his nostrils swelled, his lips protruded, and the repulsiveness of his aspect redoubled and he repeated these couplets. O thou, Abriza, mercy, leave me not, for I, of thy love and Yamani glance the victim lie. My heart is cut to pieces by thy cruelty, my body wasted, and my patience done to die. From glances ravishing all hearts with witchery, reason far flies, the wild desire to thee draws her nigh. Though at thy call should armies fill the face of earth, Even now I'd win my wish and words in arms defy. When Abriza heard these words, she wept with sore weeping, And said to him, Woe to thee, O Gasban! How dareth the like of thee to address me such demand, O base-born and obscene bread? Dost thou deem all folk are alike? When the vile slave heard this from her, he waxed more enraged, and his eyes grew redder, 
and he came up to her and smiting her with a sword on her neck wounded her to her death then he drove her horse before him with the treasure and made off with himself to the mountains such was the case with Algas band but as regards abriza she gave birth to a son like the moon and marjana took the babe and did him the necessary offices and laid him by his mother's side and lo and behold the child fastened to its mother's breast and she dying when marjana saw this she cried out with a grievous cry and rent her raiment and cast dust on her head and buffeted her cheeks till flood flowed saying alas my mistress alas the pity of it thou art dead by the hand of a worthless black slave after all thy knightly prowess and she ceased not weeping when suddenly a great cloud of dust arose and walled the horizon but after a while it lifted and discovered a numerous conquering host now this was the army of king ardub princess abrizah's father and the cause of his coming was that when he heard of his daughter and her handmaids had been fled to baghdad and that they were with king omar bin al numan he had come forth leading those with him to seek tidings of her from travellers who might have seen her with the king when he had gone a single day's march from his capital he espied three horsemen afar off and made towards them intending to ask whence they came and seek news of his daughter now these three whom he saw at the distance were his daughter and marjana and the slave al ghazban and he made for them to push inquiry seeing this the villain black moor feared for himself so he killed abriza and fled for his life when they came up king ardub saw his daughter lying dead and marjana weeping over her and he threw himself off his steed and fell fainting to the ground all the riders of his company the emirs and waxiers took foot and forthright pitched their tents on the mountain and set up for the king a great pavilion domed and circular without which stood the grandees of the realm when marjana saw her master she at once recognized him and her tears redoubled and when he came to himself he questioned her and she told him all that had passed and said of a truth he that hath slain thy daughter is a black slave belonging to king omar bin anuman and she informed him how sharkhan's father had dealt with the princess when king hardub heard this the word grew black in his sight and he wept with sore weeping then he called for a litter and therein lay in his dead daughter returned to caesarea and carried her into the palace where he went in to his mother zat al dawahi and said to that lady of calamities shall the muslim deal thus with my girl verily king omar bin al numan despoiled her of her honor by force and after this one of his black slaves slew her by the truth of the messiah i will assuredly take blood revenge for my daughter and clear away from mine honor the stain of shame else will i kill myself with mine own end and he wept passing sore quoth his mother none other than marjana killed thy daughter for she hated her in secret and she continued to her son fret not for taking the blood wit of thy daughter for by the truth of the messiah i will not turn back from king omar bin al uman till i have slain him and his sons and of a very truth i will do with him a deed passing the power of sage and knight whereof the chroniclers shall tell chronicles in all countries and in every place but needs must thou do my bidding in all i shall direct 
for whoso be firmly set on the object of his desire shall surely compass his desire. By the virtue of the Messiah, replied he, I will not cross thee in aught thou shalt say. Then quoth she, Bring me a number of handmaids, high-bosomed virgins, and summon the wise men of the age, and let them teach them philosophy, and the rules of behavior before kings, and the art of conversation, and making verses, and let them talk with them of all manner science and edifying knowledge. And the sages must be Muslims, that they may teach them the language and traditions of the Arabs, together with the history of the caliphs and the ancient annals of the kings of al-Islam. And if we persevere in this for four years' space, we shall gain our case. So possess thy soul in patience and wait, for one of the Arabs saith, If we take man boat after years forty the time were sure to ye. When we have taught the girls these things, we shall be able to work our will with our folk. For he doteth on women, and he hath three hundred and sixty concubines, whereto are now added an hundred of the flowers of thy handmaidens, who were with thy daughter, she that had found mercy. As soon as I have made an end of their education, as described to thee, I will take them and set out with them in person. When King Ardub heard his mother's words, he rejoiced and arose and kissed her head, and at once dispatched messengers and couriers to lend sundry and manifold to fetch him Muslim sages. They obeyed his commands and fared to far countries, and thence brought him the sages and the doctors he sought. When these came into presence, he honored them with notable honors, and bestowed dresses on them, and appointing to them stipends and allowances, and promised them much money, whenas they should have taught the damsels. Then he committed the handmaidens to their hands, and Shurazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the fifty-third night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the sages and the doctors stood in the presence of King Hardub, he honored them with notable honors, and committed the handmaidens to their hands, enjoying that these be instructed in all manner of knowledge, philosophy, and polite accomplishments, and they set themselves to do his bidding. Such was the case with King Hardub, but as for King Omar bin al Luman, when he returned from coursing and hunting, and entered his palace, he sought Princess Abriza, but found her not, nor any one knew of her, nor could any give him news of her. This was grievous to him, and he said, How could a lady leave the palace unknown to any? Had my kingdom been at stake in this case, it were in perilous condition there being none to govern it. I will never again go to sport and hunt, till I have stationed at the gates those who shall keep good guard over them. And he was sore waxed, and his breast was straitened for the loss of Princess Abriza. Hereupon, behold, his son Sharkan returned from his journey, and the father told him what had happened, and informed him how the lady had fled, whilst he was chasing and hunting, whereat he grieved with exceeding grief. Then King Omar took to visiting his children every day, and making much of them, and brought them learned men and doctors to teach them, appointing for them stipends. When Sharkan saw this, he raged with exceeding rage, and envied thereupon his brother and sister, till the signs of chagrin appeared on his face, and he ceased not to languish by reason of this matter. So one day his father said to him, Why do I see thee grown weak in body and yellow in face? 
O my father, replied Sharkan, every time I see thee fondle my brother and sister and make much of them, jealousy seizes me, and I fear lest it grow on me till I slay them and thou slay me in return. And this is the reason of my weakness of body and change of complexion. But now I crave of thy favor that thou give me one of thy castles outlying the rest, that I may abide there the remnant of my life. For as the sayer of by words saith, absence from my friend is better and fitted for me. And whatso I doth not perceive, that gareth not hard to grieve. And he bowed his head towards the ground. When King Omar bin al-Numan heard his words, and knew the cause of his ailment, and of his being broken down, he soothed his heart, and said to him, O my son, I grant thee this, and I have not in my reign a greater than the castle of Damascus, and the government of it is thine from this time. Thereupon he forthright summoned his secretaries of state, and bade them write Sharkan's patent of investiture to the viceroyalty of Damascus of Syria. And when they had written it, he equipped him and sent with him the wazir Dandan, and invested him with the rule and government, and gave him instructions as to policy and regulations, and took leave of him. And the grandees and officers of state did likewise, and he set out with his host. When he arrived at Damascus, the townspeople beat the drums and blew the trumpets and decorated the city and came out to meet him in great state, whilst all the notables and grandees paced in procession, and those who stood to the right of the throne walked on his right flank and the others to his left. Thus far concerning Sharkan. But as regards his father, Omar bin al-Numan, soon after the departure of his son, the children's tutors and governors presented themselves before him and said to him, O our Lord, thy children have now learnt knowledge, and they are completely versed in the rules of manners and the etiquette of ceremony. The king rejoiced thereat with exceeding joy, and conferred bountiful largesse upon the learned man, seeing Zaw al Makan grown up and flourishing and skilled in horsemanship. The prince had reached the age of fourteen, and he occupied himself with piety and prayers, loving the poor, the ulema, and the Koran students, so that all the people of Baghdad loved him, men and women. One day, the procession of the Mahmil of Iraq passed round Baghdad before its departure for the pilgrimage to Mecca and visitation of the tomb of the Prophet, whom Allah bless and preserve. When Zaw al Makan, the Mahmil procession, he was seized with longing desire to become a pilgrim. So he went in to his sire and said, I come to ask thy leave to make the pilgrimage. But his father forbade him, saying, Wait till next year, and I will go, and thou too. When the prince saw that the matter was postponed, he betook himself to his sister Nusat al-Zaman, whom he found standing at prayer. As soon as she had handed her devotions, he said to her, I am dying with desire of pilgrimage to the holy house of Allah at Mecca, and to visit the tomb of the Prophet upon whom be peace. I asked my father's leave, but he forbade me that. So I mean to take privily somewhat of money and set out on the pilgrimage without his knowledge. Allah upon thee, exclaimed she, take me with thee and deprive me not of visitation to the tomb of the Prophet, whom Allah bless and keep. And he answered, As soon as it is dark night, do thou come forth from this place without telling any. Accordingly, 
When it was the middle of the night, she arose and took somewhat of money and donned a man's habit, and she ceased not walking to the palace gate, where she found Zau al Makan with camels ready for marching. So he mounted and mounted her, and the two fared dawn till they were in the midst of the Iraqi pilgrim party, and they ceased not marching, and Allah wrought safety for them till they entered Mecca, the holy, and stood upon Arafat, and performed the pilgrimage rites. Then they made a visitation to the tomb of the Prophet, whom Allah blessed and assain, and thought to return with the pilgrims to their native land. But Zaw al-Makan said to his sister, O my sister, it is in my mind to visit the holy house, Jerusalem, and Abraham, the friend of Allah, on whom be peace. I also desire so to do, replied she. So they agreed upon this, and he fared forth and took passage for himself and her, and they made ready and set out in the ship with a company of Jerusalem palmers. That very night the sister fell sick of an anguished chill, and was grievously ill, but presently recovered, after which the brother also sickened. She tended him during his malady, and they ceased not wayfaring till they arrived at Jerusalem. But the fever increased on him, and he grew weaker and weaker. They alighted at a khan, and there hired a lodging. But Zaw al Makan's sickness ceased not to increase on him, till he was wasted with leanness and became delirious. At this, his sister was greatly afflicted and exclaimed, There is no majesty and there is no might, save in Allah, the glorious, the great. This is the decree of Allah. They sojourned in that place a while, his weakness ever increasing, and she attending him and buying necessaries for him and for herself, till all the money she had was expended, and she became so poor that she had not so much as a dirham left. Then she sent a servant of the Khan to the bazaar with some of her clothes, and he sold them and she spent the price upon her brother. Then sold she something more, and she ceased not selling all she had, piece by piece, till nothing was left but an old rug. Whereupon she wept and exclaimed, Verily is Allah the order of the past and the future. Presently her brother said to her, O my sister, I feel recovery drawing near, and my heart longeth for a little roast meat. By Allah, O my brother, replied she, I have no face to beg, but tomorrow I will enter some rich man's house and serve him and earn somewhat for our living. Then she bethought herself a while, and said, Of a truth, it is hard for me to leave thee and thou in this state. But I must, despite myself. He rejoined, Allah forbid, thou wilt be put to shame. But there is no majesty, and there is no might, save in Allah. And he wept, and she wept too. And she said, O my brother, we are strangers who have dwelt here a full year, but none hath yet knocked at our door. Shall we then die of hunger? I know no resource, but that I go out and do service and earn somewhat to keep us alive, till thou recover from thy sickness, when we will travel back to our native land. She sat weeping a while, and he wept too propped upon his elbow. Then Nusrat al-Zaman arose, and veiling her head with a bit of camlet, which had been of the camelier's clothes, and which the owner had forgotten and left with them, she kissed the head of her brother, and embraced him, and went forth from him, weeping and knowing not whither she should wend. And she stinted not going, and her brother Zawu al-Makan awaiting her return, till the supper time. But she came not, 
and he watched for her till the morning morrowed, but still she returned not. And this endured till two days went by. He was greatly troubled thereat, and his heart fluttered for her, and hunger was sore upon him. At last he left the chamber, and calling the servant of the caravanserai, said, I wish thee to bear me to the bazaar. So he carried him to the market street, and laid him down there. And the people of Jerusalem gathered round him, and were moved to tears, seeing his condition. He signed to them, begging for somewhat to eat. So they brought him some money from certain of the merchants who were in the bazaar, and bought food and fed him therewith, after which they carried him to a shop where they spread him a mat of palm leaves, and set an ewer of water at his head. When night fell, all the folk went away, sore concerned for him, and in the middle of the night he called to mind his sister, and his sickness redoubled on him, so that he abstained from eating and drinking, and became insensible to the world around him. Then the bazaar people arose, and took for him from the merchants thirty-seven dirhams, and hiring a camel, said to the driver, Carry this sick man to Damascus, and leave him in the hospital, haply he may be cured and recover health. On my head be it, replied the camel man, but he said to himself, How shall I take this sick man to Damascus? and he nigh upon death. So he carried him away to a place, and hid with him till the night, when he threw him down on the ash heap near the fire hole of a hammam, and went his way. When morning dawned, the stalker of the bath came to his work, and finding Zaw al Makan cast on his back, exclaimed, Why did they not throw their dead body anywhere but here? So saying, he gave him a kick, and he moved. Whereupon quoth the fireman, Some one of you who hath eaten a bit of hashish, and hath thrown himself down in whatso place it be. Then he looked at his face, and saw his hairless cheeks, and his grace and comeliness. So he took pity on him, and knew that he was sick and a stranger in the land. And he cried, there is no majesty, and there is no might, save in Allah. Verily, I have sinned against this youth, for indeed the Prophet, whom Allah bless and keep, enjoineth honor to the stranger, more especially when the stranger is sick. Then he carried him home, and went in with him to his wife, and bade her tend him. So she spread him a sleeping rug, and set a cushion under his head, then warmed water for him, and washed therewith his hands and feet and face. Meanwhile, the stalker went to the market, and bought some rose water and sugar, and sprinkled Zaw al Makan's face with the water, and gave him to drink of the sherbet. Then he fetched a clean shirt and put it on him. With this, Zaw al Makan sniffed the zephyr of health, and recovery returned to him, and he sat up and leaned against the pillow. Hereat the fireman rejoiced and exclaimed, Praise be to Allah for the welfare of his youth. O Allah, I beseech thee by thy knowledge of hidden things, that thou make the salvation of this youth to be at my hands. And Shirazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 18 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2 Recording by Filippo Joachim Section 19, Volume 2 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Filippo Joaquin. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2, Section 19. When it was the fifty-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the fireman exclaimed, O Allah, I beseech thee of thy knowledge of hidden things, that thou make this young man's life the work of my hands. And he ceased not to nurse him for three days, giving him to drink of sherbet of sugar and willow flower water and rose water, and doing him all manner of service and kindness, till health began to return to his body, and Zaw al Makan opened his eyes. Presently came in the fireman, and seeing him sitting up and showing signs of amendment, said to him, What is now thy state, O my son? Praise be to Allah, replied Zaw al Makan. I am well and like to recover if such be the will of Allah Almighty at this time. The stalker praised the Lord of all for this, and wending fast to the market, bought ten chickens, which he carried to his wife, and said, Kill two of these for him every day, one at dawn of day, and the other at fall of day. So she rose up, and killed the fowl, and brought it to him boiled and fed him with the flesh, and made him drink its broth. When he had done eating, she fetched hot water, and he washed his hands, and lay back upon the pillow, whereupon she covered him up with a coverlet, and he slept till the time of the mid-afternoon prayer. Then she arose, and killed another fowl, and boiled it, after which she cut it up and bringing it to Zawa Makan, said, Eat, O my son. While he was eating, behold, her husband entered, and seeing her feeding him, sat down at his head, and said to him, How is it with thee now, O my son? Thanks be to Allah for recovery, he replied. May the Almighty requite thee thy kindness to me. At this the fireman rejoiced, and going out, bought sherbet of violets and rose water, and made him drink it. Now the stalker used to work at the hammam all day for a wage of five dirhams, whereupon he spent every day for Zaw al Makan one dirham upon sugar and sherbet of rose water and willow flower water, and another dirham for fowls and he ceased not to entreat him thus kindly during a whole month, till the traces of illness ceased from him, and he was once more sound and whole. Thereupon the fireman and his wife rejoiced and asked him, O my son, wilt thou go with me to the bath? Whereto he answered, Yes. So the stalker went to the bazaar and fetched the donkey boy, and he mounted the Zawal Makan on the ass, and supported him in the saddle, till they came to the bath. Then he made him sit down, and seated the donkey boy in the furnace room, and went forth to the market, and bought iot leaves and lupin flour, with which he returned to the bath, and said to Zawal Makan, O oh my master, in Allah's name, Walk in, and I will wash thy body. So they entered the inner room of the bath, and the fireman took to rubbing Zaw al Makan's legs, and began to wash his body with the leaves and meal. When there came to them a bathman, whom the bathkeeper had sent to Zaw al Makan, and he, seeing the stalker washing and rubbing him, said, this is doing injury to the keeper's rights, replied the fireman. The master overwhelmeth us with his favors. Then the bathman proceeded to shave Zaw Makan's head, after which he and the stalker washed themselves and returned to the house, where he clad Zaw Makan 
in a shirt of fine stuff and a robe of his own, and gave him a handsome turban and girdle and a light kerchief which he wound about his neck. Meanwhile, the fireman's wife had killed and cooked two chickens. So, as soon as Awal Makan entered and seated himself on the carpet, the husband arose and dissolving sugar in willow flower water made him drink of it. Then he brought the food tray and cutting up the chickens, fed him with the flesh and gave him the broth to drink till he was satisfied. When he washed his hands and prayed Allah for recovery, and said to the fireman, Thou art he whom the Almighty vouchsafed to me and made the cause of my cure. Leave this talk, replied the other, and tell us the cause of thy coming to this city and whence thou art. Thy face showeth signs of gentle breeding. Tell me first how thou camest to fall in with me, said Zaw al Makan, and after I will tell thee my story. Rejoined the fireman, As for that, I found thee lying on the rubbish heap by the door of the firehouse as I went to my work near the morning, and knew not who had thrown thee there, so I carried thee home with me. And this is all my tale. Quoth Saw al Makan, Glory to him who quickeneth the bones, though they be rotten. Indeed, O my brother, thou hast not done good save to one worthy of it, and thou shalt presently gather its fruitage. And he added, But where am I now? Thou art in the city of Jerusalem, replied the stalker. Whereupon Zaw al Makan called to mind his strangerhood, and remembered his separation from his sister, and wept. Then he discovered his secret to the fireman, and told him his story, and began repeating, In love they bore me further than my force would go, and for them made me suffer resurrection throw. Oh, have compassion, cruel, on this soul of mine, which since ye fared is pitied by each envious foe, nor grudge the tender mercy of one passing glance, my case to lighten, easing this excess of woe. Quoth I, heart, bear this loss in patience. Patience cried, take heed, no patience in such plight I am wont to show. Then he redoubled his weeping. And the fireman said to him, Weep not, but rather praise Allah for safety and recovery. Asked Zaw al Makan, How far it is hence to Damascus? Answered the other, Six days' journey. Then quoth Zaw al Makan, Wilt thou send me thither? O my lord, quoth the stalker, How can I allow thee to go alone? And thou, a youth and a stranger to boot, if thou would journey to Damascus, I am one who will go with thee, and if my wife will listen to and obey me and accompany me, I will take up my abode there, for it is no light matter to part with thee. Then said he to his wife, Will thou travel with me to Damascus of Syria, or wilt thou abide here? whilst I lead this my lord thither and return to thee. For he is bent upon going to Damascus of Syria, and by Allah it is hard to me to part with him, and I fear for him from highway men. Replied she, I will go with you both. And he rejoined, Praised be Allah for accord, and we have said the last word. Then he rose, and selling all his own goods and his wife's gear. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the fifty-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the fireman and his wife agreed with Zaw al-Makan to travel with him Damascus wards. 
Then the stalker sold his goods and his wife's gear, and bought a camel, and hired an ass for Zaw al Makan. And they set out, and ceased not wayfaring for six days, till they reached Damascus. And they arrived there towards eventide, when the fireman went forth, and as was his wont, bought some meat and drink. They had dwelt but five days in Damascus, when his wife sickened, and after a short illness was translated to the mercy of Almighty Allah. Her death was a heavy matter to Zaw al Makan, for he was grown used to her, as she had tended him assiduously, and the fireman grieved for her with exceeding grief. Presently the prince turned to the stalker, and finding him mourning, said to him, Grieve not, for at this gate we must all go in. Replied he, Allah make will thy lot, O my son. Surely he will compensate us with his favors and cause our mourning to cease. What sayest thou, O my son, about our walking abroad to view Damascus and cheer thy spirits? Replied Zaw al Makan, Thy will is mine. So the fireman arose and placed his hand in that of Zaw al Makan. And the two walked on till they came to the stables of the viceroy of Damascus, where they found camels laden with chests and carpets and brocaded stuffs, and horses ready saddled, and Bactrian dromedaries, while Mamelukes and negro slaves and folk of the Habab were running to and fro. Quoth Saw al Makan, I wonder to whom belong all these chattels and camels and stuffs. So he asked one of the eunuchs, Whither this dispatching? And he answered, These are presents sent by the emir of Damascus to King Omar bin al numan with the tribute of Syria. Now when Zaw al Makan heard his father's name, his eyes brimmed over with tears, and he began repeating, O ye gone for the gaze of these ridded eyne, he whose sight in my spirit shall ever dwell. Your charms are gone, but this heart of mine hath no sweet and no pleasures its sour dispel. If Allah's grace make us meet again, in long drawn love tale my love I'll tell. And when he had ended his verse, he wept, and the fireman said to him, O oh, my son, we hardly believed that thy health had returned, so take heart and do not weep, for I fear a relapse for thee. And he ceased not comforting and cheering him, whilst Zaw al Makan sighed and moaned over his strangerhood and separation from his sister and his family, and tears streamed from his eyes, and he recited these couplets. Get thee provant in this word, ere thou went upon thy way, and know how surely death descends thy life lot to waylay. All thy worldly goods are pride, and the painfulest to repine. All thy worldly life is vexing, of thy soul in vain display. Say, is not worldly one like a wanderer's place of rest, where at night he knacks his camels, and moves off at dawn of day. And he continued to weep and wail over his separation, whilst the fireman also bewept the loss of his wife, yet ceasing not to comfort Zaw al Makan till morning dawned. When the sun rose, he said to him, Meseemeth thou yearnest for thy native land? Yes, replied Zaw al Makan and I can no longer tarry here. So I will commend thee to Allah's care, and set out with these folk and journey with them, little by little, till I come to my motherland, said the stalker, and I with thee, for of a truth I cannot bear to party with thee. I have done thee kindly service, and I mean to complete it by tending thee on thy travel. At this 
Zaw al-Makan rejoiced and said, Allah abundantly requite thee for me, and was pleased with the idea of their travelling together. The fireman at once went forth and bought another ass, selling the camel, and laid in his provant and said to Zaw al-Makan, This is for thee to ride by the way, and when thou art weary of riding, thou canst dismount and walk. Said Zaw al Makan, May Allah bless thee and aid me to requite thee, for verily thou hast dealt with me more lovingly than one with his brother. Then he waited till it was dark night, when he laid his provisions and baggage on that ass and set forth upon their journey. This much befell Zaw al Makan and the firemen. But as regards what happened to his sister, Nusat al-Zaman, when she left her brother in the Khan where they abode, and wrapped in the old camlet, went out to seek service with some one, that she might earn wherewithal to buy him the roast meat he longed for, she fared on, weeping and knowing not whither to go, whilst her mind was occupied with thoughts of her brother and of her family and her native land. So she implored Allah Almighty to do away with these calamities from them and began versifying. Dark falls the night and passion comes sore pains to guard me dree, and pine upstairs those ceaseless pangs which work my tormentry, and cease not separation flames my vital to consume and drives me on destruction way this sorrow's ecstasy, and longing breeds me restlessness, desire forever fires, and tears to all proclaim what I would keep in secrecy. No cunning shift is known to me a meeting to secure, that I may quit this sickly state, may cure my malady. The love which blazeth in my heart is fed with fancy fuel, the lover from its hell of fire must bear hell's agony. O thou who blamest me for all befell me, tis enough. Patient I bear whatever wrote the reed of doom for me. By love I swear I'll never be consoled, no, never more. I swear the oath of love's own slaves who know no perjury. O night, to chroniclers of love, the news of me declare, that sleep hath fed mine eyelids, of thy knowledge witness bears. Then she walked on, weeping and turning right and left as she went, when behold, there espied her an old Badawi, who had come into the town from the desert, with wild Arabs other five. The old man took note of her, and saw that she was lovely, but she had nothing on her head save a piece of camlet, and marvelling at her beauty, he said to himself, This charmer dazzleth men's wits, but she is in squalid condition, and whether she be of the people of this city, or she be a stranger, I needs must have her. So he followed her, little by little, till he met her face to face, and stopped the way before her in a narrow lane, and called out to her, asking her case, and said, Tell me, O my little daughter, art thou a free woman or a slave? When she heard this, she said to him, By thy life do not add to my sorrows. Quoth he, Allah hath blessed me with six daughters, of whom five died and only one is left me, the youngest of all. And I come to ask thee, if thou be of the folk of this city or a stranger, that I might take thee and carry thee to her, to bear her company, so as to divert her from pining for her sisters. If thou have no kith and kin, I will make thee as one of them, and thou and she shall be as my two children. Nuzat al-Zaman bowed her head in bashfulness when she heard what he said and communed with herself 
Haply I may trust myself to this old man. Then she said to him, O uncle, I am a maiden of the Arabs, and a stranger, and I have a sick brother. But I will go with thee to thy daughter on one condition, which is, that I may spend only the day with her, and at night may return to my brother. If thou strike this bargain, I will fare with thee, for I am a stranger, and I was high in Aaron among my tribe, and I awoke one morning to find myself vile and abject. I came with my brother from the land of Al-Hijaz, and I fearless he know not where I am. When the Badawi heard this, he said to himself, By Allah, I have got my desire. Then he turned to her and replied, there shall none be dearer to me than thou. I wish thee only to bear my daughter company by day, and thou shalt go to thy brother at earliest nightfall, or, if thou wilt, bring him over to dwell with us. And the Badawi ceased not to console her heart and coax her, till she trusted in him and agreed to serve him. Then he walked on before her, and when she followed him, he winked to his men to go in advance and harness the dromedaries and load them with their packs and place upon them water and provisions, ready for setting out as soon as he should come up with the camels. Now this Badawi was a base-born churl, a highway thief and a traitor to the friends he held most fief, a rogue in grain, past master of plots and chicane. He had no daughter and no son, and was only passing through the town, when by the decree of the decreer he fell in with this unhappy one, and he ceased not to hold her in converse on the highway till they came without the city of Jerusalem, and when outside he joined his companions and found they had made ready the dromedaries. So the Badawi mounted a camel having seated Nuzhat al-Zaman behind him, and they rode on all night. Then she knew that the Badawi's proposal was a snare, and that he had tricked her. And she continued weeping and crying out the whole night long, while they journeyed on, making for the mountains, in fear any should see them. Now when it was near dawn, they dismounted from their dromedaries, and the Badawi came up to Nuzhat al-Zaman and said to her, O city's trumpet, what is this weeping? By Allah, and thou hold not thy peace, I will beat thee to death, O thou town filth. When she heard this, she loathed life and longed for death. So she turned to him and said, O accursed old man, O grey beard of hell, how have I trusted thee, and thou hast played me false, and now thou wouldest torture me? When he heard her reply, he cried out, O lazy baggage, dost thou dare to bandy words with me? And he stood up, took her, and beat her with a whip, saying, And thou hold not thy peace, I will kill thee. So she was silent a while. Then she called to mind her brother, and the happy estate she had been in, and she shed tears secretly. Next day she turned to the Badawi and said to him, How couldst thou play me this trick, and lure me into these bold and stony mountains? And what is thy design with me? When he heard her words, he hardened his heart, and said to her, O lazy baggage of ill omen and insolent, will thou bandy words with me? And he took the whip and came down with it on her back till she felt faint. Then she bowed down over his feet and kissed them, and he left beating her and began reveling her and said, By the rights of my bonnet, if I see or hear thee weeping, I will cut out thy tongue, 
and stuff it up thy kind, O thou city filth. So she was silent, and made him no reply, for the beating pained her, but sat down with her arms round her knees, and bowing her head upon her collar, began to look into her case and her abasement after her lot of high honor, and the beating she had endured, and she called to mind her brother and his sickness and forlorn condition, and how they were both strangers in a far country, which craved tears down her cheeks, and she wept silently and began repeating, Time hath for this want to appraise and debase, nor is lasting condition for human race. In this world each thing hath appointed turn, nor may man transgress his determined place. How long these perils and woe, ah woe, for a life all woeful in Parlo's case. Allah bless not the day which have laid me low, I the word with disgrace after so much grace. My wish is baffled, my hopes cast down, and distance forbids me to greet thee his face. O thou who passeth that dear one's door, Say for me, these tears shall flow evermore. When she had finished her verses, the Badawi came up to her, and taking compassion on her, bespoke her kindly, and wiped away her tears. Then he gave her a barley scone, and said, I love not one who answereth at times when I am in wrath, so henceforth give me no more of these impertinent words and I will sell thee to a good man like myself, who will do well with thee, even as I have done. Yes, whatso thou dost is right, answered she. And when the night was longsome upon her, and hunger burnt her, she ate very little of that barley bread. In the middle of the night, the Badawi gave orders for departure, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 19 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2 Recording by Filippo Joachim Section 20, Volume 2 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Filippo Joaquin. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2, Section 20. When it was the fifty sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king that when the Badawi gave the barley scone to Nuzat al-Zaman and promised he would sell her to a good man like himself, she replied, Whatso thou dost is right. And about midnight, when hunger burned her, she ate a very little of that barley bread, and the Badawi ordered his party to set out. So they loaded their loads, and he mounted a camel, setting Nuzat al-Zaman behind him. Then they journeyed, and ceased not journeying for three days, till they entered the city of Damascus, and alighted at the Sultan's Khan, hard by the Viceroy's gate. Now she had lost her color by grief and the fatigue of such travelling, and she ceased not to weep over her misfortunes. So the Badawi came up to her, and said, O thou city filth! By the right of my bonnet, if thou live not this weeping, I will sell thee to none but a Jew. Then he arose, and took her by the hand, and carried her to a chamber, and walked off to the bazaar, and he went round to the merchants who dealt in slave girls, and began to parley with them, saying, I have brought a slave girl whose brother fell ill, and I sent him to my people about Jerusalem, that they might tend him till he is cured. As for her, 
I want to sell her. But after the dog, her brother fell sick. The separation from him was grievous to her, and since then she doth nothing but weep. And now I wish that whoso is minded to buy her of me, speak softly of her, and say, Thy brother is with me in Jerusalem ill, and I will be easy with him about the price. Then one of the merchants came up to him and asked, How old is she? He answered, She is a virgin, just come to marriageable age, and she is endowed with sense and breeding and wit and beauty and loveliness. But from the day I sent her brother to Jerusalem, her heart has been yearning for him, so that her beauty is fallen away and her value lessened. Now when the merchant heard this, he set forth with the Badawi and said, O Shaykh of the Arabs, I will go with thee and buy of thee this girl whom thou prayest so highly for wit and manners and beauty and loveliness, and I will pay thee her price, but it must be upon conditions which if thou accept, I will give thee ready money, and if thou accept not, I will return her to thee. Quoth Badawi, And thou wilt, Turk her up to the Sultan Sharkan, son of Omar bin al Nu'uman, lord of Baghdad and of the land of Khorasan, and condition me any conditions thou likest. For when thou hast brought her before King Sharkan, haply she will please him, and he will pay thee her price, and a good profit for thyself to boot. Rejoined the merchant. It happens that I have just now something to ask from him, and it is this that he write me an order upon the office, exempting me from custom dues, and also that he write me a letter of recommendation to his father, King Omar bin al Numan. So if he take the girl, I will weigh thee out her price at once. I agree with thee to this condition, answered the Badawi. So they returned together to the place where Nusat al-Zaman was, and the wild Arab stood at the chamber door and called out, saying, O oh, Najia, which was the name wherewith he had named her. When she heard him, she wept and made no answer. Then he turned to the merchant and said to him, There she sitteth, go to her and look at her, and speak to her kindly, as I enjoin thee. So the trader went up to her, and courteous wise, and saw that she was wondrous beautiful and lovable, especially as she knew the Arabic tongue. And he said to the Badawi, If she be even as thou saidest, I shall get of the Sultan what I will for her. Then he bespake her, Peace be on thee, my little maid. How art thou? She turned to him and replied, This also was registered in the book of destiny. Then she looked at him, and seeing him to be a man of respectable semblance, with a handsome face, she said to herself, I believe this one cometh to buy me. And she continued, If I hold aloof from him, I shall abide with my tyrant and he will do me to death with beating. In any case, this person is handsome of face, and maketh me hope for better treatment from him than from my brute of a Badawi. Maybe he cometh only to hear me talk, so I will give him a fair answer. All this while her eyes were fixed on the ground. Then she raised them to him, and said in a sweet voice, and upon thee be peace, O my Lord, and Allah's mercy and his benediction. This is what is commanded of the Prophet, whom Allah bless and preserve. As for thine inquiry, how I am, if thou wouldst know my case, it is such as thou wouldst not wish but to thy foe. And she held her peace. When the merchant heard what she said, his fancy took wings for delight in her, and turning to the Badawi, 
he asked him, What is her price? For indeed she is noble. Thereupon the Badawi waxed angry and answered, Thou wilt turn me the girl's head with this talk. Why dost thou say that she is noble, while she is of the scum of slave girls and of the refuse of folk? I will not sell her to thee. When the merchant heard this, he knew the man to be weak of wits and said to him, Calm thyself, for I will buy her of thee with these blemishes thy mentionest. And how much wilt thou give me for her? inquired the Badawi. Replied the merchant, Name thy price for her. None should name the son save his sire. Rejoined the Badawi, None shall name it but thou thyself. Quoth the merchant to himself, This wildling is a roots by and a maggoty head. By Allah, I cannot tell her price, and she hath won my heart with her fair speech and good looks. And if she can read and write, it will be complete fair luck to her and to her purchaser. But this Badawi does not know her worth. Then he turned and said to him, O Shaykh of the Arabs, I will give thee in ready money, clear of the tax and the sultan's dues, two hundred gold pieces. Now when the Badawi heard this, he flew into a violent rage and cried to the merchant, saying, Get up and go thy way. By Allah, were thou to offer me two hundred diners, for a bit of camlet she weareth, I would not sell it to thee. And now I will not sell her, but will keep her by me to pasture the camels and grind my grist. Then he cried out to her, saying, Come here, thou stinker, I will not sell thee. Then he turned to the merchant and said to him, I used to think thee a man of judgment, but by the right of my bonnet, if thou be gone not from me, I will let thee hear what shall not please thee. Quoth the merchant to himself, Of a truth, this Badawi is mad and knoweth not her value, and I will say no more to him about her price at the present time. For by Allah, were he a man of sense, he would not say, By the right of my bonnet, by the Almighty, she is worth the kingdom of the Kosroas, and I have not her price by me. But if he asked even more, I will give him what he will, though it be all my goods. Then he turned and said to him, O Shaykh of the Arabs, take patience and calm thyself, and tell me what clothes she has with thee, cried the Badawi. And what hath the baggage to do with clothes? By Allah, this camlet in which she is wrapped is ample for her. With thy leave, said the merchant, I will unveil her face and examine her even as folk examine slave girls whom they think of buying. Replied the other, Up and do what thou wilt, and Allah keep thy youth. Examine her outside and inside, and if thou wilt, strip off her clothes, and look at her when she is naked. Quoth the trader, Allah for friend, I will look at naught save her face. Then he went up to her, and was put to shame by her beauty and loveliness. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the fifty-seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the merchant went up to Nusrat al-Zaman and was put to shame by her beauty and loveliness. So he sat by her side and asked her, O my mistress, what is thy name? She answered, Dost thou ask what is my name this day or what it was before this day? Thereupon the merchant inquired, Hast thou then two names, two days and yesterdays? 
Yes, replied she, my name in the past was Nuzhat al-Zaman, the delight of the age, but my name at this present is Kusat al-Zaman, the despite of the age. When the merchant heard this, his eyes brimmed over with tears, and quoth he to her, Hast thou not a sick brother? I, by Allah, O my lord, I have, quoth she. But fortune hath parted me and him, and he lieth sick in Jerusalem. The merchant's head was confounded at the sweetness of her speech, and he said to himself, Verily, the Badawi spake the truth of her. Then she called to mind her brother and his sickness, and his strangerhood and her separation from him in his hour of weakness and her not knowing what had befallen him. And she thought of all that had happened to her with the Badawi, and of her severance from her mother and father and native land. And the tears coursed down her cheeks, and fast as they started, they dropped. Then she began reciting, Allah, where are thou be, his aid impart to thee who distant dwellest in my heart. Allah, be near thee, how so far thou fare. Ward off all shifts of time, all dangers thwart. Mine eyes are desolate for thy vanished sight. And start my tears saw me, how fast they start. Would heaven I kenned, what quarter or what land homes thee, and in what house and tribe thou art, and fount of life thou drain in greeneth of rose, while drink I tears drops for my soul desert? And thou joys lumber in those hours, when I peel twixt my side and couch coals burning smart. All things were easy, save to part from thee, for my sad heart this grief is hard to dree. When the merchant heard her verses, he wept, and put out his hand to wipe away the tears from her cheeks. But she let down her veil over her face, saying, Heaven forbid, O my lord. Then the Badawi, who was sitting at a little distance watching them, saw her cover her face from the merchant, while about to wipe the tears from her cheeks. And he concluded, that she would have hindered him from handling her. So he rose and running to her, dealt her with a camel's halter he had in his hand, such a blow on the shoulders that she fell onto the ground on her face. Her eyebrow struck a stone which cut it open, and the blood streamed down her cheeks, whereupon she screamed a loud scream and felt faint and wept bitterly. The merchant was moved to tears for her, and said in himself, There is no help for it, but that I buy this damsel, though at her weight in gold, and free her from this tyrant. And he began to revel the Badawi, whilst the Nusat al-Zaman lay insensible. When she came to herself, she wiped away the tears and blood from her face, and she bound up her head. Then, raising her glance to heaven, she besought her lord with a sorrowful heart, and began repeating, And pity one who earnest in honor throve, and now is fallen into sore disgrace. She weeps and baths her cheeks with railing tears, and asks, What cure can meet this fatal case? When she had ended her verse, she turned to the merchant and said in an undertone, By the Almighty, do not leave me with the tyrant who knoweth not Allah the Most High. If I pass this night in his place, I shall kill myself with my own end. Save me from him, so Allah save thee from Gehenna fire. Then quoth the merchant to the Badawi, O Shaykh of the Arabs, this slave is none of thine affair, 
so do thou sell her to me for what thou wilt. Take her, quoth the Badawi, and pay me down her price, or I will carry her back to the camp, and there set her to feed the camels, and gather thy dung. Said the merchant, I will give thee fifty thousand dinars for her. Allah will open, replied the Badawi. Seventy thousand, said the merchant. Allah will open, repeated the Badawi. This is not the capital spent upon her, for she hath eaten with me barley bread to the value of ninety thousand gold pieces. The merchant rejoined, Thou and thine and all thy tribe in the length of your lives have not eaten a thousand ducats worth of barley. But I will say thee one word, wherewith if thou be not satisfied, I will set the viceroy of Damascus on thee, and he will take her from thee by force. The Badawi continued, Say on. An hundred thousand, quoth the merchant, I have sold her to thee at that price, answered the Badawi. I shall be able to buy salt with her. The merchant laughed, and going to his lodgings, brought the money and put it into the hand of the Badawi, who took it and made off, saying to himself, Needs must I go to Jerusalem, where, haply, I shall happen on her brother, and I will bring him here, and sell him also. So he mounted, and journeyed till he arrived at Jerusalem, where he went to the Khan, and asked for Zaw al Makan, but could not find him. Such was the case with him, but for what regards the merchant and Nuzat al Zaman, when he took her, he threw some of his clothes over her, and carried her to his lodgings. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 20 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2 Recording by Filippo Joachim Section 21, Volume 2 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2, Section 21. When it was the fifty-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king that when the trader saved Nusat al-Saman from the Badawi and bore her to his lodgings and robed her in the richest raiment, he went down with her to the bazaar where he bought her what ornaments she chose and put them in a satin bag which he set before her, saying, All is for thee, and I ask nothing of thee in return but that when I lead thee to the Sultan, Viceroy of Damascus, thou acquaint him with the price i paid for thee albeit it was little compared with thy value and if seeing thee he buy thee of me thou tell him how i have dealt with thee and ask of him for me a royal patent and a written recommendation wherewith i can repair to his father king omar bin al nu'uman lord of baghdad to the intent that he may forbid the tax on my stuff or any other goods in which I traffic. When she heard his words, she wept and sobbed, and the merchant said to her, O oh, my lady, I observe that every time I mention Baghdad, thine eyes are tearful. Is there any one there whom thou lovest? If it be a trader or the like, tell me, for I know all the merchants, and so forth there, and if thou wouldst send him a message, I will bear it for thee. Replied she, By Allah, I have no acquaintance among merchant folk and the like. I know none there but King Omar bin Nu'uman, Lord of Baghdad. 
When the merchant heard her words, he laughed and rejoiced with exceeding joy, and said in himself, By Allah, I have won my wish. Then he said to her, Hast thou been shown to him in time past? She answered, No, but I was brought up with his daughter, and he holdeth me dear, and I have high honour with him. So if thou wouldst have the king grant thee thy desire, give me ink, case, and paper, and I will write thee a letter. And when thou reachest the city of Baghdad, do thou deliver it into the hand of King Omar bin al Nu'uman, and say to him, Thy handmaid, Nusat al Saman, would have thee to know that the chances and changes of the nights and days have struck her as with a hammer, and have smitten her, so that she hath been sold from place to place, and she sendeth thee her salams. And if he ask further of her, say that I am now with the viceroy at Damascus. The merchant wondered at her eloquence, and his affection for her increased, and he said to her, I cannot but think that men have played upon thine understanding, and sold thee for money. Tell me, dost thou know the Koran by heart? Yes, answered she, and I am also acquainted with the philosophy and medicine, and the prolegomena of science, and the commentaries of Galen, the physician, on the canons of Hippocrates, and I have commented him, and I have read the Taskira, and have commented the Burhan, and I have studied the simples of Ibn Baytar, and I have something to say of the canon of Mecca by Avicenna. I can read riddles, and I can solve ambiguities, and discourse upon geometry, and am skilled in anatomy. I have read the books of the Shafi'i school, and the traditions of the Prophet, and syntax and i can argue with the ulema and discourse of all manner learning moreover i am skilled in logic and rhetoric and arithmetic and the making of talismans and almanacs and i know thoroughly the spiritual sciences and the times appointed for religious duties and i understand all these branches of knowledge then quoth she to the merchant Bring me ink, case, and paper, that I write thee a letter which will aid thee on thy journey to Baghdad, and enable thee to do without passports. Now when the merchant heard this, he cried out, Brava, brava! Then, O happy, he in whose palace thou shalt! Thereupon he brought her paper and ink, case and a pen of brass and bussed the earth before her face to do her honour she took a sheet and handled the reed and wrote therewith these verses i see all power of sleep from eyes of me hath flown say did thy parting teach this eyne on wake to bone what makes thy memory light such burnings in my heart hath every lover strength such memories to own. How sweet the big dropped cloud which rained on summer day, tis gone, and ere I taste its sweets afar tis flown. I pray the wind with windy breath to bring some news from thee to lover white we love so woe begone. Complains to thee a lover of all hope forlorn, for parting pangs can break not only heart but stone. And when she had ended writing these verses, she continued, These words are from her who saith that melancholy destroyeth her, and that watching wasteth her, in the murk of whose night is found no light, and darkness and day are the same in her sight. She tosseth on the couch of separation, and her eyes are blackened with the pencils of sleeplessness. She watcheth the stars arise, and into the gloom she strains her eyes. Verily, sadness and leanness have consumed her strength. 
and the setting forth of her case would run to length no helper hath she but tears and she reciteth these verses no ring dove moans from home on branch in morning light but shakes my very frame with sorrow's killing might no lover sighteth for his love or gladdeth heart to meet his mate but breeds in me redoubled blight i bear my plaint to one who has no ruth for me ah me how love can part man's mortal frame and sprite then her eyes welled over with tears, and she wrote also these two couplets. Love smote my frame so sore on parting day, That severance severed sleep and eyes for a. I I waxed so lean that I'm still a man, But for my speaking thou wouldst never say. Then she shed tears and wrote at the foot of the sheet, this cometh from her who is far from her folk and her native land the sorrowful hearted woman nusat al saman in fine she folded the sheet and gave it to the merchant who took it and kissed it and understood its contents and exclaimed glory to him who fashioned thee and shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say when it was the fifty-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Nusat al-Saman wrote the letter, and gave it to the merchant, and he took it and read it, and understood the contents, and exclaimed, Glory to him who fashioned thee! Then he redoubled his kindness, and made himself pleasant to her all that day, and when night came, he sallied out to the bazaar and bought some food, wherewith he fed her, after which he carried her to the hammam and said to the bathwoman, As soon as thou hast made an end of washing her head, dress her and send, and let me know of it. And she replied, Hearing is obeying. Meanwhile he fetched food and fruit and wax candles, and set them on the bench in the outer room of the bath. And when the tire-woman had done washing her, she dressed her and led her out of the bath and seated her on the bench. Then she sent to tell the merchant, and Numat al-Saman went forth to the outer room, where she found the tray spread with food and fruit. So she ate, and the tire-woman with her, and gave the rest to the people and keeper of the bath. Then she slept till the morning, and the merchant lay the night in a place apart from her. When he aroused himself from sleep, he came to her, and waking her, presented her with stuff of fine stuff, and a head kerchief worth a thousand dinars, a suit of Turkish embroidery, and walking boots purfled with red gold and set with pearls and gems. Moreover, he hung in each of her ears a circlet of gold, with a fine pearl therein, worth a thousand dinars, and threw round her neck a collar of gold, with bosses of garnet, and a chain of amber beads, that hung down between her breasts over her navel. Now to this chain were attached ten balls and nine crescents, and each crescent had in its midst a bezel of ruby, and each ball a bezel of balas, the value of the chain was three thousand dinars, and each of the balls were priced at twenty thousand dirhams, so that the dress she wore was worth in all a great sum of money. When she had put these on, the merchant bade her adorn herself, and she adorned herself to the utmost beauty, then she let fall her fillet over her eyes, and she fared forth with the merchant preceding her. But when folk saw her, all wondered at her beauty, and exclaimed, Blessed be Allah, the most excellent creator! O lucky the man in whose house the hall be! And the trader ceased not walking, and she behind him, 
till they entered the palace of Sultan Sharkan, when he sought an audience, and, kissing the earth between his hands, said, O auspicious king, I have brought thee a rare gift, unmatched in this time, and richly gifted, with beauty and with good qualities. Quoth the king, Let me see it. So the merchant went out and brought her, she following him till he made her stand before King Sharkan. When he beheld her, blood yearned to blood, though she had been parted from him in childhood, and though he had never seen her, having only heard a long time after her birth that he had a sister called Nusat al-Saman, and a brother Sa'u al-Makan, he having been jealous of them because of the succession. And such was the cause of his knowing little about them. Then, having placed her before the presence, the merchant said, O king of the age, besides being peerless in her time and beauty and loveliness, she is also versed in all learning, sacred and profane, including the art of government and the abstract sciences. Quoth the king to the trader, Take her price according as thou boughtest her, and go thy ways. I hear and I obey, replied the merchant, but first write me a patent, exempting me for ever from paying tith on my merchandise. Said the king, I will do this, but first tell me what price thou paidest for her. Said the merchant, I bought her for an hundred thousand dinars, and her clothes cost me another hundred thousand. When the sultan heard these words, he declared, I will give thee a higher price than this for her. And calling his treasurer, said to him, Pay this merchant three hundred and twenty thousand ducats, so will he have an hundred and twenty thousand dinars profit. Thereupon the sultan summoned the four kazis and paid him the money in their presence, and then he said, I call you to witness that I free this my slave girl and purpose to marry her. So the kazis wrote out the deed of emancipation and the contract of marriage, when the sultan scattered much gold on the head of those present, and the pages and the eunuchs picked up this largesse. Then, after paying him his monies, Sharkan bade them write for the merchant a perpetual patent, exempting him from toll, tax, or tith upon his merchandise, and forbidding each and every in all his government to molest him, and lastly bestowed on him a splendid dress of honour. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 21 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2 Read by Lars Rolander Section 22, Volume 2 of the Book A Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Werte Spike Fogarty. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2, Section 22. When it was the sixtieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that King Sharrakhan bade them write for the merchant a mandate, after paying him his monies. And they wrote a perpetual patent, exempting him from the tithe upon his merchandise, and forbidding any in his government to molest him, and lastly bestowed upon him a splendid dress of honor. Then all about him retired, and none remained, save the Kazis and the merchant. Whereupon said he to the judges, I wish you to hear such discourse from this damsel as may prove her knowledge and accomplishments in all aimed for her by this traitor, that we ascertain the truth of this assertions. They answered, There is no evil in that and he commanded the curtain to be let down between him and those with him, and the maiden and those with her, and the women about the damsel behind the curtains began to wish her joy and kiss her hands and feet, when they learned that she was become the king's wife. Then they came round her, and took off her dresses, easing her of the weight 
of her clothes and began to look upon her beauty and loveliness. Presently the wives of the emirs and the wazirs heard that King Sharkan had bought a handmaiden, unmatched for her beauty and learning and philosophy and account-keeping, and versed in all branches of knowledge, that he had paid for her three hundred and twenty thousand dinars, and that he had set her free, and had written a marriage contract with her, and had summoned the four kazis to make trial of her, and how she would answer all their questions and hold disputations with them. So they asked leave of their husbands, and repaired to the palace, whereupon was Nuzhat al-Zaman. When they came into her, they found the eunuch standing before her, and as soon as she saw the wives of the emirs and the wazirs and the grandees of the realm coming to call upon her, she rose to them on her feet and met them with courtesy, her handmaidens standing behind her, and she received them, saying, Ye be welcome. The while she smiled in their faces so as to win their hearts, and she promised them all manner of good and seated them in their proper stations as if she had been brought up with them. So all wondered at her beauty and loveliness and said to one another, this damsel is none other than a queen, the daughter of a king. Then they sat down, magnifying her worth, and said to her, O oh, our lady, this our city is illuminated by thee, and our country and abode and birth, place and reign are honored by thy presence. The kingdom indeed is thy palace, and we all are thy handmaids. So, by Allah, do not shut us out from thy favors, and thy sight of thy beauty. And she thanked them for this. All this while the curtains were let down between Nuzat al-Zaman and the woman with her, on the one side, and the king Shurikan, and the four Kazis and the merchant seated by him on the other. Presently king Shurikan called to her and said, O queen, the glory of thine age, this merchant hath described thee as being learned and accomplished, and he claimeth that thou art skilled in all branches of knowledge, even to astrology. So let us hear something of all this he hath mentioned, and favor us with a short discourse on such subjects. She replied, saying, O king, to hear is to obey. The first subject whereof I will treat are the art of government and the duties of the kings, and what behooveth the governors of commanding meats according to religious law, and what is incumbent on them in respects of satisfactory speech and manners. Know then, O king, that all men's work tends either to religious or to laical life, though none attaineth to religion save through this world, because it is the best road to futurity. Now the works of this world are not ordered save by the doings of its people, and the men's doings are divided into four divisions, government, commerce, husbandry, and craftsmanship. Now government requireth perfect administration with just and true judgment, for government is the pivot of the edifice of the world, which world is the road to futurity. Since Allah Almighty hath made for the world his servants as viaticum to the traveller for the attainment of his goal, and it befitteth each man that he receive of it such measure as shall bring him to Allah, and that he follow not herein his own mind and his individual lust. If the folk would take of worldly goods with justice and equity, all cause of contention would be cut off, but they take thereof with violence, and after their own desires and their persistence therein gives rise to contentions. So they have need of the sultan, that he do justice between them and order their affairs, and if the king restrain not his folk from one another, they strong will drive the weak to the wall. Hence Adirshir said, Religion and kingship, the twins' religion, is a hidden treasure to the king. It is its keeper, and the divine ordinances and men's intelligence puts it out that it behooveth the people to adopt a sultan who shall withhold oppressor from the oppressed and do the weak justice against the strong and restrain the violence of the proud and the rebels against rule. For know, O king, that according to the measures of the sultan's good morals, even so will be the time as saith the apostles of Allah, who, on whom the peace and salvation, there be two classes, who, if they be good, the people will be good, and if they be bad, the people will be bad, even the ulema and the emirs. And it is said by a certain sage, there be three kinds of kings, the king of the faith, the king who protecteth things to which reverence is due, and the king of his own lusts. The king of the faith obligeth his subjects to follow their faith, and it behooveth he be the most faithful. 
for it is by him that they take pattern in the things of the faith, and it becometh the folk to obey him in whatsoever commandeth according to divine ordinance. But he shall hold the discontented in the same esteem as the contented, because of submission to the decrees of destiny. As for the king who protecteth things to be reverenced, he upholdeth the things of the faith and of the world, compelleth his folk to follow the divine law to preserve the rights of humanity, and it fitteth him to unite pen and sword, for whoso declineth from that pen hath written his feet slip, and the king shall rectify his error with the sharp sword, and dispread his justice over all mankind. As for the king of his own lust, he hath no religion, but the following his desire, and as he feareth not the wrath of his lord who sent him on the throne. So his kingdom inclineth to disposition, and at the end his pride is in the house of perdition, and sages say, The king hath need of many people, but the king have need of but one king. Wherefore it beseemeth that he be well acquainted with their natures, that he reduce their discord to concord, that with his justice he encompasses them all, and with his bounties overwhelm them all. Know, O king, that Adashir styled Jamir Shadid, or the live coal, third of the kings of Persia, conquered the whole world, and divided it into four divisions, and for this purpose get for himself four seal rings, one for each division. The first seal was that of C, and the police of prohibition, and on it was written Alterna Lives. The second was the seal of tribute, and of the receipt of monies, and on it was written Building Up. The third was the seal of the provisioning department, and on it was written Plenty. The fourth seal was the seal of the oppressed, and on it was written Justice. And these usages remained valid in Persia until the revelation of Al-Islam. Krosros also wrote his son, who was with the army, Be not thou too open-handed with the troops, or they will be too rich to need thee. And Shrathrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the sixty-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Krosros wrote his son, Be not thou too open-handed with thy troops, or they will be too rich to need thee, nor be thou niggardly, with them, or they will murmur against thee. Give thy giving deliberately, and confer thy favors advisedly. Open thy hand to them in time of success, and stint them not in time of distress. There is a legend that the desert Arab came once to the Caliph al-Mansur, and said, Starve thy dog, and he shall follow thee. When the Caliph heard his words, he was enraged with the Arab. But Abu al-Abbas of Tus said to him, I fear that if some other than thou should show him a scone, the dog would follow him and leave thee alone. Thereupon the caliph al Mansur's wrath subsided, and when he knew that the wild Arab had intended no offense, and ordered him a present, and know, O king, that Abd al-Malik bin Maran wrote to his brother Abd al-Aziz when he dispatched him to Egypt, as follows, Pay heed to thy secretaries and thy chamberlains, for the secretaries will acquaint thee with the estate of finished matters and the chamberlains with matters of official ceremony, whilst thine expenditure will make thy troops known to thee. Omar bin al-Khattab, whom Allah accept, when engaging a servant, was in the habit of conditioning him with four conditions. The first, that he should not ride the baggage beast. The second, that he should not wear fine clothes. The third, that he should not eat the spoil and the fourth that he should not put off praying until after the proper period. It is said that there is no wealth more profitable than understanding, and there is no understanding like common sense and prudence, and there is no prudence like piety, that there is no means of drawing near to God like good morals, no measure like good breeding, no traffic like good works, and no profit like earning the divine favor, that there is no temperance like standing within the limits of the law, no science like that of meditation, no worship like obeying the divine commands, no faith like modesty, no calculation like self-abasement, and no honor like knowledge. So guard the head and what it containeth, the belly and what it compriseth, and think of death and doom ere it ariseth. Saith Ali, whose face Allah honor, beware of the wickedness of women, and be on thy guard against them. 
consult them not in aught, but grudge not complacence to them, lest they agreed for intrigue. And eke quoth he, Whoso leaveth the path of moderation, his wits become perplexed, and there be rules for this, which we will mention. If it be Allah's will, and Omar, who Allah accept, saith, There are three kinds of women. Firstly, the true believing, heaven-fearing, loveful and fruitful, who helpeth her mate against fate, not helping fate against her mate. Secondly, she who loveth her children, but no more. And lastly, she who is shackle Allah setteth on the neck of whom he will. Men be also three. The wise when he exerciseth his own judgment, the wiser who, when befalleth somewhat whereof he knoweth not the issue, seeketh the folk of good counsel, and acteth by their advice. And the wise irresolute ignoring the right way, nor heeding those who would guide him straight. Justice is indispensable in all things. Even slave girls have need of justice. And men quote, as an instance highway robbers who live by violent mankind, for did not deal equitably among themselves, and observe justice in dividing their booty, their order would fall to pieces. In short, for the rest, the prince of noble qualities is beneficence, come benevolence, and how excellent is the saying of the poet, by open hand and ruth, the youth rose to his tribe's command. Go and do likewise, for the same were easy task to thee. And quoth another, In ruth and mildness surety lies, and mercy wins respect. And truth is best asylum for the man of soothfast soul, whoso for wealth of gold would win and wear the world's good word, on glory's course must ever be the first to gain the goal. And Nazhat al-Zaman discovered upon the policy of the kings till the bystanders said, Never have we seen one reason of rule and government like this damsel. Happily she will let us hear some discourse upon subject other than this. When she heard their words and understood them, she said, As for the chapter of good breeding, it is wide of comprehension being a compend of things perfect. Now it so happened that one day there came Caliph Mu'ayuyah, one of his companions who mentioned the rank of Iraq and the goodness of their wit, and the Caliph's wife, Maysun, mother of Yezid, heard his words, so when he was gone, she said to the Caliph, O Prince of the Faithful, I would thou let some of the people of Iraq come in and talk to thee, that I may hear their discourse. Therewith Mu'ayuyah said to his attendants, See who is at the door, and they answered, the Banu Tamim. Let them come in, said he. So they came in, and with them al Anafaf, son of Kays. Then quoth mu Aweya, Enter, O Abu Bar, and drew a curtain between himself and Mesum, that she might hear what they said without being seen herself. Then he said to al Anaf, O son of Si, draw near, and tell me what counsel thou hast for me. Quoth al Anaf, Part thy hair, and trim thy mustachio, and pare thy nails, and pluck thine armpits, and shave thy pubes, and ever use the toothpick, because therein be two and seventy virtues, and make the gusul or complete absolution on Friday, as an expiation for all between the Fridays, and Shah-Razid perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the sixty-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Anaf bin Kiz replied to al mu Awayaz, question, and ever use the toothpick, because therein be two and seventy virtues, and make the complete Friday absolution as an expiation for all between the two Fridays, quoth mu Awayah. What is thy counsel to thyself? To set my feet firmly on the ground, to move them deliberately, and watch over them with mine eyes? How dost thou order thyself, when thou goest into one not of thy nobles and of thy tribe? I lower mine eyes modestly, and I salute first. I avoid what concerneth me not, and I spare my words. And how when thou goest into thine equals, I give ear to them when they speak, and I do not assail them when they err. When thou goest into thy chiefs, I salute them without making any sign, and await the reply. If they bid me draw near, I draw near, and if they draw off from me, I withdraw. How dost thou with thy wife, quoth Anaf, Excuse me from answering this, O commander of the faithful, but 
Mu Awayu cried. I conjure thee, inform me, he said. I entreat her kindly, and show her familiarity, and I am large in expenditure, for woman was created of a crooked rib. And how dost thou, when thou hast a mind to lie with her? I bid her perfume herself, and kiss her till she is moved to desire. Then should it be, as thou knowest, I throw her on her back. If the seed abide in her womb, I say, O Allah, make it blessed, and let it not be wastrel, but fashion it into the best of fashions. Then I rise from her to absolution, and first I pour water over my hands, and then over my body, and lastly I praise Allah for the joy he hath given me, said Mu'uweo. Thou hast answered right well, and now tell me what thy requirements, said Anaf. I would have thee rule thy subjects in the fear of Allah, and do even-handed justice between them. Thereupon Anaf rose to his feet, and left the caliph's presence. And when he had gone, Maysun said, Where there but this man in Iraq, he would suffice it. Then continued Nuzat al-Zaman, All this is a section of the chapter of good breeding, and know, O king, that Muyakib was intendant of the public treasury. During the caliphate of Omar bin al-Khattab, and Shazrad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to her permitted to say, End of section 22 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2. Recorded by Huerta Spike Fogarty, Berea, Kentucky. Section 23, Volume 2 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night. Translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashwath Kanation. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2, Section 23. When it was the sixty-third night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Nuzat al-Zaman continued, no, O king, that Mu'ekib was intendant of the public treasury during the caliphate of Omar bin al-Khattab, and it so befell him that he saw Omar's son and gave him a dirham out of the treasury. Thereupon, quoth Mu'ekib, I returned to my own house, and while I was sitting there, behold, a messenger came to me from Omar, and I was afraid and went to him. And when I came into his presence, in his hand was the diram I had given his son. He said to me, Woe to thee, Mu'ekib! I have found somewhat concerning thy soul. I asked, And what is that? And he answered, It is that thou hast shown thyself a foe to the followers of Muhammad, on whom be peace and salvation, in the matter of this diram, and thou wilt have to account for it on resurrection day. And Omar also wrote a letter to Abu Musa al-Ashari as follows. When these presents reach thee, give the people what is theirs, and remit to me the rest. And he did so. Now, when Uthman succeeded to the caliphate, he wrote a like letter to Abu Musa, who did this bidding, and sent him the tribute accordingly. And with it came Ziyad. And when Ziyad laid the tribute before Uthman, the caliph's son came in and took a diram. Whereupon Ziad shed tears. Uthman asked, Why weepest thou? And Ziad answered, I once brought Omar bin al-Khattab the like of this, and his son took a diram. Whereupon Omar bade snatch it from his hand. Now thy son hath taken of the tribute, yet I have seen none say aught to him, or snatch the money from him. Then Uthman cried, And where wilt thou find the like of Omar? Again, Zaid bin Aslam relates of his father that he said, I went out one night with Omar till we approached a blazing fire. Quoth Omar, O Aslam, I think these must be travelers who are suffering from the cold. Come, let us join them. So we walked on till we came to them, and behold, we found a woman who had lighted a fire under a cauldron, and by her side were two children, both a-wailing. Said Omar, Peace be with you, O folk of light, for it was repugnant to him to say folk of fire. What aileth you? Said she, The cold and the night trouble us. 
he asked, What aileth these little people that they weep? And she answered, They are hungry. He inquired, And what is in this cauldron? And she replied, It is what I quiet them withal, and Allah will question Omar bin al-Khattab of them on the day of doom. He said, And what should Omar know of their case? Why then, rejoined she, should he manage people's affairs and yet be unmindful of them? Thereupon Omar turned to me, continued Aslam, and cried, Come with us! So we set off running till we reached the pay department of his treasury, where he took out a sack containing flour and a pot holding fat, and said to me, Load these on my back. Quoth I, O commander of the faithful, I will carry them for thee. He rejoined, Wilt thou bear my load for me on the day of resurrection? So I put the things on his back, and we set off, running, till we threw down the sack hard by her. Then he took out some of the flour, and put it in the cauldron, and saying to the woman, Leave it to me, he began blowing the fire under the cauldron. Now he was a long-bearded man, and I saw the smoke issuing from between the hairs of his beard till the flour was cooked, when he took some of the fat and threw it in and said to the woman, Bed them while I cool it for them. So they fell to eating till they had eaten their fill, and he left the rest with her. Then he turned to me and said, O oh, Aslam, I see it was indeed hunger made them weep, and I am glad I did not go away ere I found out the cause of the light I saw. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the sixty-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Nuzat al-Zaman continued. It is related that Omar passed by a flock of sheep kept by a Mameluk, and asked him to sell him a sheep. He answered, They are not mine. Thou art the man I sought, said Omar, and bought him and freed him. Whereupon the slave exclaimed, O oh Allah, as thou hast bestowed upon me the lesser emancipation, so vouchsafe me the greater. It is also said that Omar bin al-Khattab was wont to give his servants sweet milk, and himself eat coarse fare, and to clothe them softly, and himself wear rough garments. He rendered unto all men their due, and exceeded in his giving to them. He once gave a man four thousand dirhams, and added thereto a thousand. Wherefore it was said to him, Why dost thou not increase to thy son as thou increasest to this man? He answered, This man's father stood firm at the battle of Ohod. Al-Hassan relates that Omar once came back from Foray with much money, and that Hafsa approached him and said, O commander of the faithful, the due of kinship. O Hafsa, replied he, Verily Allah hath enjoined us to satisfy the dues of kinship, but not with the monies of the true believers. Indeed, thou pleasest thy family, but thou angerest thy father. And she went away, trailing her skirts. The son of Omar said, I implored the Lord to show me my father one year after his death, till at last I saw him wiping the sweat from his brow, and asked him, How is it with thee, O my father? He answered, but for my Lord's mercy, thy father surely had perished. Then said Nuzat al-Zaman, Hear, O auspicious king, the second division of the first chapter of the instances of the followers of the apostle and other holy men. Saith al-Hasan al-Basri, Not a soul of the sons of Adam goeth forth of the world without regretting three things, failure to enjoy what he hath amassed, failure to compass what he had hoped, Failure to provide himself with sufficient viaticum for that hereto he goeth. It was said of Sufyan, Can a man be a religious and yet possess wealth? He replied, Yes, so he be patient when grieved, and be thankful when he hath received. Abdullah bin Shaddad, being about to die, sent for his son Muhammad and admonished him, saying, O oh, my son, I see the summoner of death summoning me. And so I charge thee to fear Allah, both in public and in private, to praise Allah, and to be soothfast in thy speech, for such praise bringeth increase of prosperity, and piety in itself is the best of provision for the next world. Even as saith one of the poets, I see not happiness lies in gathering gold, 
the man most pious is man happiest. In truth, the fear of God is best of stores, and God shall make the pious choicely blessed. Then, quoth Nuzrat al-Saman, let the king also give ear to these notes from the second section of the first chapter. He asked her, What be they? And she answered, When Omar bin Abd al-Aziz succeeded to the caliphate, he went to his household, and laying hands on all that was in their hold, put it into the public treasury. So the Banu Umayyah flew for aid to his father's sister, Fatima, daughter of Marwan. And she sent to him, saying, I must need speak to thee. So she came to him by night, and when he had made her all right from her beast and sit down, he said to her, O aunt, it is for thee to speak first, since thou hast something to ask. Tell me then what thou wouldst with me. Replied she, O commander of the faithful, it is thine to speak first, for thy judgment perceiveth that which is hidden from the intelligence of others. Then said Omar, Of a verity Allah Almighty sent Muhammad as a blessing to some and a bane to others, and he elected for him those with him and commissioned him as his apostle, and took him to himself. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the sixty-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Nuzat al-Zaman continued thus. Said Omar, Verily, Allah commissioned as his apostle Muhammad, upon whom be the benediction of Allah and his salvation, for a blessing to some, and a bane to others. And he elected for him those with him, and took him to himself, leaving the people a stream whereof they might drink. After him, Abu Bakr, the truth-teller, became caliph, and he left the river as it was, doing what was pleasing to Allah. Then arose Omar, and worked to work, and strove in holy war and strife, whereof none might do the like. But when Uthman arose to power, he diverted a streamlet from the stream, and Muyawiya in his turn diverted from it several streamlets, and without ceasing in like manner, Yazid and the Banu Marwan, such as Abd al-Malik and Walid and Suleiman, drew away water from the stream, and the main course dried up till rule devolved upon me, and now I am minded to restore the stream to its normal condition. When Fatima heard this, she said, I came wishing only to speak and confer with thee, but if this be thy word, I have nothing to say to thee. Then she returned to the Omiyadis and said to them, Now take ye the consequences of your act when ye allied yourselves by marriage with Omar bin al-Khattab. And it is also said that when Omar was about to die, he gathered his children round him, and Maslama bin Abd al-Malik said to him, O Prince of the Faithful, how wilt thou leave thy children paupers, and thou their protector? None can hinder thee in thy lifetime from giving them what will suffice them out of the treasury. And this, indeed, were better than leaving the good work to him who shall rule after thee. Omar looked at him with a look of wrath and wonder, and presently replied, O Maslama, I have defended them from this sin all the days of my life, and shall I make them miserable after my death? Of a truth, my sons are like other men, either obedient to Almighty Allah who will prosper them, or disobedient, and I will not help them in their disobedience. Know, O Maslama, that I was present, even as thou, when such an one of the sons of Marwanas was buried. And I fell asleep by him, and saw him in a dream given over to one of the punishments of Allah, to whom belong honor and glory. This terrified me and made me tremble, and I vowed to Allah that if ever I came to power, I would not do such deeds as the dead man had done. I have striven to fulfill this vow all the length of my life, and I hope to die in the mercy of my Lord. Quoth Maslama, A certain man died, and I was present at his burial. And when all was over, I fell asleep, and I saw him as a sleeper seeth a dream, walking in a garden of flowing waters clad in white clothes. He came up to me and said, O Maslama, it is for the like of this that rulers should rule. Many are the instances of this kind, and quoth one of the men of authority, I used to milk the ewes in the caliphate of Omar bin Abd al-Aziz, 
And one day I met a shepherd, among whose sheep I saw a wolf, or wolves. I thought them to be dogs, for I had never before seen wolves. So I asked, What dost thou with these dogs? They are not dogs but wolves, answered the shepherd. Quoth I, Can wolves be with sheep and not hurt them? Quoth he, When the head is whole, the body is whole. Omar bin Abd al-Aziz once preached from a pulpit of clay, and after praising and glorifying Allah Almighty, said three words as follows. O folk, make clean your inmost hearts, that your outward lives may be dean to your brethren, and abstain ye from the things of the world. Know that between us and Adam there is no one man alive among the dead. Dead are Abd al-Malik and those who forewent him and Omar also shall die, and those who forewent him. Asked Maslama, O commander of the faithful, an we set a pillow behind thee, will thou lean upon it a little while? But Omar answered, I fear lest it be a fault about my neck on resurrection day. Then he grasped with the death rattle, and fell back in a faint, whereupon Fatima cried out, saying, Ho Maryam, ho Muzahim, O oh, such a one, look to this man! And she began to pour water on him, weeping, till he revived from his swoon, and, seeing her in tears, said to her, What causeth thee to weep, O Fatima? She replied, O commander of the faithful, I saw thee lying prostrate before us, and thought of thy prostration in death before Almighty Allah, of thy departure from this world, and of thy separation from us. This is what made me weep. Answered he, Enough, O Fatima, for indeed thou exceedest. Then he would have risen, but fell down. And Fatima strained him to her, and said, Thou art to me as my father and my mother, O commander of the faithful. We cannot speak to thee, all of us. Then, quoth Nuzat al-Zaman to her brother Sharkan and the four Qazis, Here endeth the second section of the first chapter. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 23 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2. Recording by Ashwath Ganeshan. Section 24, Volume 2 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night. Translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kalinda. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2, Section 24. When it was the sixty-sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Nuzat al-Zaman said to her brother Sharkan and the four Kazis, here endeth the second section of the first chapter. And it so happened that Omar bin Abd al-Aziz wrote to the people of the festival at Mecca as follows. I call Allah to witness in this holy month, in the holy city, and on the day of the greater pilgrimage, that I am innocent of your oppression and of his wrongs that doth wrong you, in that I have neither commanded this nor purposed it, neither hath any report of aught thereof hitherto reached me, nor have I compassed any knowledge thereof. And I trust that a cause for pardon will be found, in that none hath authority from me to oppress any man, for I shall assuredly be questioned concerning every one oppressed. And if any of my officers swerve from the right, and act otherwise than the holy book and the traditions of the apostle do authorize, obey him not, so that he may return to the way of righteousness. He said also, Allah accept of him, I do not wish to be relieved from death, because it is the supreme thing for which the true believer is rewarded. Quoth one of authority, I went to the prince of the faithful, Omar bin Abd al-Aziz, who was then caliph, and saw before him twelve dirhams, which he ordered for deposit in the public treasury. So I said to him, O commander of the faithful, thou impoverishest thy children, and reducest them to beggary, having nothing whereon to live on and thou wouldst appoint somewhat by will to them and to those who are poor of the people of thy house, it were well. Draw near to me, answered he. So I drew near to him, and he said, Now as for thy saying, thou beggarest thy children, provide for them and for the poor of thy household, 
it is without reason, for Allah, of a truth, will replace me to my children and to the poor of my house, and he will be their guardian. Verily, they are like other men, he who feareth Allah, right soon will Allah provide for him a happy issue, and he that is addicted to sins, I will not hold him in his sin against Allah. Then he summoned his sons, who numbered twelve, and when he beheld them, his eyes dropped tears, and presently he said to them, Your father is between two things. Either ye will be well-to-do, and your parent will enter the fire, or ye will be poor, and your parent will enter paradise. And your father's entry into paradise is liefer to him than that ye should be well-to-do. So arise and go, Allah be your helper, for to him I commit your affairs. Yusuf bin Omar accompanied me to Hisham bin Abd al-Malik, and as I met him, he was coming forth with his kinsmen and attendants. He alighted, and a tent was pitched for him. When the people had taken their seats, I came up to the side of the carpet whereon he sat reclining, and looked at him. And waiting till my eyes met his eyes, bespoke him thus, May Allah fulfill his bounty to thee, O commander of the faithful. I have an admonition for thee, which hath come down to us from the history of the kings preceding thee. At this he sat up, when as he had been reclining, and said to me, Bring what thou hast, O son of Safwan. Quoth I, O commander of the faithful, one of the kings before thee went forth in a time before this thy time, to this very country, and said to his companions, Saw ye ever any state like mine, and say me, Hath such case been given to any man, even as it hath been given unto me? Now there was with him a man of those who survived to bear testimony to truth, upholders of the right and wayfarers in its highway. And he said to him, O king, thou askest of a grave matter, wilt thou give me leave to answer? Yes, replied the king, and the other said, Dost thou judge thy present state to be short-lasting or everlasting? It is temporary, replied the king. How then, rejoined the man, do I see thee exulting in that which thou wilt enjoy, but a little while and whereof thou wilt be questioned for a long while, and for the rendering an account whereof thou shalt be as a pledge which is pawned? Quoth the king, Whither shall I flee, and what must I seek for me? That thou abide in thy kingship, replied the other, or else robe thee in rags, and apply thyself to obey Almighty Allah thy Lord until thine appointed hour. I will come to thee again at daybreak. Khalid bin Safwan further relates that the man knocked at the door at dawn, and behold, the king had put off his crown and resolved to become an anchorite for the stress of his exhortation. When Hisham bin Abd al-Malik heard this, he wept till his beard was wet, and bidding his rich apparel be put off, shut himself up in his palace. Then the grandees and dependents came to Khalid and said, What is this thou hast done with the commander of the faithful? Thou hast troubled his pleasure and disturbed his life. Then, quoth Nujat al-Zaman, addressing herself to Sharkan, how many instances of admonition are there not in this chapter? Of a truth I cannot report all appertaining to this head in a single sitting. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the sixty-seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Nujat al-Zaman continued, speaking to Sharkan, Know, O king, that in this chapter be so many instances of admonition that of a truth I cannot report all appertaining to this head in a single sitting, but with length of days, O king of the age, all will be well. There said the Kazis, O king, of a truth this damsel is the wonder of the world, and of our age the unique pearl. Never heard we her like, in the length of time or in the length of our lives. And they called down blessings on the king and went away. Then Sharkan turned to his attendants and said, Begin ye to prepare the marriage festival, and make ready food of all kinds. So they forthright did his bidding as regards the viands, and he commanded the wives of the emirs and wazirs and grandees depart, not until the time of the wedding banquet, and of the unveiling of the bride. Hardly came the period of afternoon prayer, when the tables were spread with what so heart can desire or eye can delight in, of roast meats and geese and fowls and the subjects ate till they were satisfied. Moreover, 
Sharkan had sent for all the singing women of Damascus, and they were present, together with every slave girl of the king and of the notables who knew how to sing. And they went up to the palace in one body. When the evening came and darkness starkened, they lighted candles right and left from the gate of the citadel to that of the palace, and the emirs and wazirs and grandees marched past before King Sharkan, whilst the singers and the tirewoman took the damsel to dress and adorn her, but found she needed no adornment. Meantime King Sharkan went to the Haman, and coming out sat down on his seat of estate, whilst they paraded the bride before him in seven different dresses, after which they eased her of the weight of her raiment and ornaments, and gave such injunctions as are enjoined upon virgins on their wedding nights. Then Sharkan went in unto her and took her maidenhead, and she at once conceived by him, and when she announced it he rejoiced with exceeding joy, and commanded the savants to record the date of her conception. On the morrow he went forth and seated himself on his throne, and the high officers came in to him and gave him joy. Then he called his private secretary and bade him write a letter to his father, King Omar bin al nuuman saying that he had bought him a damsel who excels in learning and good breeding, and who is mistress of all kinds of knowledge. Moreover, he wrote, There is no help but that I send her to Baghdad to visit my brother Zau al-Makan and my sister Nujat al-Zaman. I have set her free and married her, and she hath conceived by me. And he went on to praise her wit, and salute his brother and sister together with the wazir Dandan, and all the emirs. Then he sealed the letter, and dispatched it to his father by a post-courier, who was absent a whole month, after which time he returned with the answer, and presented it in the presence. Sharkan took it, and read as follows. After the usual bismillah, this is from the afflicted distracted man, from him who hath lost his children and home by bane and ban, King Omar bin al nuuman to his son Sharkan. Know that since thy departure from me, the place has become contracted upon me, so that no longer I have power of patience, nor can I keep my secret, and the cause thereof is as follows. It chanced that when I went forth to hunt and course, Zau al makan sought my leave to fair Hijaz wards. But I, fearing for him the shifts of fortune, forbade him therefrom until the next year or the year after. My absence while sporting and hunting endured for a whole month and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the sixty-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that King Omar bin al nuuman wrote in his letter, My absence while sporting and hunting endured for a whole month, and when I returned, I found that thy brother and sister had taken somewhat of money, and had set out with the pilgrim caravan for pilgrimage by stealth. When I knew this, the wide world narrowed on me, O my son. But I awaited the return of the caravan, hoping that haply they would come back with it. Accordingly, when the palmers appeared, I asked concerning the twain, but they could give me no news of them. So I donned mourning for them, being heavy at heart, and in sleep I have no part, and I am drowned in the tears of my eyes. Then he wrote in verse, That pair and image quits me not one single hour whom in my heart's most honorable place I keep. Sans hope of their return I would not live one hour. Without my dreams of them, I ne'er would stretch me in sleep. The letter went on, And after the usual salutations to thee and thine, I command thee neglect no manner of seeking news of them, for indeed this is a shame to us. When Sharkan read the letter, he felt grief for his father, and joy for the loss of his brother and sister. Then he took the missive, and went in with it to Nujat al-Zaman, who knew not that he was her brother, nor he that she was his sister, albeit he often visited her both by night and by day, till the months were accomplished, and she sat down on the stool of delivery. Allah made the child birth easy to her, and she bare a daughter. Whereupon she sent for Sharkan, and seeing him, she said to him, This is thy daughter, name her as thou wilt. Quoth he, it is usual to name children on the seventh day after birth. Then he bent over the child to kiss it, and he saw, hung about its neck, a jewel, which he knew at once for one of those which Princess Abriza had brought from the land of the Greeks. Now when he saw the jewel hanging from his babe's neck, he recognized it right well. His senses fled and wrath seized on him. His eyes rolled in rage, and he looked at Nujat al-Zaman and said to her, 
Whence hadst thou this jewel, O slave girl? When she heard this from Sharkan, she replied, I am thy lady, and the lady of all in thy palace. Art thou not ashamed to say to me, slave girl? I am queen, daughter of King Omar bin al -Nu'uman. Hearing this, he was seized with trembling, and hung his head earthwards, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 24 of The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2 Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany, on February 20th, 2009section 25 volume 2 of the book of a thousand nights and a night translated by richard burton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kalinda the book of a thousand nights and a night volume 2 section 25 when it was the sixty-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Sharkan heard these words, his heart fluttered, and his color waxed yellow, and he was seized with trembling, and he hung his head earthwards, for he knew that she was his sister by the same father. Then he lost his senses, and when he revived, he abode in amazement, but did not discover his identity to her, and asked, O my lady, say, Art thou in sooth the daughter of King Omar bin al Nu'uman? Yes, answered she. And he continued, Tell me the cause of thy leaving thy sire, and of thy being sold for a slave. So she related to him all that had befallen her from beginning to end, how she had left her brother sick in the sanctified city, Jerusalem, and how the Badawi had kidnapped her and had sold her to the traitor. When Sharkan heard this, he was certified of her being his sister on the sword side, and said to himself, How can I have my sister to wife? By Allah, needs must I marry her to one of my chamberlains, and if the thing get wind, I will declare that I divorced her before consummation, and married her to my chief chamberlain. Then he raised his head, and sighing, said, O Nujat al-Zaman, thou art my very sister, and I cry, I take refuge with Allah from this sin whereinto we have fallen, for I am Sharkan, son of Omar bin al Nu'uman. She looked at him, and knew he spoke the truth, and becoming as one demented, she wept and buffeted her face, exclaiming, There is no majesty, and there is no might, save in Allah. Verily have we fallen into mortal sin. What shall I do, and what shall I say to my father and my mother when they ask me, Whence hadst thou thy daughter? Quoth Sharkan, It were meetest that I marry thee to my chamberlain, and let thee bring up my daughter in his house, that none may know thou be my sister. This hath befallen us from Almighty Allah for a purpose of his own, and nothing shall cover us but thy marriage with this chamberlain ere any know. Then he fell to comforting her and kissing her head, and she asked him, What wilt thou call the girl? Call her Kuzia Fakan, answered he. Then he gave the mother in marriage to the chief chamberlain, and transferred her to his house with the child, which they reared on the laps of slave girls, and fed with milk, and dosed with powders. Now all this occurred whilst the brother, Zau al-Makan, still tarried with the firemen at Damascus. One day there came to King Sharkan a courier from his father, with a letter which he took and read, and found therein. After the Bismillah no, O beloved king, that I am afflicted with sore affliction from the loss of my children. Sleep ever faileth me, and wakefulness ever assaileth me. I send thee this letter, that as soon as thou receivest it, thou make ready the monies and the tribute, and send them to us, together with the damsel whom thou hast bought and taken to wife. For I long to see her and hear her discourse, more especially because there hath come to us from Romland an old woman of saintly bearing, and with her be five damsels, high-bosomed virgins, endowed with knowledge and good breeding, and all arts and sciences befitting mortals to know. And indeed, tongue faileth me to describe this old woman and these who with her wend, for of a truth they are compendiums of perfections in learning and accomplishments. 
As soon as I saw them I loved them, and I wished to have them in my palace and in the compass of my hand. For none of the kings owneth the like of them. So I asked the old woman their price, and she answered, I will not sell them but for the tribute of Damascus. And I, by Allah, did not hold this price exorbitant. Indeed, it is but little, for each one of them is worth the whole valuation. So I agreed to that, and took them into my palace, and they remain in my possession. Wherefore do thou forward the tribute to us, that the woman may return to her own country, and send to us the damsel to the end that she may dispute with them before the doctors, and if she prevail over them, I will return her to thee, accompanied by the tribute of Baghdad. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the seventieth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that King Omar, son of al-Nu'uman, said in his letter, And send to us the damsel to the end that she may dispute with them before the doctors, and if she prevail over them, I will return her to thee accompanied with the tribute of Baghdad. As soon as Sharkan knew the contents, he went to his brother-in-law, and said to him, Bring the damsel to whom I married thee. And when she came, he showed her the letter, and said, O my sister, what answer wouldst thou advise me make to this letter? Replied she, Seek advice from thyself, and presently added, for she yearned after her people and her native land, Send me together with my husband the chamberlain to Baghdad, that I may tell my father my table, and let him know what so befell me with the Badawi who sold me to the merchant, and that I also inform him how thou boughtest me of the trader and gavest me in marriage to the chamberlain, after setting me free. Be it so, replied Sharkan. Then Sharkan took his daughter Kuzia Fakan, and committed her to the charge of the wet nurses and the eunuchs. And he made ready the tribute in haste, bidding the chamberlain travel with the princess and the treasure to Baghdad. He also furnished him two travelling litters, one for himself and the other for his wife. And the chamberlain replied, To hear is to obey. Moreover, Sharkan collected camels and mules, and wrote a letter to his father, and committed it to the chamberlain. Then he bade farewell to his sister, after he had taken the jewel from her, and hung it round his daughter's neck by a chain of pure gold. And she and her husband set out for Baghdad the same night. Now it so happened that Zau al-Makan and his friend the fireman had come forth from the hut in which they were, to see the spectacle, and they beheld camels and bukhti dromedaries, and bat mules and torches and lanterns alight. And Zau al-Makan inquired about the loads and their owner, and was told that it was the tribute of Damascus going to King Omar bin al-Nu'uman, lord of the city of Baghdad. He then asked, Who be the leader of the caravan? And they answered, the head chamberlain, who hath married the damsel so famous for learning in science. Thereupon Zau al-Makan wept with bitter weeping, and was minded of his mother and his father, and his sister and his native land, and he said to the stoker, I will join this caravan, and little by little will journey homewards. Quoth the fireman, I would not suffer thee to travel single-handedly from the holy city to Damascus. Then how shall I be sure of thy safety when thou farest for Baghdad? but I will go with thee, and care for thee, till thou effectest thine object. With joy and good will, answered Zau al-Makan. Then the fireman get him ready for the journey, and hired an ass, and threw saddlebags over it, and put therein something of Provence. And when all was prepared, he awaited the passage of the caravan. And presently the chamberlain came by on a dromedary, and his footman about him. Then Zau al-Makan mounted the ass, and said to his companion, Do thou mount with me. But he replied, Not so, I will be thy servant. Quoth Zau al-Makan, There is no help for it, but thou ride a while. Tis well, quoth the stoker, I will ride when I grow tired. Then said Zau al-Makan, O oh, my brother, soon shalt thou see how I will deal with thee when I come to my own folk. So they fared on till the sun rose, and when it was the hour of the noonday sleep, the chamberlain called a halt, and they alighted and reposed and watered their camels. Then he gave the signal for departure, and after five days they came to the city of Hama, where they sat down and made a three days halt. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the seventy-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that they halted in the city of Hama three days. 
They then fared forwards and ceased not travelling till they reached another city. Here also they halted three days, and thence they travelled till they entered the province Diyar Bakar. Here blew on them the breezes of Baghdad, and Zau al-Makan bethought him of his father and mother and native land, and how he was returning to his sire without his sister. So he wept and sighed and complained, and his regrets grew on him, and he began improvising these couplets. Sweetheart, how long must I await by so long suffering teed? Nor cometh messenger to tell me where thou dost abide. Ah, me, in very sooth our meeting time was shorter now. Would heaven shorter prove to me the present parting tide? Now trend my hand and open my robe, and thou within shall sight how wasted are the limbs of me, and yet the waste I hide. When say they, comfort take for loss of love, I but reply, By Allah, till the day of doom no comfort shall betide. Thereupon said to him the fireman, Leave this weeping and wailing, for we are near the chamberlain's tent. Quoth Zau al-Makan, Needs must I recite somewhat of verse, Haply it may quench the fire of my heart. Allah upon thee, cried the other, Cease this lamentation till thou come to thine own country. Then do what thou wilt, and I will be with thee wherever thou art. Replied Zau al-Makan, By Allah, I cannot forbear from this. Then he turned his face towards Baghdad, and the moon was shining brightly and shedding her light on the place. And Nujat al-Zaman could not sleep that night, but was restless and called to mind her brother and wept. And while she was in tears, she heard Zau al-Makan weeping and improvising the following distichs. Al-Yaman's levin gleam I see and sore despair despaireth me, for friend who erst abode with me, crowning my cup with gladdest gree. It minds me of one who jilted me to mourn my bitter liberty. Say sooth, thou fair sheet lightning shall, we meet once more in joy and glee. O blamer, spare me to thy blame, my lord hath sent this duel to dree, of friend who left me fain to flee, of time that breeds calamity. All bliss hath fled the heart of me since fortune proved mine enemy. He brimmed a bowl of merest pine, and made me drain the dregs, did he. I see my sweetheart, dead and gone, ere I again shall gaze on thee. Time, prithee bring our childhood back, restore our happy infancy, when joy and safety joyed we, from shafts that now they shoot at me. Who aids the hapless stranger wight that nights in fright and misery, that wastes his days in lonely grief, for time's delight no more must be, doomed us despite our will to bear, the hands of base bores cark and care. When he ended his verse, he cried out and fell down in a fainting fit. This is how it fared with him. But as regards Nujat al-Zaman, when she heard that voice in the night, her heart was at rest, and she rose, and in her joy she called the chief eunuch, who said to her, What is thy will? Quoth she, Arise, and bring me him who recited verses but now. Replied he, Of a truth I did not hear him. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. End of section 25 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2 Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany, on February 22nd, 2009section 26 volume 2 of the book of a thousand nights and a night translated by richard burton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by filippo joaquin the book of a thousand nights and a night volume 2 section 26 when it was the seventy-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Nuzhat al-Zaman heard her brother reciting, she called the chief eunuch and said to him, Go, fetch me the man who is repeating this poetry. Replied he, Of a truth I heard him not, and I wot him not, and folks are all sleeping. But she said, Whomsoever thou seest awake, he is the reciter. So he went, yet found none on wake, save the stalker, for Zau al Makan was still insensible. And when his companions saw the eunuch standing by his head, 
he was afraid of him. Then said the eunuch, Art thou he who repeated poetry but now, and my lady heard him? The stalker fancied that the dame was wroth with the reciter, and being afraid, he replied, By Allah, twas not I, rejoined the eunuch. Who then was the reciter? Point him out to me. Thou must know who it was, seeing that thou art awake. The fireman feared for Zaw al Makan and said in himself, Haply the eunuch will do him some hurt. So he answered, By Allah, I know not who it was. Said the eunuch, By Allah, thou liest, for there is none on wake here but thou. So needs must thou know him. By Allah, replied the fireman, I tell thee the truth. Some passer-by, some wayfarer, must have recited the verses and disturbed me and kept me awake. Allah requite him. Quoth the eunuch, If thou happen upon him, point him out to me, and I will lay hands on him and bring him to the door of our lady's litter. Or do thou take him with thine own hand said the fireman, Go thou back, and I will bring him to thee. So the eunuch left him, and went his way, and going in to his mistress, told her all this, and said to her, None knoweth who it was. It must have been some passer-by, some wayfarer. And she was silent. Meanwhile, Zaw al Makan came to himself, and so that the moon was reached the middle heavens. The breath of the dawn breeze breathed upon him, and his heart was moved to longing and sadness. So he cleared his throat, and was about to recite verses, when the fireman asked him, What wilt thou do? Answered Zaw al Makan, I have a mind to repeat somewhat of poetry that I may quench therewith the fire of my heart. Quoth the other, Thou knowest not what befell me whilst thou wast a faint, and how I escaped death only by beguiling the eunuch. Tell me what happened, quoth Zaw al Makan. Replied the stalker, While thou wast a swoon, there came up to me but now an eunuch, with a long staff of almond tree wood, in his hand, who took to looking in all the people's faces, as they lay asleep, and asked me who it was recited the verse, finding none awake but myself. I told him in reply it was some passer-by, some wayfarer. So he went away, and Allah delivered me from him, else had he killed me. But first he said to me, If thou hear him again, Bring him to us. When Zaw al Makan heard this, he wept and said, Who is it would forbid me to recite? I will surely recite, befall me what may, for I am near mine own land and care for none. Rejoined the fireman, Thou design is not save to lose thy life. And Zaw al Makan retorted, Needs must I recite verses. Verily, said the stalker, Needs must there be a parting between me and thee in this place, albeit. I had intended not to leave thee till I had brought thee to thy native city and reunited thee with thy mother and father. Thou hast now tarried with me a year and a half, and I have never harmed thee in aught. What ails thee, then, that thou must needs recite verses, seeing that we are tired out with walking and watching, and all the folk are asleep, for they require sleep to rest them of their fatigue. But Zawa Makan answered, I will not be turned away from my purpose. Then grief moved him, and he threw off concealment and began repeating these couplets. Stand thou by the homes and hail the lords of the ruined stead. Cry thou for an answer, belike reply to thee shall be sped. 
If the night and absence irk thy spirit, kindle a torch. We repine, and illuminate the gloom with a gleaming greed. If the snake of the sand dunes hiss, I shall marvel not at all. Let him bite, so I bite those beauteous lips of the luscious red. O Eden, my soul hath fled in despite of the maid I love. Had I lost hope on heaven, my heart in despair were dead. And he also improvised the two following distiches. We were and were the days enthralled to all our wills, dwelling in union sweet and homed in fairest sight. Who shall restore the home of the beloved, where showed light of the place, for I conjoined the time's delight? And as he seized his verses, he shrieked three shrieks and fell senseless to the ground, and the firemen rose and covered him. When Nusat al-Zaman heard the first improvisation, she called to mind her father and her mother and her brother and their whilom home. Then she wept and cried to the eunuch and said to him, Woe to thee! He who recited the first time hath recited the second time, and I heard him hard by. By Allah, and thou fetch him not to me, I will assuredly rouse the chamberlain on thee, and he shall beat thee and cast thee out. But take these hundred dinars, and give them to the singer, and bring him to me gently, and do him no hurt. If he refuse, hand to him this purse of a thousand dinars. Then leave him, and return to me, and tell me, after thou hast informed thyself of his place and his calling and what countryman he is, return quickly and linger not. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the seventy-third night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that Nusat al-Zaman sent the eunuch to make inquiries concerning the singer, and said, Beware how thou come back to me, and report I could not find him. So the eunuch went out, and laid about the people, and trod in their tents, but found none awake, all being asleep for weariness, till he came to the stalker, and saw him sitting up, with his head uncovered. So he drew near, and seizing him by the hand, said to him, it was thou didst recite the verses. The fireman was feared for his life and replied, No, by Allah, O chief of the people, it was not I. But the eunuch said, I will not leave thee till thou show me who it was that recited the verses, for I dread returning to my lady without him. Now when the fireman heard these words, he feared for Zaw al Makan and wept with exceeding weeping, and said to the eunuch, By Allah, it was not I, and I know him not. I only heard some passer-by, some wayfarer, recite verses. So do not thou commit sin on me, for I am a stranger, and come from the holy city of Jerusalem, and Abraham, the friend of Allah, be with you all. Rise up and fare with me, rejoined the eunuch. And tell my lady this with thine own mouth, for I have seen none awake save thyself. Quoth the stalker, Hast thou not come and seen me sitting in the place where I am now, and dost thou not know my station? Thou wottest none can steer from his place, except the watchman sees him. So go thou to thy station. And if thou again meet any one after this hour reciting aught of poetry, whether he be near or far, it will be I or some one I know, and thou shalt not learn of him but by me. Then he kissed the eunuch's head, and spake him fair till he went away. But the castrato fetched around, and returning secretly, came and stood behind the fireman 
fearing to go back to his mistress without tidings. As soon as he was gone, the stalker arose and aroused Zaw al Makan and said to him, Come, sit up, that I may tell thee what hath happened. So Zaw al Makan sat up, and his companion told him what had passed, and he answered, Let me alone. I will take no heed of this, and I care for none, for I am mine own country. Quoth the stalker, Why wilt thou obey thy flesh and the devil? If thou fear no one, I fear for thee and for my life. So Allah upon thee, recite nothing more of verses till thou come to thine own land. Indeed, I had not deemed thee so ill-conditioned. Dost thou not know that this lady is the wife of the Chamberlain, and is minding to chastise thee for disturbing her? Belike, she is ill or restless for fatigue of the journey and the distance of the place from her home, and this is the second time she hath sent the eunuch to look for thee. However, Zawal Makan paid no heed to the fireman's words but cried out a third time, and began versifying with these couplets. I fly the carper's injury, whose carping sorely vexed me. He chides and taunts me, wotting not. He burns me but more grievously. The blamer cries, He is consoled, I say, my own dear land to see. They ask, Why be that land so dear? I say, it taught me in love to be. They asked, what raised its dignity? I say, what made my ignominy? Whatever the bitter cup I drain, far be from me thy land to flee. Nor will I bow to those who blame, and for such love would deal me shame. Hardly had he made an end of his verses, and come to a conclusion, when the eunuch, who had heard him from his hiding place at his head, came up to him. Whereupon the fireman flee and stood afar off to see what passed between them. Then said the eunuch to Zaw al Makan, Peace be with thee, O my lord. And on thee be peace, replied Zaw al Makan, and the mercy of Allah and his blessings. O my lord, continued the eunuch, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the seventy-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the eunuch said to Zaw al Makan, O my lord, I have sought thee these several times this night, for my mistress biddeth thee to her. Quoth Zaw al Makan, And who be this bitch? that seeketh for me, Allah curse her, and curse her husband with her. And he began to revel the eunuch, who could make him no answer, because his mistress had charged him to do Zaw al Makan no hurt, nor bring him save of his own especial free will, and if he would not accompany him, to give him the thousand dinners. So the castrato began to speak him fair, and say to him, O my lord, take this purse, and go with me. We will do thee no upright, O my son, nor wrong thee in aught. But our object is that thou bend thy gracious steps with me to my mistress, to receive her answer, and return in weal and safety, and thou shalt have a handsome present, as one who bringeth good news. When Zaw al Makan heard this, he arose and went with the eunuch, and walked among the sleeping folk, stepping over them, whilst the fireman followed after them from afar, and kept his eye upon him, and said to himself, Alas, the pity of his youth, tomorrow they will hang him. And he ceased not following them, till he approached their station, without any observing him. Then he stood still, and said, How base it will be of him, if he say it was I who bade him recite the verses. This was the case of the stalker, 
but as regards what befell Zawa Makan, he ceased not walking with the eunuch till he reached his station, and the castrato went in to Nuzhat al Zaman and said, O my lady, I have brought thee him whom thou soughtest, and he is a youth, fair in face and bearing the marks of wealth and gentle breeding. When she heard this, her heart fluttered, and she cried, Let him recite some verses, that I may hear him near hand, and after ask him his name and his condition and his native land. Then the eunuch went out to Zaw al Makan and said to him, Recite what verses thou knowest, for my lady is here hard by, listening to thee, and after I will ask thee of thy name and thy native country and thy condition. Replied he, With love and gladness, but an thou ask my name, it is erased, and my trace is unplaced, and my body a waste. I have a story, the beginning of which is not known, nor can the end of it be shown, and behold, I am even as one who hath exceeded in wine drinking, and who hath not spared himself, one who is afflicted with distempers, and who wandereth from his right mind, being perplexed about his case, and drowned in the sea of thought. When Nuzat al-Zaman heard this, she broke out into excessive weeping and sobbing, and said to the eunuch, Ask him if he have parted from one he loveth, even as his mother or father. The castrato asked as she bade him, and Zaw al-Makan replied, Yes, I have parted from every one I loved, but my dearest of all to me was my sister, from whom fate hath parted me. When Nusat al-Zaman heard this, she exclaimed, Allah Almighty, reunite him with what he loveth. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 26 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2 Recording by Filippo Joachim Section 27, Volume 2 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Filippo Joachim The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2, Section 27 When it was the seventy-fifth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Nusat al-Zaman heard his words, she said, Allah reunite him with what he loveth. Then quoth she to the eunuch, Tell him to let me hear somewhat anent his separation from his countrymen and his country. The eunuch did so, and Zawa Makan sighed heavily and began repeating these couplets. Is not her love a pledge by all mankind confessed? The house that homes hinder be forever blessed. Her love all levels, men can wreck of naught beside. Not or before or after can for men have zest. Tis though the veil is paved with musk and ambergris, That day when Hinda's footstep on its face is pressed. Hail to the beauty of our camp, the pride of folk, The dearling who enslave all hearts by her behest. Allah on time's delight send large dropped clouds that teem, with genial rain, but bear no thunder in their breast. And also these, I vow to Allah, if at home I sight, my sister Nusat al-Zamani hides, I'll pass the days in joyance and delight, mid bashful minions, maidens soft and white, to sound of harps in various modes they smite, draining the bowl, while eyes rain lively light. Neat half-closed lids, a sipping lips red bright, 
by stream bank flowing through my garden site. When he had finished his verse, Nuzat al Zaman lifted up a skirt of the litter curtain and looked at him. As soon as her eyes fell on his face, she knew him for certain and cried out, O my brother, O Zaw al Makan. He also looked at her and knew her and cried out, O my sister, O Nusat al Zaman. Then she threw herself upon him, and he gathered her to his bosom, and the twain fell down in a fainting fit. When the eunuch saw this case, he wondered at them, and throwing over them somewhat to cover them, waited till they should recover. After a while, they came to themselves and Nusat al-Zaman rejoiced with exceeding joy. Oppression and depression left her, and gladness took the mastery of her, and she repeated these verses. Times where my life should fare in woeful waste, for sore our time, expiate thy sin in haste. Comes weal and comes a welcome friend to aid, to him who brings good news, rise, Gird thy waist, I spurned old world tales of Eden bliss, till came my Kauzar on those lips. When Zaw al Makan heard this, he pressed his sister to his breast. Tears streamed from his eyes for excess of joy, and he repeated these couplets. Long I lamented that we fell apart while tears repentant railed from thine eyne. And swear, if time unite us twain once more, severance shall never sound from tongue of mine. Joy hath so overwhelmed me that excess of pleasure from mine eyes draws gouts of brine. Tears, O oh mine eyes, have now become your wont. Ye weep for pleasure, and ye weep for pine. They sat a while at the litter door, till she said to him, Come with me into the litter, and tell me all that hath befallen thee, and I will tell thee what happened to me. So they entered, and Zaw al Makan said, Do thou begin thy tale. Accordingly, she told him all that had come to her since their separation at the Khan, and what had happened to her with the Badawi how the merchant had bought her of him, and had taken her to her brother Sharkan, and had sold her to him, how he had freed her at the time of buying, how he had made a marriage contract with her, and had gone in to her, and how the king, their sire, had sent and asked for her from Sharkan. Then quoth she, Praise be Allah, who hath vouchsafed thee to me, and ordain that, even as we left our father together, so together shall we return to him. And she added, O the truth, my brother Sharkan gave me in marriage to this chamberlain, that he might carry me to my father. And this is what befell me from first to last. So now tell me how it hath fared with thee since I left thee. Thereupon he told her all that had happened to him from beginning to end, and how Allah vouchsafed to send the fireman to him, and how he had journeyed with him and spent his money on him, and had served him night and day. She praised the stalker for this, and Zaw al Makan added, Of a truth, O my sister, this fireman hath dealt with me in such benevolent wise as would not lover with lass, nor sire with son, for that he fasted and gave it me to eat, and he walked whilst he made me ride, and I owe my life to him. Said she, Allah willing, we will requite him for all this according to our power. Then she called the eunuch, who came and kissed Zaw al Makan's hand. And she said, Take thy reward for glad tidings, O face of good omen. It was thy hand reunited me with my brother. 
so the purse I gave thee and all in it are thine. But now go to thy master and bring him quickly to me. The castrato rejoiced, and going into the chamber led him to his mistress. Accordingly, he came to his wife, and finding Zawa Makan with her, asked who he was. So she told him all that had befallen them both, first to last, and added, Know, O chamberlain, that thou hast married no slave girl, far from it. Thou hast taken to wife the daughter of King Omar bin al Nu'uman, for I am Nuzat al Zaman, and this is my brother, Zaw al Makan. When the chamberlain heard this story, he knew it to be sooth, and its manifest truth appeared to him as he was certified that he was become King Omar bin al Nu'uman's son in law. So he said to himself, Twill be my fate to be made viceroy of some province. Then he went up to Zaw al Makan and gave him joy of his safety reunion with his sister, and bade his servants forthwith make him ready a tent and one of the best of his own horses to ride. Thereupon said Nusat al Zaman, We are now near our country, and I would be left alone with my brother that we may enjoy each other's company, and take our fill of it, ere we reach Baghdad, for we have been parted a long, long time. Be it as thou biddest, replied the chamberlain, and going forth from them, sent them wax candles and various kinds of sweetmeats, together with three suits of the costliest for Zaw al Makan. Then he returned to the litter and related the good he had done, and Nusat al-Zaman said to him, Bid the eunuch bring me the fireman, and gave him a horse to ride, and ration him with a tray of food morning and evening, and let him be forbidden to leave us. The chamberlain called the castrato and charged him to do accordingly. So he replied, I hear and I obey and he took his pages with him and went out in search of the stalker till he found him in the rear of the caravan, girding his ass and preparing for flight. The tears were running down his cheeks, out of fear for his life and grief for his separation from Zaw al Makan. And he was saying to himself, Indeed, I warned him for the love of Allah, but he would not listen to me. Oh, would I knew what is become of him. Ere he had done speaking, the eunuch was standing by his head, whilst the pages surrounded him. The fireman turned, and seeing the eunuch and the pages gathered around him, became yellow with fear. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the seventy-sixth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the stalker girded his ass for flight, and bespake himself, saying, Oh, would I knew what is become of him! Ere he had done speaking, the castrato was standing by his head, and his side muscles quivered for fear, and he lifted up his voice and cried, Verily he knoweth not the value of the good offices I have done him. I believe he hath denounced me to the eunuch, hence these pages at about me, and he hath made me an accomplice in his crime. Then the effeminated one cried at him, saying, Who was it recited the verses? O liar! Why didst thou say, I never repeated these couplets? nor do I know who repeated them, when it was thy companion. But now I will not leave thee between this place and Baghdad, and what betideth thy comrade shall betide thee. Quoth the fireman, What I feared hath befallen me, and he repeated these couplets. T'was as I feared the coming ills discerning, 
but unto Allah we are all returning. Then the eunuch cried upon the pages, saying, Take him off the ass. So they carried him along with the caravan, surrounded by the pages, as the white contains the black of the eye. And the castrato said to them, If a hair of him be lost, you will be lost with it. And he bade them privily, Treat him with honor, and not humiliate him. But when the stalker saw himself beset by the pages, he despaired of his life, and turning to the eunuch, said to him, O chief, I am neither this youth's brother, nor am I akin to him, nor is he sib to me, but I was a fireman in the hammam, and found him cast out in his sickness on the dung heap. Then the caravan fared on, and the stalker wept, and imagined in himself a thousand things, whilst the eunuch walked by his side, and told him nothing, but said to him, Thou disturbest our mistress by reciting verses, thou and this youth, but fear nothing for thyself. And kept laughing at him, the while to himself. Whenever the caravan halted, they served him with food, and he and the castrato ate from one dish. Then the eunuch bade his lads bring a goglet of sugared sherbet, and after drinking himself, gave it to the fireman, who drank. But all the while his tears never dried, out of fear for his life, and grief for his separation from Zaw al Makan, and for what had befallen them in their strangerhood. So they both travelled on with the caravan, whilst the chamberlain now rode by the door of his wife's litter, in attendance of Zawa Makan and his sister, and now gave an eye to the fireman. And Uzat al-Zaman and her brother occupied themselves with converse and mutual condolence. And they ceased not after this fashion till they came within three days' journey from Baghdad. Here they alighted at eventide, and rested till the morning morrowed. And as they awoke, and they were about to load the beasts, behold, there appeared afar off a great cloud of dust that darkened the firmament, till it became black as gloomiest night. Thereupon the chamberlain cried out to them, Stay, and you are loading delay. Then, mounted with his mamelukes, rode forward in the direction of the dust cloud. When they drew near, suddenly appeared under it a numerous conquering host, like the full tide sea, with flags and standards, drums and kettle drums, horsemen and footmen. The chamberlain marvelled at this, and when the troops saw him, there detached itself from amongst them a plump of five hundred cavaliers, who fell upon him, and his suit, and surrounded them, five for one. Whereupon said he to them, What is the matter, and what are these troops, that ye do this with us? Asked they, Who art thou, and whence comest thou, and whither art thou bound? And he answered, I am the chamberlain of the emir of Damascus, King Sharkan, son of Omar bin al Nu'uman, lord of Baghdad, and of the land of Khorasan, and I bring tribute and presents from him to his father in Baghdad. When the horsemen heard these words, they let their head kerchiefs fall over their faces and wept, saying, In very sooth King Omar is dead, and he is that not but of poison. So fare ye forwards, no harm shall befall you till you join his grand wazir, Dandan. Dan. Now when the chamberlain heard this, he wept sore and exclaimed, O oh, for our disappointment in this our journey! Then he and all his suit wept till they had come up to the host and sought access to the wazir Dandan, Dan, who granted an interview and called a halt and causing his pavilion to be pitched, sat down on a couch therein and commanded to admit the chamberlain. Then he bade him be seated, 
and questioned him. And he replied that he was Chamberlain to the Emir of Damascus, and was bound to King Omar with presents and the tribute of Syria. The wazir, hearing the mention of King Omar's name, wept and said, King Omar is dead by poison. And upon his dying, the folk fell out amongst themselves as to who should succeed him, until they were like to slay one another on his account. But the notables and grandees and the four kazis interposed, and all the people agreed to refer the matter to the decision of the four judges, and that none should gainsay them. So it was agreed that we go to Damascus and fetch thence the king's son, Sharkan, and make him sultan over his father's realm. And amongst them were some who would have chosen the cadet, Zaw al Makan, for, quoth they, his name be light of the place, and he hath a sister, Nusat al Zaman, highs, the delight of the time. But they set out five years ago for Al Hijaz, and none wotteth what is become of them. When the Chamberlain heard this, he knew that his wife had told him the truth of her adventures and he grieved with sore grief for the death of King Omar, albeit he joyed with exceeding joy, especially at the arrival of Zaw al-Makan, for that he would now become Sultan of Baghdad in his father's stead. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 27 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2 Recording by Filippo Joachim Section 28 Volume 2 Of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Filippo Joachim The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Volume 2, Section 28 When it was the seventy-seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when Sharkan's chamberlain heard of the death of King Omar bin al numan he mourned, but he rejoiced because of his wife and her brother Zaw al-Makan, who would become sultan of Baghdad in his father's stead. So he turned to the wazir Dandan, and said to him, Verily, your tale is a wonder of wonders. Know, O chief wazir, that here, where you have encountered me, Allah hath given you rest from fatigue, and bringeth you your desire after the easiest of fashions. For that his almighty will restoreth to you Zawa Makan and his sister Nusat al-Zaman, whereby we will settle the matter as we easily can. When the minister heard these words, he rejoiced with great joy, and said, O Chamberlain, tell me the tale of the twain, and what befell them, and the cause of their long absence. So he repeated to him the whole story, and told him that Nuzat al-Zaman was his wife, and related to him the adventures of Zaw al-Makan, from first to last. As soon as he had ended his tale, the wazir sent for the emirs and wazirs and chief officers and acquainted them with the matter, whereat they rejoiced with great joy and wondered at the happy chance. Then they gathered in a body and went in to the chamberlain and did their service to him, kissing the ground between his hands. And the wazir Dandan also rose and went out to meet him and stood before him in honor. After this, the chamberlain held on that day a divan council, and he and the wazir sat upon a throne, whilst all the emirs and grandees and officers of state took their places before them, according to their several ranks. Then they melted sugar in rose water and drank, after which the emirs sat down and hold counsel, and permitted the rest of the host 
to mount and ride forward leisurely, till they should make an end of their debate and overtake them. So the officers kissed the ground between their hands, and mounting, rode onwards, preceded by the standards of war. When the grandees had finished their conference, they took horse and rejoined the host, and the chamberlain approached the wazir Dandan and said, I deem it well to ride on before you and precede you, that I may get ready a place for the sultan and notify him of your coming and of your choosing him as sultan over the head of his brother Sharkan. A right thou reckest, answered the wazir. Then the chamberlain rose up in haste, and Dandan also stood up to do him honor and brought him presents, which he conjured him to accept. In similar guise did all the emirs and grandees and officers of state, bringing him gifts and calling down blessings on him, and saying to him, Haply thou wilt mention our case to Sultan Zawal Makan, and speak to him to continue us in our dignities. The chamberlain promised all they required, and bade his pages be ready to march, whereupon the wazir Dandan sent with him tents, and bade the tent pitchers set them up at a day's journey from the city. And they did his bidding. Then the chamberlain mounted and rode forward, full of joy, and said to himself, How blessed is this gurney! And indeed his wife was exalted in his eyes, she and her brother Zaw al Makan. They made all haste over their wayfare, till they reached a place distant a day's journey from Baghdad, where the chamberlain called a halt for rest, and bade his men alight and make ready a sitting place for the Sultan Zaw al Makan, son of King Omar bin al Nu'uman while he rode forward with his Mamelukes, and alighting at a distance from Nuzat al-Zaman's litter, commanding the eunuchs to ask leave of admission to the presence. They did so, and she gave permission, whereupon he went in to her and conversed with her and her brother, and told them of the death of their father, and of Zawa Makan, how the heads of the people had made him king over them in the stead of his sire, and he gave them joy of the kingdom. They both wept for their father and asked the manner of his being killed, but the chamberlain answered, The news rests with Wazir Dandan, who will be here tomorrow, leading all the host, and it only remaineth for thee, O king, to do what they counsel since they have unanimously chosen thee, Sultan. For if thou do not this, they will choose someone else, and thou canst not be sure of thy life with another Sultan. Haply he will kill thee, or discord may befall between you twain, and the kingdom pass out of the hands of both. Zawamakan bowed his head a while, and then said, I accept the position for indeed there was no refusing, and he was certified that the chamberlain had counseled him well and wisely and set him on the right way. Then he added, O oh, my uncle, how shall I do with my brother Sharkan? O oh, my son, replied the chamberlain, thy brother will be sultan of Damascus and thou sultan of Baghdad, so take heart of grace and get ready thy case. Zawa Makan accepted this, and the chamberlain presented him with a suit of royal raiment and a dagger of state, which the wazir Dandan had brought with him. Then, leaving him, he bade the tent pitchers choose a spot of rising ground and set up thereon a spacious pavilion, wherein the sultan might sit to receive the emirs and grandees. Moreover, he ordered the kitcheners 
to cook rich viands and serve them, and he commanded the water carriers to dispose the water troughs. They did as he bade them, and presently arose a cloud of dust from the ground, and spread till it walled the horizon around. After a while the dust dispersed, and there appeared under it the army of Baghdad and Khorasan, a conquering host like the full tide sea. And Charazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the seventy-eighth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the chamberlain bade the tent pitchers set up a pavilion spacious enough to receive the subjects talking to their sultan, they planted a splendid shamiana, befitting kings. And as they ended their labor, behold, a dust cloud spired aloft, and the breeze made it lift, and beneath it showed a conquering host. And presently it appeared that this was the army of Baghdad and Khorasan, preceded by the wazir Dandan. And in it all rejoiced at the accession of the light of the place. Now Zawa Makan had donned robes of royal state and girt himself with a sword of state. So the chamberlain brought him a steed and he mounted, surrounded by Mamelukes and all the company from the tents on foot, to do him service. And he rode on until he came to the great pavilion, where he sat down, and he laid the royal dagger across his thighs, whilst the chamberlain stood in attendance on him, and his armed slaves stationed themselves under the entrance awning of the Shamiana, with drawn swords in their hands. Presently up came the troops and the host, and craved admission. So the chamberlain went in to Zawa Makan, and asked his leave, whereupon he bade admit them, ten by ten. The chamberlain acquainted them with the king's commands, to which they replied, We hear and we obey and all drew up before the pavilion entrance. Then he took ten of them and carried them through the vestibule into the presence of Sultan Zaw al-Makan, whom, when they saw, they were awed. But he received them with most gracious kindness and promised them all good. So they gave him joy of his safe return and invoked Allah's blessings upon him after which they took the oath of fealty, never to gainsay him in aught, and they kissed ground before him and withdrew. Then other ten entered, and he entreated them as he had entreated the others. And they ceased not to enter, ten by ten, till none was left but the wazir Dandan. Lastly, the minister went in, and kissed the ground before Zaw al Makan, who rose to meet him, saying, Welcome, O Wazir, and sire's son's peer. Verily, thine acts are those of a counsellor right dear, and judgment and foreseeing clear are in the hands of the subtle of Lear. Then bade him the chamberlain forthwith go out and cause the tables to be spread, and order all the troops thereto. So they came, and ate, and drank. Moreover, the Sultan commanded his wazir Dandan call a ten days' halt of the army, that he might be private with him, and learn from him how and wherefore his father had been slain. The wazir obeyed the commands, of the Sultan, with a submission, and wished him eternity of glory, and said, This needs must be. He then repaired to the heart of the encampment, and ordered the host to halt ten days. They did as he bade them, and moreover he gave them leave to divert themselves, 
and ordered that none of the lords in waiting should attend upon the king for service during the space of three days. Then the wazir went to the sultan and reported all to him, and Zawa Makan waited until nightfall, when he went in to his sister Nusa'at al-Zaman and asked her, Dost thou know the cause of my father's murder or not? I have no knowledge of the cause, she answered, and drew a silken curtain before herself, whilst Zawa Makan seated himself without the curtain and commanded the wazir to the presence, and when he came, said to him, I desire thou relate to me in detail the cause of the killing of my sire, King of Mar bin al Nu'uman. Know then, O king, replied Dandan, that King Omar bin al Nu'uman, when he returned from Baghdad from his chasing and hunting, and entered the city, inquired for thee and thy sister, but could not find you, and knew that you twain had gone on the pilgrimage. Whereat he was greatly grieved and much angered, and his breast was straitened, and he abode thus half a year, seeking news of you from all who came and went, but none could give him any tidings. Now, while we were in attendance upon him one day, after a whole year had sped since ye were lost to his sight, lo, there came to us an ancient dame with signs of being a devotee, accompanied by five damsels, high-bosomed virgins, like moons, endowed with such beauty and loveliness as tongue faileth to describe, and to crown their perfections and comeliness, they could read the Koran and were versed in various kinds of learning and in the histories of bygone peoples. Then that old woman sought audience of the king, and he bade admit her, whereupon she entered the presence and kissed the ground between his hands. I was then sitting by his side, and he, seeing in her the sign of asceticism and devoutness, made her draw near and take seat hard by him. And when she had sat down, she addressed him and said, Know, O king, that with me are five damsels, whose like no king among the kings possesseth, for they are endowed with wit and beauty and loveliness and perfection. They read the Koran and the traditions and are skilled in all manner of learning and in the history of bygone races. They stand here between thy hands to do thee service, O king of the age. And it is by trial that folk are prized or despised. Thy father, who hath found mercy, looked at the damsels, and their favor pleased him. So he said to them, let each and every of you make me hear something of what she knoweth anent the history of the folk of yore and of peoples long gone before. And Charazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 28 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2 Recording by Filippo Joachim Section 29, Volume 2 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, translated by Richard Burton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Filippo Joaquin. The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2, Section 29. When it was the seventy-ninth night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wazir Dandan said unto King Zawa Makan, Thy father, who hath found mercy, glanced at the damsels, and their favor pleased him, 
and he said to them, Let each and every of you make me hear something of what she knoweth anent the history of the folk of yore, and of peoples long gone before. Thereupon one of them came forward, and kissing the ground before him, spake as follows. Know, O king, that it behoveth one of good breeding to eschew impertinence, and adorn himself with excellencies, and observe the divine injunctions, and avoid mortal sins. And to this he shall apply himself with the assiduity of one, who if stray therefrom, falleth into perdition. For the foundation of good breeding is virtuous behavior. And know that the chief cause and reason of man's existence is the endeavor after life everlasting. And the right way thereto is the service of Allah. Wherefore it behoveth thee to deal beneficently with the people, and swerve not from this canon. For the mightier men are in dignity, the more their need of prudence and foresight. And indeed, monarchs need this more than the many. For the general cast themselves into affairs without taking thought or to the issue thereof. Be thou prodigal of thy life and thy good in the way of Allah, and know that if an enemy dispute with thee, thou mayst dispute with him and refute him with proofs and be proof against him. But as for thy friend, there is none can judge between thee and him save righteousness and fair dealing. Choose therefore thy friend for thyself after thou hast proved him. If he be of the brotherhood of futurity, let him be zealous in observing the externals of the holy law and burst in its inner meaning, as far as may be. And if he be of the brotherhood of the word, let him be free-born, sincere, neither a fool nor a perverse, for the fool man is such that even his parents might well flee from him, and a liar cannot be a true friend. Indeed, the word Siddiq, friend, deriveth from Sidq, truth, that welleth up the, from the bottom of the heart. And how can this be the case when falsehood is manifest upon the tongue? And know that observance of the law profiteth him who practiseth it. So love thy brother, if he be of this quality, and do not cast him off, even if thou see in him that which irketh thee. For a friend is not I like a wife, whom one can divorce and remarry. Nay, his heart is like glass. Once broken, it may not be mended. And Allah bless him who saith, Where how thou hurtest man with hurt of heart, tis hard to win thee back the heart offended. For hearts indeed, whence love is alien made, like broken glass may never more be mended. The maiden continued and concluded with pointing out to us what sages say. The breast of brethren is he who is the most constant in good counsel. The best of action is that which is fairest in its consequence. And the best of praise is not that which is in the mouths of man. It is also said, It behoveth not the servant to neglect thanking Allah, especially for two favors, health and reason. Again it is said, Whoso honoreth himself, his lust is a light matter to him, and he who maketh much of his small troubles, Allah afflicteth him with the greater. He who obeyeth his own inclinations, neglecteth his duties, and he who listeneth to the slanderer loseth the true friend. He who thinketh well of thee, do thou fulfill his thought of thee. He who exceedeth in contention sinneth, and he who against upright standeth not on word is not safe 
from the sword. Now will I tell thee somewhat of the duties of Kazis and judges. Know, O king, that no judgment serveth the cause of justice, save it be given after proof positive. And it behoveth the judge to treat all people on the same level, to do intent that the great may not hunger for oppression, nor the small despair of justice. Furthermore, he should extract proof from the complainant and impose an oath upon the defendant. The mediation is admissible between Muslims, except it be a compromise sanctioning the unlawful or forbidding the lawful. If thou shalt have done aught during the day, of which thy reason is doubtful, but thy good intention is proved, thou, O Kazi, shouldest revert to the right. For to do justice is a religious obligation, and to return to that which is right is better than persistence in wrong. Then, O judge, thou shouldest study precedents and the law of the case, and do equal justice between the suitors with all fixing thine eyes upon the truth and committing thine affair to Allah, be he extolled and exalted. And require thou proof of the complainant, and if he adduce evidence, let him have due benefit of it, and if not, put the defendant to his oath. For this is the ordinance of Allah. Receive thou the testimony of competent Muslim witnesses, one against other. For Almighty Allah hath commanded judges to judge by externals, He Himself taking charge of the inner and secret things. It behoveth the judge also to avoid giving judge meat, whilst suffering from stress of pain or hunger, and that in his decisions between folk he seek the face of Allah Almighty. For he whose intent is pure and who is at peace with the himself, Allah shall guarantee him against what is between him and the people. Quoth al-Zuri, There are three things for which, if they be found in a kazi, he should be disposed, namely, if he honor the base, if he love praise, and if he fear dismissal. And Omar bin Abd al-Aziz once deposed a kazi, who asked him, Why hast thou dismissed me? It hath reached me, answered Omar, that thy conversing greater than thy condition. It is said also that Iskandar said to his kazi, I have invested thee with this function, and committed to thee in it my soul, and mine honor, and my manliness. So do thou guard it with thy sense and thine understanding. To his cook he said, Thou art the sultan of my body, so look thou tender it as thine own self. To the secretary he said, Thou art the controller of my wit, so do thou watch over me in what thou writest for me and from me. Thereupon the first damsel backed out from the presence, and the second damsel came forward. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the eightieth night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wazir Dandan said to Zaw al Makan. Thereupon the first damsel backed out from the presence, and a second damsel came forward, and kissing the ground seven times before the king thy father, spake as follows The sage Lukman said to his son, There be three who are known only in three several cases. The merciful man is unknown, save in time of wrath, the brave only in battle, and thy friend in time of need. 
it is said that the oppressor shall be depressed, though by people praised, and that the oppressed is at rest, though by people blamed. Quoth Allah Almighty, Assuredly, deem not that those who rejoice in what I have done, and who love to be praised for what they have not done, shall escape reckoning of punishment. Indeed, there is reserved for them a grievous penalty. And he said, On whom be salvation and salutation. Works are according to intention, and to each man is attributed that which he intendeth. He said also, In the body is a part, which being sound, the rest is sound, and which being unsound, the whole is unsound. And this is the heart. Now this heart is the most marvellous of what is in man, since it is that which ordereth the whole affair. If covetise steer in it, desire destroyeth him, and if affliction master it, anguish slayeth him. If anger rage in it, danger is hard upon him. If it be blessed with contentment, he is safe from discontent. If fear surprise it, he is full of mourning, and if calamity overtake it, affliction betideth him. If a man gain the use of wealth, peradventure he is diverted thereby from the remembrance of his Lord. If poverty choke him, his heart is distracted by woe, or if disquietude waste his heart, Weakness causeth him to fall. Thus, in any case, nothing profiteth him, but that he be mindful of Allah, and occupy himself with gaining his livelihood in this world, and securing his place in the next. It is asked of a certain sage, Who is the most ill-conditioned of men? And he answered, The man whose lusts master his manhood, and whose mind soareth over high, so that his knowledge dispreadeth, and his excuse diminisheth. And how excellently saith the poet, Freest am I of all mankind fro meddling white, who see in others her self-error never can sight. Riches and talents are but loans to creature lent, each wears the cloak of that he bears in breasts and sprite. If by mistaken door a temp and aught thou make, thou shalt go wrong, and if the door be right, go right. Continued the maiden. As for anecdotes of devotees, quoth Hisham bin Bashar, I asked Omar bin Ubaid, What is true piety? And he answered, The Apostle of Allah, to whom be salutation and salvation, hath explained it when he saith, The pious is he who forgetteth not the grave nor calamity, and who prefereth that which endureth to that which passeth away, who counteth not the morrow as of his days, but reckoneth himself among the dead. And it is related that Abu Zar used to say, Want is dearer to me than wealth, and unheal is dearer to me than health. Quoth one of the listeners, May Allah have mercy on Abu Zar. For my part I say, Whoso putteth his trust in the goodness of the election of Almighty Allah should be content with that condition which Allah hath chosen for him. Quoth one of the companions of the Prophet, Ibn Abi Awfa once prayed with us the dawn prayer. When he had done, he recited, O thou unwrapped, till he came to where Allah saith, When there shall be a trumping on the trumpet, and fell down dead. It is said, that Sabit al-Banani wept 
till he well nigh lost his eyes. They brought him a man to medicine him, who said to him, I will cure thee, provided thou obey my bidding. Asked Sabit, In what matter? Quoth the leech, In that thou leave weeping. What is the worth of mine eyes, rejoined Sabit, if they do not weep? Quoth a man to Mohammed bin Abdullah, Exhort thou me. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the eighty-first night, she continued, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wazir Dandan said to Zaw al Makan, Thus spake the second handmaid to the king who hath found mercy, Omar bin al Nu'uman. Quoth a man to Mohammed bin Abilah, Exhort thou me. I exhort thee, replied he, to be a self ruler and abstrainer in this world and in the next a greedy slave. How so? asked the other, and Mohammed answered, The abstinent man in this world conquereth both the world that is and the world to come. And what Gauss bin Abdullah? There were two brothers among the sons of Israel, one of whom said to the other, What be the most perilous thing thou hast done? Replied the brother, I once came upon a nest of young birds, so I took out one and threw it back into the nest, but among the chickens were some which drew apart from it. This is the most perilous thing I ever did. Now what be the most perilous thing thou hast ever done? He rejoined, When I arise for prayer, I am fearful that it is only for the sake of the reward. Now their father heard these words and exclaimed, O Allah, and say thy sooth, take them to thyself. It is declared by one of the wise men, Verily, these were of the most virtuous of children. Quoth Said bin Jubair, I was once in company with Fuzala bin, who Bayan said to him, Exhort thou me, replied he, Bear in mind these two necessaries, Shun Syntheism, and harm not any of Allah's creatures. And he repeated these two couplets. Be as thou wilt, for Allah still is bounteous Lord, and care dispeller, dread not therefore bane and ban. To two things only never draw thee nigh, nor give partner to Allah trouble to thy brother man. And how well saith the poet, and thou of pious works a store neglect, and after death meet one who did collect. Thou shalt repent, thou didst not as he, nor madest ready as he did elect. Then the third damsel came forward, after the second had withdrawn, and said, Of a truth the chapter of piety is exceeding wide but I will mention what occurreth to me thereof concerning the pious of old. Quoth a certain holy man, I congratulate myself in death, though I am not assured of rest therein, save that I know death interveneth between a man and his works, so I hope for the doubling of good works and the docking off of ill works. And Ita al Salami, when he had made an end of an exhortation, was wont to tremble and grieve and weep sore. And as they asked him why he did this, he answered, I desire to enter upon a grave matter, and it is the standing up before Almighty Allah to do in accordance with my exhortation. In similar guise, 
Zain al Abidin, son of al Hussein, was wont to tremble when he rose to pray. Being asked the cause of this, he replied, Know ye not before whom I stand and whom I address? It is said that there lived near Sufyan al Tauri a blind man who, when the month of Ramadan came, went out with a folk to pray, but he remained silent and hung back. Said Sufyan, On the day of resurrection he shall come with the people of the Koran, and they will be distinguished by increase of honor from their fellows. Quoth Sufyan, Where the soul established in the heart of befitteth, it would fly away for joy and pining for paradise, and for grief and fear of hell fire. It is related also of Sufyar al Tauri that he said, To look upon the face of a tyrant is a sin. Then the third damsel retired and came forward the fourth, who said, Here I am to treat of sundry traditions of pious men which suggest themselves to me. It is related that Bish Barefoot said, I once heard Khalid say, Beware of secret polytheism. I asked, What may secret polytheism be? And he answered, When one of you in praying prolong his inclinations and prostrations till a cause of impurity come upon him. And one of the sages said, Doing works of will expiateth what is ill. Quoth Ibrahim, I supplicated Bishr Barefoot to acquaint me with some theological mysteries, but he said, O my son, this knowledge it behoveth us not to teach to every one. Of every hundred, five even as the legal alms upon money. Said Ibrahim, I thought his reply excellent, and approved of it, and while I was praying, behold, Bishr was also praying. So I stood behind him, making the prayer bow, till the muezzin called his call. Then rose a man of tattered appearance, and said, O folk, Beware of a truth which bringeth unweal, for there is no harm in a lie bringing weal, and in time of need no choice we heed. Speech booteth not in the absence of good qualities, even as silence hurteth not in the presence of good. Presently I saw Bishr drop a Danic, so I picked it up, and exchanged it for a dirham, which I gave him. Quoth he, I will not take it. Quoth I, It is perfectly lawful change. But he rejoined, I cannot take in exchange the riches of the present world for those of the future world. It is related also that Bishr Barefoot's sister once went to Ahmad bin Ahambal, and Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 29 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2 Recording by Filippo Joaquin Section 30, Volume 2 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night Translated by Richard Burton this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Filippo Joaquin The Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2, Section 30 When it was the eighty-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wazir Dandan continued to bespeak Zaw al Makan in this wise, and quoth the maiden to thy father, Bishr Barefoot's sister, 
once went to Ahmad bin Hanbal and said to him, O Imam of the Faith, we are a family that spin thread by night and work for our living by day, and oftentimes the cressets of the watch of Baghdad pass by and we on the roof spinning by their light. Is this forbidden to us? Asked Ahmad, Who art thou? I am the sister of Bishr barefoot, answered she. Rejoined the Imam, O household of Bishr, I shall never cease to drink full draughts of piety from your hearts. Quoth one of the sages, When Allah willeth well to his servant, he openeth upon him the gate of action. Malik bin Dinar, when he passed through the bazaar and saw aught he desired, was wont to say, O soul, take patience, for I will not accord to thee what thou desirest. He said also, Allah accept him. The salvation of the soul lies in resistance to it and its damnation in submission to it. Quoth Mansur bin Ammar, I made a pilgrimage and was faring Mecca ward by way of Kufa, and the night was overcast when I heard a voice crying out from the deeps of the darkness, saying, O Allah, I swear by thy greatness and thy glory, I meant not through my disobedience to transgress against thee, for indeed I am not ignorant of thee, but my fault is one thou didst foreordain to me from eternity without beginning. So do thou pardon my transgression, for indeed I disobeyed thee of my ignorance. When he had made an end of his prayer, he recited aloud the verse, O true believers, save your souls and those of your families from the fire whose fuel is men and stones. Then I heard a fall, but not knowing what it was, I passed on. When the morning morrowed, as we went our way, behold, we fell in with a funeral train, followed by an old woman whose strength had left her. I asked her of the dead, and she answered, This is the funeral of a man who passed by us yesterday, whilst my son was standing at prayer, and after his prayer he recited a verse from the book of Allah Almighty, when the man's gall bladder burst, and he fell dead. Therewith the fourth damsel retired, and the fifth came forward, and said, I here will also repeat what occurreth to me regarding the acts of devotees in olden time. Maslamah bin Dinar used to say, By making sound the secret thoughts, sins great and small are covered. And, when the servant of Allah is resolved to leave sinning, victory cometh to him. Also quoth he, Every worldly good which doth not draw one nearer to Allah is a calamity, for a little of this word distracteth from a mickle of the world to come, and a mickle of the present maketh thee forget the whole of the future. It was asked of Abu Hazim, Who is the most prosperous of men? And he answered, who suspendeth his life in submission to Allah. The other inquired, And who is the most foolish of mankind? Who selleth his future for the worldly goods of others? replied Abu Hazim. It is reported of Moses, on whom be peace, that when he came to the waters of Midian, he exclaimed, O Lord, Verily I stand in need of the good which thou shalt send down to me. And he asked of his Lord and not of his folk. 
there came two damsels, and he drew water for them both, and allowed not the shepherds to draw first. When the twain returned, they informed their father, Shu Aib, on whom be peace, who said, Haply, he is hungry, adding to one of them, Go back to him, and bid him hither. Now when she came to Moses, she veiled her face, and said, My father biddeth thee to him, that he may pay thee thy wage for having drawn water for us. Moses was averse to this, and was not willing to follow her. Now she was a woman large in the back parts, and in wind blowing upon her garment, covered the hinder cheeks to Moses, which when Moses saw, he lowered his eyes and said to her, Get thee behind while I walk in front. So she followed him, till he entered the house of Shu Aib, where supper was ready. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased to say her permitted say. When it was the eighty-third night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wazir Dandan continued to Zaw al Makan. Now quoth the fifth damsel to thy sire, when Moses, on whom be peace, entered the home of Shuaib, where supper was ready, Shuaib said to him, O Moses, I desire to pay thee thy wage, for having drawn water for these two. But Moses answered, I am of the household which selleth nothing of the fashion of the next world, for what is on earth of gold and silver. Then quoth Shu'aib, O youth, nevertheless thou art my guest, and it is my wont, and that of my forebears, to honor the guest by setting food before him. So Moses sat down and ate. Then Shu'aib hired Moses for eight pilgrimages, that is to say, eight years, and made his wage marriage with one of his two daughters, and Moses' service to him was to stand for her dowry. As saith the holy writ of him, Verily, I will give thee one of these my two daughters in marriage, on condition that thou serve me for hire eight pilgrimages. And if thou fulfill ten years, it is in thine own breast, for I seek not to impose a hardship on thee. A certain man once said to one of his friends, whom he had not met for many days, Thou hast made me desolate, for that I have not seen thee this long a while. Quoth the other, I have been distracted from thee by Ib Shihab, Dost thou know you? Quoth his friend, Yes, he hath been my neighbor these thirty years, but I have never spoken to him. He replied, Verily, thou forgettest Allah in forgetting thy neighbor. If thou lovest Allah, thou wouldst love thy neighbor. Knowest thou not that a neighbor hath a claim upon his neighbor? even as a right of kith and kin? Said Uzaifa, We entered Mecca with Ibrahim bin Adham, and Shakik al-Balki was also making a pilgrimage that year. Now we met whilst circumambulating the Kaaba, and Ibrahim said to Shakik, what is your fashion in your country? replied Shakik. When we are blessed with our daily bread, we eat, and when we hunger, we take patience. This wise, said Ibrahim, to the dogs of bulk. But we, when blessed with plenty, 
do honor to Allah, and when we hungered, we thank him. And Shakik seated himself before Ibrahim and said to him, Thou art my master. Also said Muhammad bin Imran, A man once asked of Hatim the deaf, What maketh thee to trust in Allah? Two things, answered he, I know that none save myself shall eat my daily bread, so my heart is at rest as to that, and I know that I was not created without the knowledge of Allah, and am abashed before him. Then the fifth damsel retired, and the ancient dame came forward, and kissing the ground before thy father nine times, said, Thou hast heard, O king, what these all have spoken on the subject of piety, and I will follow their example in relating what hath reached me of the famous men of past times. It is said that the Imam al-Shafi'i departed the night into three portions, the first for study, the second for sleep, and the third for prayer. The Imam Abu Hanifa was wont also to pass half the night in prayer. One day a man pointed him out to another as he walked by and remarked, Yonder man watcheth the whole night. When he heard this, Abu Hanifa said, I was abashed before Allah to hear myself praised for what was not in me. So after this he used to watch the whole night. And one of the sages hath said, Who seeketh for pearl in the deep dives deep, Who on high would high robs his night of sleep. Al-Rabi relates that Al-Shafi used to recite the whole Quran seventy times during the month of Ramadan, and that in his daily prayers. Quoth Al-Shafi, Allah accept him. During ten years I never ate my fill of barley bread, for fullness hardeneth the heart, and deadeneth the wit, and induceth sleep, and enfeebleth one from standing up to pray. It is reported of Abdullah bin Muhammad al-Sakra that he said, I was once talking with Omar, and he observed to me, Never saw I a more God-fearing or eloquent man than Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi. It so happened I went out one day with Al-Haris bin Labin al-Safar, who was a disciple of Al-Muzani, and had a fine voice, and he read the saying of the Almighty, This shall be a day whereon they shall not speak to any purpose, nor shall they be permitted to excuse themselves. I saw Al-Shafi's color change, his skin shuddered with horripilation, he was violently moved, and he fell down in a fainting fit. When he revived, he said, I take refuge with Allah from the stead of the liars and the lot of the negligent. O Allah, before whom the hearts of the wise abase themselves, O Allah, of thy beneficence accord to me the remission of my sins, adore me with the curtain of thy protection and pardon me my shortcomings by the magnanimity of thy being. Then I rose and went away. Quoth one of the pious, When I entered Baghdad, Al-Shafi was there, so I sat down on the river bank to make the ablution before prayer. And behold, there passed me one 
who said, O youth, make thou whoso ablution well, and Allah will make it well for thee in this world and in the next. I turned, and lo, there was a man behind whom came a company of people. So I hastened to finish my ablution and followed him. Presently he turned and asked me, Say, dost thou want aught? Yes, answered I, I desire that thou teach me somewhat of that which Allah Almighty hath taught thee. He said, Know then that whoso believeth in Allah shall be saved, and whoso jealously loveth his faith shall be delivered from destruction, and whoso practiseth abstinence in this world, his eyes shall be solaced on the morrow of death. Shall I tell thee any more? I replied, Assuredly. And he continued, Be thou of the word that is, heedless, and of the word to come, greediest. Be truthful in all thy dealings, and thou shalt be saved with the salvationists. Then he went on, and I asked about him, and was told that he was the Imam al Shafi. al Shafi was wont to remark, I love to see folk profit by this learning of mine, on condition that nothing of it be attributed to me. And Charazad perceived the dawn of day, and ceased saying her permitted say. When it was the eighty-fourth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wazir Dandan continued to Zaw al Makan. The old woman bespake thy sire, saying, The Imam al Shafi was wont to remark, I love to see folk profit by this learning of mine, on condition that nothing of it be attributed to me. He also said, I never disputed with any one, but I would that Almighty Allah should give him the knowledge of the truth and aid him to dispread it. Nor did I ever dispute with any one at all, but for the showing forth of the truth. And I reck not whether Allah manifest it by my tongue or by his. He also said, Whom Allah accept. If thou fear to grow conceited by thy lore, then bethink thee whose grace thou seekest, and for what good thou yearnest, and what punishment thou dreadest. It was told of Abu Hanifa that the commander of the faithful Abu Ja'far al-Mansur had appointed him kazi and ordered him a salary of ten thousand dirhams. But he would not accept of this. And when the day came on which the money was to be paid him, he prayed the dawn prayer, then covered his head with his robe and spoke not. When the caliph's messenger came with the money, he went in to the imam and accosted him, but he would not speak to him. So the messenger said, Verily, this money is lawfully thine. I know that it is lawfully mine, replied he, but I abhor that the love of tyrants get a hold upon my heart. Asked the other, If thou go in to them, canst thou not guard thyself from loving them? Answered Abu Hanifa, Can I look to enter the sea without my clothes being wet? Another of Al Shafi's saying, Allah accepting, is, O soul of mine, 
and thou accept my reed. Thou shalt be wealthy and of grace entire. Cast off ambitious hopes and vain desires. How many a death was done by vain desire. Among the sayings of Sufyan al-Tawri, with which he admonished Ali bin al-Hasan al-Salami, was, Be thou a man of truth, and wear lies and treachery and hypocrisy and pride. Be not indebted, save to him who is merciful to his debtors. And let thine associate be one who shall dissociate thee from the world. Be ever mindful of death, and be constant in craving pardon of Allah, and in beseeching of Allah peace for what remaineth of thy life. Counsel every true believer when he asketh thee concerning the things of his faith, and beware of betraying a believer, for whoso betrayeth a believer betrayeth Allah and his apostle. Avoid dissensions and litigations, and leave that which causeth doubt in thee, for things which breed no doubt. So shalt thou be at peace. Enjoin beneficence and forbid malevolence. So shalt thou be loved of Allah. Adorn thy inner man, and Allah shall adorn thine outer man. Accept the excuse of him who excuseth self to thee, and hate not any one of the Muslims. Draw near unto those who withdraw from thee, and excuse those that misuse thee. So shall thou be the friend of the prophets. Let thine affairs, both public and private, be in a last charge, and fear him with the fear of one who knoweth he is dead, and who fareth towards resurrection and judgment stead between the hands of the Lord of dread. And remember that to one of two houses thou art sped, either for heaven's eternal or to the hell fires that burn. Thereupon the old woman sat down beside the damsels. Now when thy father, who hath found mercy, heard their discourse, he knew that they were the most accomplished of the people of their time. And seeing their beauty and loveliness, and the extent of their wisdom and lore, he showed them all favors. Moreover, he turned to the ancient dame, and treated her with honor, and set apart for her and her damsels the palace which had lodged Princess Abriza, daughter of the King of Greece, to which he bade carry all the luxuries they needed. They abode with him ten days, and the old woman abode with them. And whenever the king visited them, he found her absorbed in prayer, watching by night and fasting by day. Whereby love of her took hold upon his heart, and he said to me, O Wazir, verily this old woman is of the pious, and awe of her is strong in my heart. Now, on the eleventh day, the king visited her, that he might pay her the price of the damsels. But she said to him, O king, know that the price of these maidens surpasseth the competence of men. Indeed, I seek not from them either gold or silver or jewels, be it little or much. Now when thy father heard these words, he wondered and asked her, O my lady, and what is their price? Whereto she answered, I will not sell them to thee, save on condition that thou fast, 
watching by night a whole month, and abstaining by day, all for the love of Allah Almighty. And if thou do this, they are thy property to use in thy palace as thou please. So the king wondered at the perfection of her rectitude and piety and abnegation. She was magnified in his eyes, and he said, Allah, make this pious woman to profit us. Then he agreed with her to fast for a month, as she had stipulated, and she said to him, I will help thee with the prayers I pray for thee, and now bring me a goglet of water. They brought one, and she took it and recited over it, and muttered spells, and sat for an hour, speaking in speech no one understood or knew aught thereof. Lastly, she covered it with a cloth, and sealing it with her signet ring, gave it to thy sire, saying, When thou hast fasted the first ten days, break thy fast on the eleventh night with what is in this goglet, for it will root out the love of the word from thine heart and fill it with light and faith. As for me, tomorrow I will go forth to my brethren, the invisible controls, for I yearn after them, and I will return to thee when the first ten days are past. Thy father took the goglet and arose and set it apart in a closet in his palace. Then locked the door and put the key in his pocket. The next day the king fasted and the old woman went her ways. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of day and ceased saying her permitted say. End of section 30 of the Book of a Thousand Nights and a Night, Volume 2 Recording by Filippo Joachim